What he wants to do is he wants to get to get to plus two nice, 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 nice. He wants to get full armor in, but he's not gonna be able to do that. What he wants to do is he wants to get to get to plus two nice, 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 nice. He wants to get full armor in, but he's not gonna be able to do that. What he wants to do is he wants to get to get to plus two nice, 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 nice. He wants to get full armor in, but he's not gonna be able to do that. What he wants to do is he wants to get to get to plus two nice, 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 nice. He wants to get full armor in, but he's not gonna be able to do that. He wants to get to get to plus two nights. Oh God! Oh no! What he wants to do is he wants to get to get to plus two nights. He wants to get full armor in, but he's not gonna be able to do that. What you need is you need siege or you need something that kills. Don't know if Kanji can get that right now. What he wants to do is he wants to get to get to plus two nights. He wants to get full armor in, but he's not gonna be able to do that. What he wants to do is he wants to get to get to plus two nights. He wants to get full armor in, but he's not gonna be able to do that. What he wants to do is he wants to get to get to plus two nights. He wants to get full armor in, but he's not gonna be able to do that. What he wants to do is he wants to get to get to plus two nights. He wants to get full armor in, but he's not gonna be able to do that. Jerusalem has four towers 
remaining. Jerusalem has three towers remaining. Jerusalem has two towers remaining. Jerusalem has one tower remaining. All Jerusalem towers destroyed. The city is ours. Jerusalem has four towers remaining. No. Hello, everybody. What's up? Hope you're doing well. Uh, it is yet another long day of Hidden Cup 5 Deciders. I am yet again live on Twitch and live on YouTube. So hello to everybody there. And, uh, you know, whoever may be watching the videos there in the future. Good day, good day. Um, three big sets today. Not sure where my scoreboard is, but uh, I think this is going to work for me in a second. And uh, the first one is Tattoo Against Heart which is one of the big ones uh, as Tato has been in every Hidden Cup and is such a big name. And basically, ever since the qualifier started, everyone has wanted to know about Tato. Uh, you also have, of course, Hart on the other side of things, who's done a tremendous job over the last year or so since returning to the game and has been grinding and is an incredible talent himself. So many people on paper might feel like Hart and Tato are both top 16 players, but only one person can advance today. Of course, the loser does have a backup, um, like the, the backup uh, qualifier, which will, they will go into if they lose this series here today. So, uh, what's up, Nwese? Uh Camp should be working this morning. Yeah, there we go. What's up, uh, Deadly Cookie? Hey, Zombie Bird? Uh, Luigi, welcome. Quiet Squirrel? Gotta be careful with the squirrel name in my chat. I might... Well, if you don't know the story, it'd be weird. Uh, uh, Cactuar Club, hello, says, here with the early crew on my 12-month anniversary. Thank you for the year. Appreciate that, man. Let me see. I got to see if this is working. Also, you know what I just realized? I don't know if I ever put the game. Yeah, so this is really bad on YouTube. I never put the game. So I'm streaming on YouTube, but I never put the game. How do I do that? Um, exit stream. The stream can be accessed from the manager. Okay. I did that yesterday after the fact, but I can't do it now while I'm live, right? Um, YouTube, if I go offline, you know why. Let me see. Game title. Ooh, okay. We're still testing this. Okay, I think I can do it now. Okay, now it's there too. Because that might help the algorithm a little bit. And I feel like that's important to do for people who might be watching uh, videos and such. So, sorry, we fixed that. Did you get eight hours of sleep, T90? Uh, I don't know. Uh, who, who even knows? What, what's what's sleep? Um, what's up? Uh, thanks again to Wesley. Thank you, TMH, for the Prime. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Flavrinarl, for... Bearing with me and me butchering your names. It's great that I can finally... I finally learned you're back here with NAC. Yes, I am back. Good to have you back. Thank you. Sad Panda, again. Thank you. OOO, Wildberry Skittles. Has been a while. What's up? What's up, Hyper? And uh, Mobster's been around a long time, too. All right. So we've got three sets today. I don't have a scene that talks through all the schedule. But I'm just going to say it to make it easy for you. Um, the first one, obviously, Tattoo and Heart. That's going to get started here shortly. The second one is Barrels against Stark. And then the third one is Sebastian against Babo Rum. Now, 
this one here is like maybe the most expected from the all those brackets you maybe could have looked at it if you have really deep knowledge of the game and our pro scene you might have said yeah okay tato heart is what i predict the other groups not so much so kind of different storylines i would say um different things to talk about as it's very exciting i think coming into yesterday we had like eight out of the 12 players still remaining having never been to hidden cup before which is pretty wild so um yeah we'll see what happens today obviously i mean in in the later sets case um you know like sebastian being the favorite against baba or rum for example sebastian's never been to hidden cup even though he is the favorite there so should be good stuff and then like uh, i mean the stark borrow story I, I can't wait it should be fun we'll have casters in for every series today we're going to cast the first one with orn lu who uh a lot of you guys might not know this but he he was one of like the early twitch subs has been around a long time and and uh obviously does some casting himself so we're gonna bring him in to cast this first series um i haven't casted with him in a bit so as always if the audio is too high or low just say something but uh, i i normally i'm experienced enough now where i should be able to get it synced up speaking of getting things synced up the it's not a big deal at all but i hate it when things are broken the view counts not there on the overlay now this is especially important because yesterday okay now it says we have zero yesterday twitch glitched and it said we had we went from seven thousand people to 17. so we had 17 pa people watching and chat had a field day with it <clears throat> Chow was having so fun with that. Apparently, Margugu's stream went down to having one viewer. And he had more than that, too. So, yeah, we were full minus 7K mode yesterday. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if that's going to work. If that doesn't work, I'll just remove it. But Aha! There we go. I, it's always a little bit behind, but that's always cool to have. Don't mind that. You guys see my mug? Not to sell out or anything. But it says, hi, I'm new on it. So, hi, I'm new, chat. Hi, I'm new. All right. Um, we got a draft to set up here. And I want to make sure Ornal and I talk about this a little bit. So we'll go to the draft scene and look at that. And then uh, <clears throat> we'll give Ornlu a call, get him into the cast, and take it from there, everybody. Yeah, thanks for bearing with me slightly as I just kind of wake up this morning. It is pretty early for me, as I'm sure you guys know. So it'll take me a minute. But once, once we're in the first game... Everything should be good. All right. Um, so we'll have the maps. Now, there's only seven maps in the qualifier pool. So you're, in theory, going to see every single one now. We've just reached that point. I think we'll, we'll reach this point officially at the end of Sunday where people are like, okay, I like this map pool, but we're ready for the new maps now, which is how we designed it. Yeah, and there's the civilizations as well. Tato picking Malay first, Heart picking uh, Persians first, <clears throat> and then back and forth with some really strong picks on either side. And Tato always having some creative picks there near the end with Tatars and Saracens. All right, let me get uh, Ornlu on a call. Thank you, everyone. Holy crap, new subs coming in. Thank you, guys. Let me get Ornlu on a call and get synced up with him, and then we'll uh, get things moving here today, guys. There could be 21 games today. Good morning, good morning. Good morning to you yourself. How you doing, dude? I am awake and ready, man. Okay, I was just saying, I'm not quite awake, but I'm getting there. So uh, thanks for being ahead of the game there. <laughs> That's why I started earlier. Yeah. <laughs> could, uh, have my coffee and get a chance to uh, slowly get there mentally. Yeah, got it. Well, um, yeah, good to have you. Should be an awesome series. I was just kind of breaking it down a little bit that Tato Heart may be the only, uh, of the games we have remaining, may be the only series that was expected at the start of the qualifier when people looked at the bracket. It should be a fun one. Absolutely. I mean, both players generally breezed through their brackets. Heart, I don't think, dropped a single game. And Tato, uh, of course, only beat, dropped a game to the legendary Turs. But, you know, he, he blasted through Sora and fired, no problem. Yeah, it was funny. The 96 seed getting a win off of Tato but nobody else getting a win off of Tattoo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was, that was maybe a game that still shapes what people think about the Georgians, because since then, people have been picking the Georgians really early, and they haven't really been getting the job done. 
because the Georgians lack lack a little bit of something besides the Manaspa right now. So, well, it really is a Manaspa or bust sieve. Yeah, which is a shame. Um, but you know, maybe maybe we have time to talk about that in the games if we end up seeing Georgians here. Um, I gotta double check the draft. I don't think they did pick them. They did not. Yep. So no Georgians to talk about. But I'm sure we can find a way, or the we can. We can find a way to talk about uh, OP unique units. Uh, I'm sure that's something we can tack onto our list here. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. So anything that stands out uh, before we get started here? I, obviously, I was, you know, we have seven maps. There's no bands, right? So it's hard to really have those types of conversations on player preference. But um, Heart Tato, I guess maybe what comes to my mind, Tato being the big favorite. How do you rate Heart's chances today? Well, Hart, he's, <laughs> it, it's difficult to rate him, right? He was not really playing that much in the competitive AOE2 for quite some time. He qualifies for NAC5, doesn't do that well there. Tato is just Mr. Consistent these days. He's like top four in basically every event. Yep. Yes, he is the heavy favorite. But I think that subjectively, if you're watching Hart's uh, play, he's really clean. And if he is trying to get to that level of consistency... I think he can actually get to, you know, beating Tato. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think you, you pretty much broke it down perfectly. I, I do think that Hart may not believe that. I don't even think Tato believes that. I think Tato's got a lot of, of belief in himself that, you know, he should be the favorite and he will win today. But um, I agree. Gameplay, Hart has what it takes to beat Tato. I am curious to see how it goes on some of these maps, though. Like, with Hart, you look at Arabia, it's going to be fantastic. Maybe a map like Slopes, it's going to be fantastic. But like Quarry and Gold Rush, a bit more closed. Um, Islands with it, which is full water. I I wouldn't. I would have a lot more faith on Tato's side. Cross, which is uh you know a mixed map where where there's a lot of water aspects. That's where it's like that's where it gets very tricky because Tato is known for being good, like so elite on all the maps. Which is why I would say if I had to be a betting man here, I'd say like something like four two Tato today. I think feels like very reasonable. That seems fair. I think that, like you were saying, Hart's best chances are going to be on Arabia and Arabia adjacent maps. Yes. So, yes. Slopes and Gold Rush, I mean, yes, they are different than Arabia, but they're at least working in that vaguely open-ish land map idea. Um, but if we are going to see the big upset in this series, and it's not impossible, I mean, uh, who brought Tato to, like, a decider in the uh, NAC qualifier, um, right? Sato did. Sato, Sato did, did. yeah, yep. exactly. So it's not like Tato's invulnerable. So I, I think that there really is a lot of potential for this series. Okay. Well, it should be fun. So this series is covered as Rex. The, I think the second set is live. We, we want to make sure that we're getting back-to-back -back sets covered and, and that there's not overlap like there was in the previous round. So we're going to have to sync up here. Um, you should have them. And I am loaded up in game number one at zero seconds. Ah, perfect. All right. My capture age will occasionally load... A little bit after zero seconds, but uh, yeah, I'm in ready to go. I'll give you a count on here in just a second here. But yeah, I agree. I think we kind of covered it. Um, it should be exciting. I think it is worth reminding people as well that the loser here still has that second chance qualifier to fall into, which would be uh, tomorrow, actually. So everyone who lost yesterday, everyone who loses today will play in a second chance qualifier against a player from another group tomorrow, which... Gives us more exciting sets to look forward to, and, and I think makes it slightly less heartbreaking if you come close so today to say. And, and fail. Oh, yeah, heartbreaking, true. Uh, <laughs> you got to be careful with that one. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, so I this is not something we necessarily need to sink on, but it's important to me. What colors are you doing here? Because I always have to have Tattoo in red, but then Hearts from uh, Peru. Well, Peru's red and white, man. Yeah. What are we going to do? <laughs> I mean... I think I got to put Hart in the blue. I think Hart has to earn the red for future sets. Okay. <laughs> if you don't have to do whatever you're doing on your side, but I'm just saying. That, I'll pick uh, it up. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying that, that that's what I'm going to do here. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, we should be good to go, man. Uh, three, two, one, go. Here we are. And this was the series that everyone said was going to happen. When they saw the bracket for the qualifier, they said it was going to come down to heart and tattoo and some of the other groups did not play out as people expected there's been a lot of upsets but this one felt inevitable and uh tattoo only lost one game which was in his very first round to the 96 seed who went for manaspa with the georgians which was wild and then heart hasn't lost a game yet 
And I'm sure both players are going to drop some games here because they're so good. Uh, with me, I have Orlu. And Orlu, we, we've really got to be awake for this one because Mudflow starts off our series. It does indeed. And I got to say, I didn't really remember too much about this map from uh, the last Hidden Cup, but I've really been enjoying it in the qualifiers so far. It's one that actually plays with to an extended Feudal Age, which we don't really see that often in the current meta. Yeah. So it's nice that it's just so open, but not to the point when you can't do anything. Like It's not like you're completely impossible to get any economy going. So I I've really been enjoying this, and it's certainly a map that can feature demo ships. And yes, Tato, of course, is known for that unit. Yeah, that's true. Tato is like the guy with demo ships. And uh, I, I didn't actually cover his early rounds because I had to pick and choose. And he, yeah, I mean, he was just so expected to win. It didn't prioritize it. But I watched through some of the games, and I remember he had a crazy all-in feudal. He had 20 spears, 20 scouts, and like five demos lurking around the marshlands. <laughs> Uh, on one of his Mudflow games. But yeah, it's a fun map. Uh, we should see that Feudal Age aggression. And if we see that Feudal Age aggression, the Magyars could dominate here. Uh, cheap scouts, extra attack on the scouts, really strong. And that's why Hard has gone for the Magyars. Tata with a more defensive choice here has gone for the Byzantines, which is very rare for this map. I think it might be one of the first times I've seen it. So uh, what do you think about that one? Well, when I think about Mudflow, I, you know, you think about Chinese, of course, being insane because of the uh, the fish under your TC. But beyond that, usually it is something in the aggressive feudal age family of civilizations. And Magyars certainly qualify for that. Yeah. Lots of scouts. That persistent uh, discount on each and every scout means that you can play extended feudal age, no problem. We don't really see the hybrid-y sorts of civs that often unless you're doing the uh, the awesome Persian strat of the, the dock right away. But... Yeah, uh, Byzantines. I mean, it's it's a Byzantines matchup, as I always say. Like, it's fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think if you know it's going to be an extended scout war, then cheap Spearman is always going to be a good thing to have, right? Um, yep. And in some of my conversations with players, players were, in some cases, very comfortable if they had a camel civilization, actually. Now, that, of course, is Castle Age, and a lot of players struggle in Feudal Age here, but... Uh, Byzantines also have the cheap camels. So I think, yeah, you can do no wrong with the Byzantines, as we all know. Any map they can pretty much be strong on. So I don't mind it from Tato. I, I think this is also, like, if you think you're the better player, but you recognize that your opponent has a tendency to snowball fights and kill fast, and that is his greatest strength, which is maybe what Hart has, um, Byzantines may be one of your best picks to just try and slow that down. The one concern I have with Byzantines is that if we get into the extended feudal age we keep talking about, you don't have bloodlines for your scouts. Yep. So although the cheap spearmen are super helpful, you don't really want to get into a, you know, 10 scouts and 10 spearmen sort of situation. That's and you true. do want to work towards castle age. So again, Byzantines, that more defensive civilization, Tato, likely going to be focused more on holding on than trying to, uh, you know, blow his opponent out of the water. At least not yet. Yep, yep, absolutely. The docks will probably come up later, then Byzantines can be strong with their fires, too. Magyars don't really have any water bonuses that I know of, so I could swing towards they Byzantines They have for some reason. They, oh, they do get it. Yes, they do. All right, well, I mean, uh, I, I, I doubt we'll ever see the Magyar shipwright upgrade. <laughs> uh, but if we see that, then uh, we've, we've really seen something new. So... <laughs> Both players have scouted here. It's another thing I like about this map. There's no deer. There's enough food where scouting and making decisions based on that is super important. And they both are lurking and very well aware that they are chopping towards each other here. Now, there's a lot of wood, but um, eventually this could be a, a, a big point of focus here, whether that be a demo uh, swinging around or a tower or something. But the wood line's big enough where for now... Players should be able to wall in against demos, and also a tower wouldn't work. So, kind of a, a weird opening, though, which we'll see sometimes on this map. Absolutely. So, I'm not usually the biggest fan of players going forward, because it's not like you have to wander too far to get to another good woodland. You just have to move slightly further into the swamp. Yep. And it will be a stable opening from heart. 17 pop-up is pretty fast, but remember, you do have the fish under the TC, so you have very smooth Dark Ages. Magyar's going sh uh, scouts, surprised Pikachu face, but what really is surprising is that very early dock from Tato. <laughs> oh, true, and he may not want to take heart towards that, right? This is much earlier than we've seen. He's pulling back towards the spear. Now Hart veers away. Now Hart will see the duck. Okay, so if you're Hart, you need to pre-wall everything. Actually, what you could also do 
Because if you can get a wall between his house and his stable, then the ships can't actually pass through at all. But he might be okay uh, absolutely. there. Absolutely, and you do not want to be running demos into buildings. It's almost never worthwhile. So even just having some palisades is enough to really deter demo ships from ruining your economy. Yeah. So it's something that, I mean, it also helps against scouts and spearmen and all that stuff. So really, I see no reason not, especially if you're hard right now, to not just get those palisades down, man. Yep. Yeah, kind of a shaky opening in some ways for Tato. He did get housed, but as we've established, this map is crazy. I think you'll see more idle TC time on average on this map than any other uh, of the maps that we've had in the qualifier just because of how much aggression there is. And actually, as I say that, Hart didn't have a house and then he gets Townwatch. <laughs> but Townwatch, a really nice upgrade to have here. And he does drop the Palisade wall. So Tato instead goes for a fire. An interesting move. I, I made a bold prediction yesterday, Ornlo. I think the main event, we will see more fire ships and demos on this map because the players will have, have set up their bases in a way to not get surprised by demos but man tattoo don't tell me he's gonna get value from this uh well i mean the, the fire <laughs> just, just spewing that napalm through the forest not something we see every day uh that 2.5 range really coming in on the the fires there but no villagers have gone down yet but already disrupting that wood economy is quite impactful it's the only wood line here for heart yeah so that's already not the prettiest start in the world for our blue player yeah and he does have scouts around but it's not that many scouts on the front and byzantine fires are no joke and and you really don't want to be using spearmen or scouts to engage against a ship so tato could actually just use this fire to slowly take down the stable if he wants to but for now he's actually going for the palisade wall and tato's got i mean we talked about the defensive capabilities he's got for nine spearmen he's got so many spearmen hearts <laughs> are probably going to be like are you kidding me like come on man let me do a scout rush here uh, I mean, Hart plays with MBL. He's used to it. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, but on the other side, Tattoo did end up losing a villager. Even nine spearmen can't protect you against scouts that are well positioned on this map as you have the two forge bush patches. You are all out and exposed. So that's already something Hart can feel at least relatively happy about. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, missed that. I think it was right there on the berries, right? Where that dead scout yes, is, was. maybe. Yeah, Hart's yep. idle TC time is climbing, though. So the vill counts, he's actually behind because of that and that's the difficult thing on this map and you could just tell the moment maybe getting to heart again housed so first game of the series they need to warm up a little bit <laughs> as you can imagine <laughs> yeah first game of the day vibes right there for heart yep already over a minute uh, nine seconds idle time it's not too pretty and even comes in with the defensive tower what do you think about this decision I don't mind the tower if you are comfortable if you don't think your opponent's gonna be going range units right I think that of any map, this might actually be a map where you can go for multiple towers too, right? Like, just just put two villagers on stone and prepare for a tower on your gold too, and then I think you're okay. Because a lot of players are resistant to doing that because they think building a tower will eliminate the chances of TCs or, like, hurt their eco. But your eco is already garbage. So I think a couple towers isn't necessarily going to hurt here. Uh, and Tato uh, agrees, but... You know, he's going to build his first one offensively here, it looks like. Yeah, and that's the the thing with tower rushing is, you know, he who towers second will probably get a better tower location. Yeah. You see exactly where your opponent's tower is, so just build it one tile away, essentially, from the, the tower's range. And suddenly, Hart is going to need to move his wood line, which, I mean, logistically isn't that difficult. Just need to go around the corner. But positionally, tactically, you're going to be so much more exposed to Tata's uh, navy and spearmen. True. Yeah. I think Hart will try and take as much wood as he can there from the other side, but then we'll just have to take wood on the top now. His choice now, which could be huge for him, is he's mixing in archers. And Tato doesn't have an archer range. He doesn't have a stable. Tato's invested into the towers and into the navy. This actually gets really interesting because Hart's army here could be devastating to Tato. Even like four or five defensive spearmen in one area is not going to be enough once there's a couple archers in the mix. Yeah, and I mean, Hart still has some leftover scouts and spearmen of his own. It's not like these units are useless. And in fact, they're going to be great at pouncing on especially lower HP villagers. We do have the forging upgrade coming in for Tata, which is going to be nice in the spearmen war. Fire ships breaking through the palisade, but looks like uh, Hart is adequately defended there. But right now, Tata needs to rely on the uh, the pointy boy brigade. 
Yeah, is, is armor useful here on your spears against the archers? I, like, I never want to do yeah. that because it feels like the spears still go down. But oh my god, look how many look how many spearmen are here. That archer's really unnumbered. If uh, your spearmen aren't countering the archers, clearly you're not using enough spearmen. <laughs> I mean, oh, man. Th that archer's almost dead at this point. And Tato still has to be careful, but he's got plenty more. I'm just waiting for Hart to escape right now because Tato is lurking in the shadows with a demo. And hold on. He's not lurking anymore. He's making a move, Orn Lu. He's going in towards the tower. And he kills two villagers in the spearman. Nice job there from Tato. Finally gets what we all expected from him. There we go. That's, uh... When you sign up for a Tato series, that's what you want to see. <laughs> I would be disappointed if we don't see Guard Tower once or one demo ship hit. <laughs> also, the Spearman, the, the Spearman killed the Archer there. Also, just realizing, I think Spearmen are slightly faster than an Archer. Yeah, like it's one minimal. One speed versus 0.96. Yeah, 0.96 against one. Interesting. So that explains why Hart wasn't able to get away there. But Hart ties up the KD with the Eco anyways and kills another Villager. Well played to him. And, uh, you know, still has five scouts there with the Magyars. The wood is an issue for him, but he needs to just leave this front area and take the wood on the hill. There's still enough wood up there so you can get by. I think Hart's distracted, though, because he's losing villagers to the fire galley as he's trying to micro uh, at Tato's base right now. Uh, that's another dead villager to the fire ships. Make that three more. And suddenly the fires can just camp underneath the tower and kill that eventually. This is a little bit sloppy there from Hart. And, okay, Tato's coming with the defensive tower. He may lose some more villagers, but it still feels like, you know, his income is smoother overall. He's ahead in resources collected. Neither of these civs have eco bonuses to fall back on. So really just getting those sort of incremental advantages early on could really help snowball. Yeah, it's interesting. Tato actually has bought a lot of stone here. Like, he hasn't mined any of it. So he built his initial tower on Hearts Woodline. Now two defensive towers because he's been purchasing it. And Tato has got to be careful here... And in the end, he ends up just losing one villager, gets his tower up, and will defend. But you know, I like what Hart has done. Obviously, it's been awkward for Hart on water. It's probably annoying for him to now lose his stable and maybe his houses. But he's done a good job staying in this game. He just needs to stabilize his eco and maybe think about Castle Age. And forging is in for Tato's own scouts, so going to be able to kill the villagers more easily, and more are going to go down right there. Tato is ahead by four right now. I mean, Hart has the horse collar upgrade, which is nice, but... Yeah. Eh, Har still, having oh, horse cars is especially castle. nice on this map when you don't have the lumber camp in the middle. <laughs> because yeah. you're going you're gonna to need that wood at some point. Tato kills another villager. Wow, you weren't really expecting Tato to switch into scouts when his opponent was on archers, right? Typically, it's, you're going to see that if your opponent's on skirms. But Tato just felt like I, I he had control of water and needed some control of land. And the scouts have paid off. Well, recognizing that Hart doesn't really have that much at home to defend, as you can't be as comfortably walled at home as you are on, say, Arabia, yep. and your resources are also further away. So the chances of your scouts finding something useful to do seems pretty high, and I definitely like that decision there from Tato. Yeah, I think Tato has stopped production of army now. He's just going to micro the scouts that he has. Same deal here for Hart, uh, at least with the scouts. He is still making archers, and I still do feel like... We haven't seen the best from those archers. I think the archers, the, the, the early archers had spearman issues, and then the next two archers had tower issues. But if you have seven or eight archers with five or four scouts, you can still find damage here. So there, that's the chance back for Hart right now, as he has to defend from Tato. But Hart's going to click up first. And with the Magyars, getting the extra attack can be super nice in early Castle Age as well with the Knights. This is really a window Hart needs to take advantage of before the Byzantines can counter everything with the cheap units. Yeah, and I'm even wondering, do you want to go heavily into Knights? Like, going for one or two just to do some raiding and stuff like that, that seems totally fine. But yep. it feels like going Cav Archers is going to set you up so much better in the long run versus Byzantines. It's much more difficult to go for Skirmishers, and they are just in general a yep. much less threatening unit than other things Byzantines could go for. Yep. And I think would, I'd like to see Hart at least try and tech more long term in that direction. Yeah, he's definitely going to do it, Orlo, because he's adding the ranges now. Oh, there we are. Now, Tato's <laughs> going to Tato's going to recognize this. Um, if you're building a range at this point, that's going to be Cav Archers. And Tato kills another Villager, which makes it nine. Um, I like that. I also wouldn't mind one or two Knights, because that extra attack, yeah. it feels like you need to take advantage of it. Um, investing long term could be tricky, but I think one or two Knights could be amazing. And something I wanted to say here is just how Tato set up his base so nicely. 
look at how hearts had to loop the whole way around to get to the most exposed area of this eco which is this farming eco and then the wood is super vulnerable for tato and where he started but heart will never go in there because there can be demos or fires at any point in time so finally finds a vill pick but i really like that from tato yeah, so this is something that Tattoo can do because he has water control, right? Yeah, yeah. You just know that your opponent can't send army up through the middle. It's way too dangerous. So build away from the land area that's closest to your opponent. Makes all the sense in the world. But it's not something that feels like super obvious to do. I mean, it's really a uh, clever play there from Tato that we would expect to see from him. Second TC immediately here for Heart, as well as some relevant Cav Archer upgrades. That's it. Of all the TCs to build up on this hill... That is a really good TC. You're next to a gold, and you have lots of trees. So that's a good TC for Hart. He obviously needs to catch up with villagers because of how many he's lost. But Cav Archers are going to start to come in. Tato is going to immediately go for plus two armor and start making camels. And that, that armor is very necessary if you're going to be up against Cav Archers. But if those camels get anywhere close to the Knights or CA, they are going to shred them. So Hart needs to really have his best micro here. Absolutely, but the nice thing with Magyar is you do have now the faster training Cav Archers. You can start to develop those numbers a little bit faster yep. uh, than you used to. You can even maybe sell some stone if you want to just to maybe either get an extra TC or make sure you keep the Cav Archer production consistent because once you get to a decent number of Cav Archers, suddenly even Camels, especially without Bloodlines, are going to struggle. Yeah, now now again, the, the problem for Hart is, where do I go? <laughs> can I go out here? Because... I think he's finally reached this point where he's like, I have to, right? Byzant Tato's probably booming. He killed more villagers. I need to pressure. And Tato's like, oh, yeah, dude, you can come through. Go ahead. Come through. I'm not, I don't have any ships here. And then surprise. And then he just goes right back to the shadows. I love this from Tato. This is perfect play. Absolutely. Those Cav Archers need to run for their lives. Oh, it's just not quite enough to one-shot the demo. Does nullify it, though, with some very nice unit control. This is what we expect from Hart, and absolutely the bare minimum of what we need to see for him to take this series. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the... I like that Hart's running through now, and I like that he's adding his own demos. I think it's really smart, but, you know, it's just one of those things, man. Even if Tato doesn't have a demo... Hart will have to second guess every decision now through the middle. And if he goes to the outside, he will run into towers that Tato already has set up. Tato has just played this perfectly and also played it perfectly for the Byzantines because they always want to be playing in a defensive manner to make it difficult for their opponents to break them early. And uh, look at that. Hart can't go through with Tato. That's his gate, and he goes right through. And you know, he's right into Hart's eco, and Hart's going to have to deal with this. Yeah, Tato also got several more villager kills with camels on the backside. Ooh, <laughs> not, camels true. not really your uh, obvious raiding unit, but yeah. hey, if your opponent just doesn't have anything there, they can absolutely get the job done. And Tato, by restricting the movement that Hart can do through the middle of the map, it enables him to, okay, I just need to defend one location, whereas Hart without that middle control, I mean, there's just so much surface area he needs to defend that it's not actually practical to do at all. Look at, look at Hart go for some YOLO demos. He's like, I can do it too. And these two yeah. demos are just wandering out into the into the darkness. There's nothing there for him to get right now. <laughs> That's wild. Oh uh, yeah, there is uh, nothing that is especially close for Tato on the low ground. Tato, fourteen villagers ahead, and that is only going to increase. He's going into a fourth town center. Demo going to blow up on a Byzantine spearman. That's not value. And right now, Tato has just been controlling this game this entire time. Yeah, he's just so good. He's, he's amazing at this game, and, and this is why he's the favorite. But, you know, for Hart, first game of the series, you know you're the underdog here, but you also have to have a lot of belief in your ability. I know that he's been practicing a lot, and maybe I, I, I would imagine Mudflow on paper is a really good map for him, but I'm sure there's some other maps where he'll see the potential. Excuse me for getting wins. Um, he, he's got to give it a shot here. He hasn't been killed off. He's obviously behind, but there's been no killer blow. And maybe these CA, because he hasn't lost many Cav Archers, maybe they can get to a critical enough mass to really start to shoot down the Camels and everything Tato has. And Tato doesn't have the Camels to defend right now. So already, Hart moving forward, finding his way through finally, kills a Vill and distracts Tato. Tato's got like 20 idols right now. Yeah, that is a little bit rough. And as we're saying, it's about snowballing that number of Cav Archers. You just take efficient fights against the Camels and... 
yeah, you have a worse eco, but one way you can mitigate that is just if you can take efficient fights, then you don't need as many resources just to constantly be producing army. And that is at least a possible route back into this game here for hard. Yeah, I agree. Tato looped most of his camels home to heal up. At least I'm assuming so, because some of them are weak, so they could need it. Um, and Tato really starting to wall the middle. So I'm already starting to think this way. When it comes to the main event of Hidden Cup, right? A lot of the fun of it is trying to guess who's who and what did people do in the qualifier what what are main event players known for tato's fire galleys stand out a lot of players have just been going for demos tato's stone gating the whole way through the middle this is very rare and it's very smart because it allows him passage and his enemy cannot and oh god dude heart you've got to be careful oh. here man you've got to be careful he sees it oh man <laughs> Uh, heart is, is uh, short for heart attack on this map. Yeah, seriously, man. <laughs> it's too early in the morning to do this to my blood pressure, man. <laughs> and Tato's going to upgrade his ships too. But yeah, I'm definitely going to keep this one in the back of my mind. If Tato qualifies for the main event, because the stone gate, he's got, it's not like just one Ornlu. Like he's done it multiple times now. And it's so much smarter than just walling because walling would, of course, block your own passage. So... I'm loving that from Tato, and Hart probably saw his that demo was bigger than his, and now he's he's a little he's even more scared to go through the middle. Well, thankfully, one demo rack can even kill a heavy demo ship. So even if you have the demo disadvantage, so yep. to say, yep. uh, you're you're able to make that you know trade happen. And now Tato with an interesting castle here on the side. It looks like he wants to go for a more concentrated push along the edge of the map. Uh, what do you think about this position? It is definitely a very eco-oriented position. It is a position where he feels like, I don't need to take any risks to win this game. Um, but I, I honestly would have loved it if he would have gone forward with his villagers, with those camels, and built a more aggressive one right in front of Hart's base. Because a Byzantine castle on the front of your base, that, that normally spells trouble for you. So I'm a little surprised that Tato's done that. I think he's done that for the gold there. But we'll see. Is Hart still in this game? Absolutely. I mean, he's behind, but not out by any stretch of the imagination, especially if he can keep the game in Castle Age and prevent Tato from utilizing the cheaper Byzantine Imperial Age. Yeah. But when it comes to the castle position, at the very least, I like that he's securing gold as we have another camel raid at the back of Hearts Base, because we've seen so many players throughout the qualifiers to sort of be caught with their pants down because they're like, oh, wait, I'm out of gold. Yeah. And then have this really awkward transition where they just don't have that critical resource, even in the mid game. So Tato, making sure he's setting himself up as well as possible going forward. I love it. Yeah, a, a good moment here for Tato to kill villagers too, but an awkward moment because his camels have now gone forward. So he needs to have enough to defend from Hart's attack and he does get a conversion. He's got some camels. Hart's using the choke point. It, it feels like a fight that Tato is taking well enough, right? He's got a, enough camels in queue behind this. Even if he loses these camels, it's so cheap for him to always add more. And it's also way easier for Tato to control. He can just kind of patrol his unit through and let them do their thing. And then Hart has to micro. And Hart's Cav Archer Mass, it, just as he completes Ballistics, is down to 12. And he's got very little of that at home. And this is looking so much better for Tato now. He's got a 30 villager lead. And that castle on the gold, like we said, and he's set up for late game. I mean, this is just absolutely beautiful. Heart going to have to tap out. That game went from, okay, it's a little bit of a disadvantage to Heart to, oh my goodness, this is all over. Yep. Tato just busting into the base with the camels. And as you're saying, it's just not really practical to try and control two groups of cav archers on the opposite side of the map against camels at the same time. Yep. And wow, that game was pure Tato. Yeah, and a really interesting approach, a really Tato approach to this game, if you know who he is. He went defensive with the Spearman, and uh, then from there, he was good to go. Um, the dock early, that I think that's the earliest dock that we've seen on Mudflow, uh, because he wasn't even on gold at that point. That one fire galley, the tower, everything was just so smart. But you know, the consistency that Tato has is why everyone thinks he's going to win this series today. And he ended this game with TCs everywhere, Eco everywhere, and he gets the 1-0 lead. So kind of a tricky one for Hart. I think you have to look at... Uh, the upcoming map and try and find a map where you can actually get into your groove because he was never able to really get good flow in this game like i think he had three scouts initially in early feudal and then kind of just ran out of steam or maybe he ran into too many spearmen um if i'm hard i'm going arabia or slopes or something where there's no water and <laughs> you can just feel comfortable again because that was not it 
Absolutely. It's and, and I think that's the thing with Hart, especially if he does get nerves in tournaments, which he absolutely does. Just get comfortable, right? Mudflow, it's a map where Tato can do Tato things against you. So I think just trying to play a more standard game is going to be the name of the game here for Agreed. Hart. And then it gets then it gets really tricky when you think about it that way. When you say, okay, I don't want to play Tato's type of game. I want to play mine. But then you need four wins. And it's like, well, <laughs> on this map pool, how many of these maps am I better than Tato on? And, and I would say, you know, Arabia and Slopes, which were actually on Tato's side for the home maps, which was interesting. Arabian slopes, those are the two where I would really say that is that is maybe more of a heart situation than a tattoo situation. Um, but again, that's only two, right? So we'll see. I, I think there is this sense of inevitability about tattoo, right? Which everyone feels. And so uh, I can I can catch myself already like being very pro tattoo here <laughs> with, with the cast, you know, uh, which which I mean, game one victory certainly makes you do that but uh yeah we'll, we'll see what game two holds here for heart but um you know I, I also wonder how heart's been training i i know he's been training uh and i i wonder if th maybe i'm incorrect maybe there's a certain map that he sees like maybe he looks at slopes in arabia and says i'm already good there let's not put my focus into that let's put my focus into something like quarry right or gold rush um so I, I haven't talked to him in detail and, and any details I know, usually at, at this point, it's secrecy. So we'll see. But uh, I'll hop into game two, Orin Lou. It looks like I was correct. It is slopes. And uh, let me know. I'm going to be at two seconds there if you can get there for me and we can sync up. And I'm there. All right, cool. Uh, three, two, one, go. Here we are. Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you go back to two seconds? <laughs> It's redo. A, a, yeah, my, my capture age, man. If I click play sometimes, it goes rewind. It's weird. <laughs> Rip. All right. I'm back at two seconds. Okay. Three, two, one, go. And it did it again. What the? <laughs> okay. Where are you? Are, can you go back All to right. two for me? Yep. No problem. Okay. All right. Three, Take three. two, one, go. Here we there are. We Game go. number two. No problems here. And uh, we've got Slopes, and we've got Tato has gone for the Khmer, a pick that I love and can't wait to talk about. And then we've got Hart on the other side, who's gone for the Vietnamese. And what we just said, Orlu, is probably what Hart was thinking. Game number one, yes, it is an open, messy, aggressive map, and he likes to be very open and aggressive, but he doesn't like messy, right? So <laughs> this is something that could be a bit cleaner for him, and he feels like to tie it up with Tato, he needs a map which is a bit more standard. And that's very much what we see from Slopes, because, I mean, th this map has gone through a few different iterations throughout the various Hidden Cups. I remember you, way back at NAC3, telling me how excited you were for this very map. <laughs> really? I don't remember that? <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you uh, hadn't announced uh, Hans and Slopes yet, and you were, like, showing me all these images, like, oh, man, this is going to be such great map for the D Hidden Cup, man. <laughs> Sick. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, what I like about it is there's there's a lot of variation with the the choices of expansion, right? Um, yeah. And and I've seen different play styles depending on civs. So for example, I've seen Byzantines be more prone to castle push the middle because that could be a lot more devastating with, if they get access to that stone and gold in the faster Imperial Age. But then I've seen civilizations like um, the Magyars want to build their castles up on the on the slopes on the hills long term and then on top of that you have the food and then we see some players do and i think a lot of players are going to choose to do this because it's safer uh they'll just push in the hunt towards their tc from there and not really take any risk but then maybe a civ like Khmer here orlu and take the risk and i think tata will do that here you can you can build the house up on the shore uh up on the hill and if there is any trouble you can just hop into that house so i feel like there's a big reason to take the risk here for tata yeah the thing with both Khmer and Vietnamese, is they're, they're very flexible, right? I mean, Khmer have an insane eco bonus. Khm Vietnamese are at the very least solid. They have tons of different options they can go for. Tato is certainly somebody who's going to use that house bonus on the hill. And in general, I like the idea of, okay, you can push the, the Ibex from one side, and then you can mill the other one so you can just get as much early food income as possible. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, because the other side's still going to be there. Yeah. And then I'll be very curious on the scouting because I uh, think there have been a couple examples where players 
who don't want to mill the resources push in so many deer and then they get surprised by something now i think here the chimera are a little bit more predictable but i think ganji against ozone uh and then it was um shoot who went for there was a, there was a drush yesterday i believe on this map which may have surprised somebody and and it's oh yeah i i forget but there, there is the games all blend together man <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> there are some <laughs> sneaky things you can do um and and we'll see if that happens now kind of a funny thing like i think vietnamese are so good now that you can't really doubt them without factoring in this bonus but this is one of a few maps we have where the positions are fixed so you will know where your opponent's tc should be based on the orientation of the map so heart is vietnamese which also tells him where the opponent's tc is i feel like that bonus is kind of a waste here on slopes yeah that doesn't really do all that much for you but I mean, with Vietnamese, you have the solid economy and the good tech tree, so I, I don't think you really need to worry about that all that much. Yep. Something I actually think that could be really strong for Vietnamese on this map is uh, Cav Archers. Khmer don't love facing that unit. You don't have any real bonuses to your own Archers or Knights. Scorpions can be okay, but it's not the best. And the Cav Archer Sips tend to do pretty well, and if there's anything I know about medieval Vietnam, it's that it was mass Cav Archers and light Cav. <laughs> I don't know if that's sarcasm or not orlu it is sarcasm that's what i figured <laughs> <laughs> that's what i figured i i'm pretty sure that like when they added the bonus like obviously we know that age of empires 2 is not the most historically accurate right no. in some cases but but like i'd like to think that they were like okay this is a foot archer like infantry civilization and they're like okay we give their archers more hp and they had probably assumed it's just going to be arbalest and then somewhere along the line someone figured out oh the cav archers get extra hp too that's really good let's do that and now it's kind of part of their their high level gameplay and they're not going to go back from that now so i wonder if like initially yeah. they actually wanted people to be going for crazy heavy cav archers with vietnamese or if that was kind of just like an afterthought i don't know uh, I think they actually changed the bonus thinking way back to Rise of the Rajas to include Cav Archers for that very reason. Interesting. But I think especially in, like, the current meta, well, before the, the tournament patch where Archer pathing was just so suspect, yeah. that Cav Archers could at least react to bad pathfinding better, so we just saw those a lot more often, even with, a you know, a supposed foot archer sip like Vietnamese. Okay, good. Yeah, ma makes sense. Yeah, I didn't remember the early balance. I remember there were some crazy bonuses back then, though. And already we see Tato with his house next to his mill, and he's going to go for those resources. Now, you look at Hart. This is what I was talking about, right? Look at Hart scouting right now. So he's scouting Tato's base, and he now he does not see a mill on the berries, which should mean he should check, and he can use process of elimination if he really thinks about this. If he looks at this side and doesn't see as much hunt or doesn't see the villagers, he should then assume, especially with Tato being Khmer, that Tato is on the other side, and I would go directly there because you're going to have four exposed villagers. The rest of the eco from Tato is going to be next to a TC and probably houses as well. So you got to at least give it a shot and see if you can make Tato work for it. I mean, at the very least, you can deny the income, and yeah. that, that alone just feels worthwhile. And mm, especially because Tato is going to be walling up at home on his wood line. He's not on gold yet, just going for his own scouts. It feels sort of a natural point that you can contest. And what's always a little awkward with Khmer if you're going for the scout war is that you skip the barracks, you try and avoid it going spearman if at all possible, but that means you just don't want to take straight up fights. So Hart needs to do everything he can to force Tato to take those fights. Yep, and and like you said, I think Tato has the house there already, so he should be able to save himself, but you don't want to be sitting inside that house for too long. So here come the scouts, and here comes the spearman as well. Hart's going to make Tato work for this, does get some hits. He's expecting Tato to fight back, and Tato doesn't at all. And now Tato's paying attention. And like we said, Villager might need to hop inside the house here, but Tato will bring his own scouts over. And it's been... This is the big conversation so far, right? Tato making use of the side resources. Hart kind of playing safe at home. But the safe approach for Hart at home is not bad at all. His eco is flying right now. Absolutely. Uh, slightly ahead in resources, even relative to his opponent. He's got Bidax and Horse Collar, everything he could want there. And this game is going as well for Hart as you could expect. And this should hopefully be giving him a little bit more of that confidence boost, saying, okay, I can just play my game versus Tato, rely on my mechanics, and just take it to mid game. Yep. 
yeah, where it can get really awkward for the Khmer. But you do have to be careful here because Tato is no stranger to, to making a couple extra scouts. And Tato with map control can do some crazy things. And Tato's just going to take this Spearman out. And now he, he has all his scouts alive and Art's going to have to back away here. Um, yeah, I, I have to say this patch, I, I obviously tested it a great deal. In the end, At the end of the day, it was my decision on if we used it. Um, but just watching the games has brought me so much joy. <laughs> uh, seeing yeah. the units group properly. Like, even with the scouts, man, a lot, I know a lot of people stopped going archers as much with the patch, but the regrouping was constant every time units would be clicked. And I'm watching these units move right now, and it just feels like Age of Empires 2 again. So uh, thank you to the devs for giving us something Seriously? for this tournament. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's... Uh... No, I I've noticed it as well. Like, you just... It's so much more comfortable players like, okay, I can actually use my micro skills to yeah. the best of my abilities to take good fights, and I'm not fighting the game as much. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a that's a perfect way to say it. You know, a lot of times players were were trying to get their units to the right position instead of trying to, to compete against their opponent here. So Tata with nine scouts, no spears, and Hart is almost completely walled. So this is at a point where you can actually vacate your base with any spearmen defensively and bring them forward. And I mean, we, we knew that this was going to be an aspect of Tato's play here with the Khmer. And Hart figured out that this was an aspect of his play. And he has not allowed Tato to rest here at all. I love it. But Tato's getting forging, so this could get even crazier here soon. Absolutely. And this is what I was saying with... If you're the Scout plus Spearman Civ, just do everything you can to take the direct fight. Yep. Force Tato to be in this position. Don't let him just cruise his way to Castle Age. Also, Tato's doing the weird thing he does with Chimera and just not take the Forge Bushes at all. Yeah, that is interesting, right? I think I would always take the Forge Bushes, but I guess those farms are really your, your long-term consistent friend. So, man, I mean, Hart did just give up on the hill for a moment here. And this is giving Tato time. Tato's going to go. He already has forging. He's getting bloodlines now. Could maybe get armor. But yeah, I mean, how many times are you going to get an opportunity to kill four villagers from Tato? Not too many. So I think you just stay here. Attack that house and force Tato to fight this. Crazy stuff here, Ornlude. The, the house is still weak-ish. I think that could be a target as well. Like, I'd like to see Hart just attack that house and wait. And the spears are there. I think Tato... I, I don't know how he gets himself out of this. I don't think he can take a good fight. By the way, are you there? Or did you drop? Okay, I'm not hearing Ornlu. So he may have dropped. Uh, I assume that I could be oh, heard. Nope, oh, can nope. You, I could hear you now. We're good. Okay. Sorry about that. All good. No worries. All right. Sorry. He's so... As I was saying, Tato adds in the second stable, so he's just doubling down on the scout play. Was this a dog-related pause? It was. I have a dog. In case you guys can't hear. <laughs> yeah, all good. No worries. I just heard the ruff, ruff. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, so more scouts from Tato. He's going to click up. He still has four villagers that aren't collecting resources, though. So I think Hart's done a great job to punish this. Now, as he brings forward more spearmen, he is going to lose those. And Tato refuses to lose these villagers in and out of these houses. <laughs> you would only do this with the Khmer. And Hart clicks up the castle slightly faster than Tato. What what is what a fun game. Like this has been. I love how Hart knew that taking the sides against heavy scout play would be risky. But then also recognized that Tato will take the risk and go out to those resources. Super nice. Uh yeah, I mean. The crazy thing to me, though, is that Tato is able to take all but five food from one shore fish. True. And he's still going to get home with all the bills. Yes, yeah. there is idle time. That isn't good. But, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you're fine if you're Tato. You're on your way up to Castle Age, just a few seconds slower than your opponent. He's still slightly ahead in resources coll uh, collected. So, yeah, Tato's fine. And and he made that look so easy. Like, getting away with those bills there, he just found the moment where Hart stepped away it's so impressive from Tato to be able to do that. 7 to 2 KD here. He's got a whole lot more scouts than Hart does. Both players are actually making lots of scouts here. Which is very unique. We've seen like knights. We've seen camels. We've seen crossbow. But I, I think more often than not, we've actually seen players walling up and going for an archer switch 
while on the way to Castle Age. We're not seeing them make more scouts like this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you can just see the second that Tato turns around to try and take the fight, there are simply too many Spearmen. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Forging is great and all, but you even have the Scale Mail armor upgrade coming in for Hart. I mean, he is really going to be leaning into the Spearmen, recognizing that Tato... I mean, if Tato is going to stubbornly not go for the archery range, then yeah, just keep making Spearmen, man. Yep. Yeah, maybe just early Squires here. <laughs> I don't... I think Vietnamese <laughs> do get it. It's Portuguese that don't. And maybe yeah, one other Portuguese save. don't get it. Khmer don't get it. Yeah. And uh, so Tato, he's not going to want to be going for that. And like have upgrade for Tato. It goes for the attack upgrade as well. So he'll have full attack for Castle Age. And instantly drops TCs. But he's not expanding at all. He's just staying nice and compact here. Are also getting like have. And Hart, in some ways, has to be feeling very good about how much control he has. He's the player who normally wants to dictate the pace of the game. But also at the same time, there, mu there might be a feeling being down a game of, how am I supposed to break this guy? <laughs> it's not easy. I mean, and the, the crazy thing is Tato isn't even full walled. Like, he is just hanging in there. His eco is about as compact as possible. Yep. And he's going to try and maybe drag the army of heart back towards his base. Just give Tato a bit more room to maneuver. Even getting the fletching upgrade. I guess this is just for the TCs because I don't see any ranges anywhere. Yeah, I think Tato just hit a moment where he said, I'm going to abandon my base. And he thought ahead of time and about fletching, which is interesting. Normally, players are not going to research that until the units are underneath their TCs. So to preemptively research that is some interesting foresight there from Tato. Uh, he does take out some random pikes, and Tato did scout the right side, and he knows that Hart hasn't expanded there. And Hart just now realizes that Tato is not on the sides as well with these TCs, because you're not going to have a fourth at this point. So he sees that Tato is, is very much cramped in here, and he's going to try and punish Tato for not defending himself right now. Keep in mind, Tato, zero spearmen against all these horsemen, and still zero losses for Tato against this attack. As I say that, he loses one, but... The TC has fletching, The Tato should be okay, and now Tato's over at Hart's base. Yeah, uh, Hart himself, if he's paying attention, shouldn't really be taking any damage. For his part, Tato, he's on three TCs, so he's going to be slightly ahead in villagers, as uh, Hart is only on two. Hart, I really hope he doesn't just let a bunch of light cav into his base, All right? Getting those uh, repairs in time, it seems. Tato, though, at the end of the day, he's still not losing anything. Yep. He's getting these scorpions. They can help push away any unit, especially with that extra range with Khmer. And Tato can't really be that unhappy with the current situation. And Tato, happy to just play with more and more Cav here. And it, it's been impressive. And he's been able to utilize the Khmer bonuses quite well. There he has to back away, of course. There's a lot more, but he's sitting on scorpion defense at home. Lots of farms with the Khmer. And then also the light Cav, which just, I guess they don't really have any specific light Cav bonuses. But of course, it just feels natural with this eco so love that from tato uh love the fact he now knows that heart is on the right side that light cap got killed off nice shot from heart to realize that but that could be a target area for tato raids especially if this becomes a really big castle age play from tato well and that is every indication at this point still making some knights is tato the one thing he is going to need to think about is just securing some more gold long term yeah you have your main gold and that's going to be fine for now but he's going to need to push out onto the map Yep. And uh, right now, I guess if he can pounce on his opponent's army when it's just not protected. I mean, Hart has the larger army and it does win in a straight-up fight, but Tato using that mobility quite expertly. Yeah, and then this is the this is a great example um, of, of a play the majority of Age of Empires players can't relate to, right? Uh, a lot of <laughs> people going Cav will see the pikeman and say, oh, no, he's countered me, right? Uh, but Tato just says, oh, actually, I will just avoid your counter units, and then you will spend time chasing me. And I'm, I'm sure there's actually a lot of people that can relate to knights running and hoovering around their base as the pikemen chase at this point because everyone's gotten so good, right? And there's more and more experienced yeah. players. But the point is, is like that pikeman upgrade was supposed to do something for Hart. Hasn't really done that much because of Tata's amazing unit control. Absolutely. And he's actually developed towards seven scorpions at this point. That is uh, not messing around numbers of scorpions, as I say. Ooh. And... I mean, we're kind of getting towards the point when Tato can maybe start to think about just pushing out across the map as we have a big Light Cavern Night Raid into the base of Hart. But for his part, Hart should be fairly well defended. Yeah, I mean, it, it will really... This is a big moment of harassment for Tato. 
the problem for him is if he doesn't kill enough villagers, he might have not he might not have a big army anymore. So at the moment it seems like it's worth it though. Hart was unable to track some of the light cap towards the north and towards the gold. Kato's killed nine villagers now. Of course, Hart has all of his army at home. There's a lot of idle time. There's a lot of messiness here where it's, there's not for Tato. But now that army count does spike for Hart, so he can move forward. And I am just so excited to see, does Tato feel confident enough to move out with those seven scorpions? <laughs> because seven Khmer scorpions, they're no joke here, man. Absolutely not. I mean, you... Like, one scorpion that you see so often, or like two scorpions, like, they do so little that you think it's just not, like, that great. But once you start getting a lot of them down, they'll just kill everything all at once. Yep. But I love Tato. He knew he had map control, so he moved out to the side with his villagers and Monk to go for the TC on the gold. But Hart was at the very least looking at that spot. So he knows what Tato's trying to do right now. And with his army advantage, he's at least the best poised he could be to stop that. But that is lining him up right there. Oh, man, the heart just ran right into the scorpions. I mean, heart had the right idea. He knew Tato was moving out there, but he needed to position his units in literally any other way. And maybe the light cap would have survived. So heart realizes, okay, those are Khmer scorpions. There's seven of them. Maybe I don't have time. And Tato will drop a very important TC on the side, which is his gold side. So that's what heart did on the right side. And that's what he does now on his left. And then beautiful house falls here from Tato, not to take losses from Hart as he runs through the middle. Tato has the eco lead, and he's starting to amass some amazing night numbers here. Just crazy to me that he still hasn't lost more than one villager. It is absolutely wild. Yes, he's had some idle time, but he's still way ahead of his opponent in terms of resources collected. He's on one more TC. He's picking up relics. I mean, this is just Tato playing at the level we know he can. And, I mean, he's just become such a consistent player these days. And yep. we are really seeing that play out in the series. Yep. Everyone, uh, I mean, to see him in the qualifier, obviously we based it on the results of the previous Hidden Cup where Tato lost first round. And everyone's just been like, where's Tato in the invite list? Why is Tato not in the invite list? Tato this, Tato that. And there's a reason for it, man. <laughs> the dude is just <laughs> playing amazing. Like, Art is, is probably still in a pretty good spot to be one of the favorites to qualify to be in this event because there's a backup qualifier if he were to lose and he's right now not quite being able to keep up with Tato's eco but finally I mean almost poor timing for me Hart's finding a lot of damage uh a lot of damage being five villager kills but that's more than one and he has control of the that game right now correct, so. <laughs> I said a lot uh, and then I looked at the numbers and realized Tato had killed so much more uh, and the scorpions yeah, I mean, are the forward now. It was just wrecking the opponent's economy. Now the scorpions are showing up too. Oh, man. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, the scorpions are slow, right? So they shouldn't, as long as Hart is a little bit patient here, and he brings over some knights, these, these scorpions being forward, this shouldn't be a positive for Tato, in my opinion. I think this is something that should be used usually in defense. All those scorpions are going to get surrounded. Very well played from Hart. Scorpions aren't cheap. So that was maybe a big misstep from Tato because they could be useful at home. But I do think that Tato is kind of shifting away from even needing the Scorpions, Ornlu. He's got 17 Knights. He's got full upgrades on them. And he wants to build a castle here soon. So we might have a, we, we might have a different type of Scorpion if he can get that castle down. Yeah, the power of the Ballista Elephant will not be gainsaid, but for the time being, Tato is going to need to place that castle in a more defensive location. Tato has been, in general, trading army for villagers, which is getting him further ahead economically, but right now, in a straight-up fight, especially with those scorpions going down, Hart's army is better. What Hart needs to do is he needs to recognize this, and he needs to, like, really go after Tato, like, right now. That castle is coming in. It's going to secure more gold for Tato, and that's exactly what he's going to need going towards late castle, early imperial this age. This is crazy. I mean, the sides are so important, right? But if you are booming up there, and you only have so much space to hide villagers in the TC, you are going to have a lot of exposed economy, and that's exactly what happens here for Hart. He does react to this. He garrisons immediately. He's bringing over pikemen to defend. But Tata found more vil kills. And just when Hart was thinking he had some confidence on the front, he's going to see a castle from Tato. As Tato is imping right now. How? Has he made so many knights? And, and is sitting on the way to the Imperial Age right now. That's ridiculous. Well, when you have, uh, what is it, around 6,000 more resources collected, that is uh, that is absolutely something you can do. And just so many knights here for Tato, running around constantly, not bothering with uh, the pikemen at all as much as he can help. And the army of Heart 
it's now predominantly pikemen. It's not the scariest offensive unit in the world. Yep. Tato just so snug at home. He's now going to drop another castle forward, and he's just slowly creeping out to get the resources when he needs them. I think one of the most visually satisfying things in the game, and there's a lot of things we could tack onto this list, but watching the Khmer food count climb with their farms. Oh, yeah. The fact that it ticks up like that and other sieves, it's a little bit more gradual, is, is always very satisfying. And Tato Why has do you think played... people play Cookie Clicker, man? <laughs> I never played Cookie Clicker, but Tato's obsessed with it, funnily enough. Really? Yeah, um, Tato, uh, we were uh, maybe having some drinks at NAC, uh, and Tato had the day off, I had the day off, and uh, so we were up till 5 a.m. playing some age, right? And yeah, Tato yeah. said, Tato said, cookie clicker time, and pulled some cookie clicker and was clicking <laughs> away <laughs> 5 a.m. Oh, man. Uh, oh, big fight great. here, and those pikemen go down, and, and as Tato builds castle number two towards the middle, uh, he's just so far ahead right now. Like, he's got a 30 villager lead, similar army counts, and he's going to be in the Imperial Age. I, I just don't know how this guy does it. Uh, he is outplaying Hart in basically every way. His macro's cleaner, His he's taking better fights, his unit movement's better. I mean, yeah, GG, like, jeez, man. Yeah, Calm down there, Tata. I, what I love about this is that pretty much every game I remember on slopes is i'd say a high percentage of them players never take the risk with the villagers and build a mill that's the first thing okay tato did but he never lost the bills which well played to him but the other thing that almost always happens whether you're milling the side resources or not is the players are full walling their starting base and tato never did that he didn't full wall his starting base he played open and he just played with army this entire time a lot of that was probably due to the Khmer's ability to do so but Ornley, we've seen players play like that with Khmer and get punished for it many times because they can't control the game with military, right? So I don't think Hart had a bad game. I think he had a great game, but I think he's just up and out against an elite player now. And Tato is now two wins away from qualifying for the main event of Hidden Cup 5. And uh, man, I mean, looking like this, maybe it'll be pretty easy to spot in the main event <laughs> with, with this play. It's Who's insane. the guy killing everybody else? Oh, yeah, that, that Tato. Yep. <laughs> Crazy. Reds collected, of course, extremely satisfying there with 17,500 food, uh, 7,000 gold. It, more of every single resource, actually, which, again, isn't that common. And here we are saying the same thing about Hart and how he has to try and find a map that can play a little bit more towards his strengths and away from Tato's strengths if there are any out there. The thing is, the best maps for Hart are probably going to be toss-ups against Tato. Yeah, true. That's a good way to say it. And that is going to be difficult, especially if you're looking at an extended series, right? Best of seven. So Hart is going to need to pull something out on a map where Tato could theoretically be favored. And that's the, that's the thing when playing against Tato, right? It's why he's a top player is he just doesn't really have any weaknesses. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing about it, too, is consistency. Um, because a lot of players have some peak that they a, a peak that they can bring but they can't bring it all the time, right? And Tato, I always actually felt like maybe two years ago, he was rather inconsistent. He'd have some tournaments where he would mm -hmm. he would bring the level maybe we're seeing now, uh, and then other times it was just kind of, it wasn't there. Um, but I consider him to be incredibly consistent these days, if not maybe like top two in terms of consistency. Um, Hera being the number one with consistency right now. Tato maybe number Absolutely. two. So, um yeah, you're right. I mean, Hart's going to have to find uh, a map here that is different than... Uh, or Hart is going to have to find a win on a map where Tato is known to excel. And it's going to be game three. Cross now is the choice for Hart. And I I mean, he's going with his number one Civ pick, Ornlu. I actually can't wait to talk to you about this Civ because the win rate's been abysmal. But Hart yep. goes for his number one Civ pick, the Persians, here to break Tato, game number three. Yep, I am at zero seconds, so... Okay. Uh, three, whatever. two, one, go. Uh, here we are, game three. So, we have a lot to talk about on cross, right? There's going to be a point where we can't really talk civs and, and strategy. But what do you think about the Persians? Because they're, they've are they been picked first, the second most in the drafts, and they have a win rate of about, like, 28%. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, that's it's tricky. It's it's kind of strange, right? Because Persians have everything they need to excel on um, a map like Cross. Yep. You can go for the early dock. You have the fast working TCs and docks. You can go with the forward dock in your opponent's pond, and with the extra HP, it's almost impossible to take out easily. And but I mean, they struggle, I think, especially against Japanese and taking very efficient fights. Yeah. So I was going to say, I think, so obviously with any of the win-loss data we have, in a qualifier where you have the first two rounds especially, there being heavy favorites, you have to take any bit of data with a massive grain of salt, right? Um, but I've noticed with Persians, they're picked a lot for this map, and Japanese are is another strong pick for this map. I think Japanese is usually going to be able to have a really strong army comp against them, right? You have the pikemen, you have the monks, even cav archers, right? So maybe that's part of it. Um, I think another thing that I've I've felt with the Persians is that uh, sometimes in the mid game, your TCs are, mo are moving so fast, they're producing so quick. Players always want their uh, TCs to be producing. And I've realized it's really difficult for people to actually make knights while on one or two TC, or like two or three TCs rather, with the Persians because you need so much food to be able to produce out of those TCs yeah. that quickly and also make the knights. So it's just kind of a fun thing. It's a unique thing, but maybe players with Persians need to idle their TC a little bit in Castle Age. I don't know. <laughs> the problem with that, though, is then you don't have an eco bonus and you have a rather middling tech tree at that point. And against Agreed. a civ like Japanese, who just have stronger military options, good monks, great cav archers. I Don't get me started on the cav archer bonus that feels completely random and... I don't and know why the sim is so good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I agree that bonus felt very forced, but it is in the game. And we'll see how it goes. But the big thing here with the Persians, uh, specific to this map, is the docks are incredibly strong. So um, if you are able to get a dock up on your opponent's pond, good luck to the opponent taking it out in Feudal Age. They're that strong. Now, on the other side of things, the Japanese have the strong fishing ships. So I think both of these civilizations actually have... Uh, good defensive bonuses for cross, which is why sometimes I'm noticing players will not even try and uh, like build a dock on a Japanese or Persian pond. They will instead just kind of go to the other areas. So uh, Tato is saying something, I believe, about servers here. I can't translate that. So hopefully there was there's no lag for them. Uh oh, but yeah. uh, we we continue on here. I, I I don't know how your Spanish is, but uh, uh, uh not very good. Yes, <laughs> okay. I took French, man. Yep. Okay. Well, um, I uh took very little of of either. So I think they're talking <laughs> about potentially there being a ping issue. Tato is maybe feeling some lag. We're we're back into it. Heart now is down now here towards the south with the stock, and then we've got Tato docked in the north. Uh, another thing that the Japanese can bring to the table here is some insane flexibility for the man-at-arms. And it's just their potential to fish and also get man-at-arms on a map where usually it's hard to afford the all those things at once is probably second to none. So I think Japanese number one with the man-at-arm opening. But Hart should expect that in some ways here, Ornlu. We've seen it a lot from Japanese on this map. But the thing is, it's usually been fairly effective just because you are spreading yourself out a little bit no matter what when you're going for the, the early dock. Players, even if they try and go for a quick archery range follow-up behind it, it's difficult to do everything at once. Mm -hmm. So the men at arm play has been fairly consistent so far, I would say. I mean, Japanese are, what, 5-0 and against Persians on this map? So that, that checks out. But I still like the idea of even if you just go for a forward dock with Persians and you just build one fishing ship inside Ooh, or one you... fire ship. Did you catch that? So Tata was sending a villager, and the villager had a net in his hands, right? So that had been clicked to a shore fish. And Hart saw it, and then Tato clicked on another resource real quick, fought the vill, and then kept running the other way. So it still seemed to me like Hart could have picked up on the fact that vill was going to dock the other side. But it was an interesting moment here because Hart couldn't do anything to deny it, but he might have that information now. And that might be... Why Hart is sending a vill to the left. He may be looking to wall, but no, I think Hart knows that and is going over there to contest that. That's very interesting. 
Well, wouldn't the villager just going in that direction all by itself kind of indicate a dock? Yeah, 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 in, in some ways. The net, <laughs> the net was an extra element that I needed to point out. <laughs> okay. Uh, but at the very least, oh, some nice quick balling there for Tato. I think he has enough room for a dock. Uh, yeah, just bling the palisades there. And oh, look how romantic those docks are. Yeah, romantic docks. And Hart brought his scout over. Tato knows he's been spotted and his scout's not here. He's trying to scout Hart's base. And Hart is not full walled by any means. And Tato did not go for man at arms, by the way. He's just going to be going for scouts. Now, this is not something Hart can scout because there's so many things to scout on this map, Ornlu. So he will be a little bit surprised by this. I think there still might be a part of him that's waiting for man at arms to arrive right now. Yeah, I wonder. Um, the second dock is well here for Hart. Uh, like I was saying earlier, something you can do with Persians is you can just have one fire galley garrisoned in the dock, and it takes so long yeah. to actually take down that Persian dock that you can invest, force a lot of investment from your opponent. But Hart's saying, nah, man, I am just going to overwhelm you with the power of these Persian docks, and he is making a really concerned effort to win water, but Tato's saying, hold my uh, cerveza, because... <laughs> Yeah, you We're know what's interesting here. is I think Tato is making the second dock because he thinks Japanese need two to beat Persians one. And then it's going to be two docks for both here. But I do love how Hearts on seven fishing ships behind this. That's really good. Uh, that Just that starting dock has been producing fishing ships so consistently. I don't think you want to go over that number too far. But it's a good thing for Hart to do that. Tato is doing the same at his pond. And again... Does Hart know Tato's going scouts? He still hasn't seen the stable. So any additional scout play from Tato could be a surprise. And here we go. Hart knows now that one scout is weak. And Hart fights it off very nicely here. Uh, a lot of players don't have that confidence. And that could have led to a dead villager here. Hart micros again as well. And he's making a spears. Really clean play from Hart right now. Absolutely. Uh, just immediately focuses the low HP scout. So not just recognizing that the scouts are incoming, but realizing which one's the low HP scout and going for that fight. But Tato, of course, <laughs> scouts can so often just find a way to get damage done no matter what. And that will be the uh, first dead villager for Heart in this game. Although fire ship numbers are actually even, but Tato's are just chilling in the docks for now. Yeah, Heart's got to be careful. He has three ships in the same spot, like stacked between the docks. Yeah. And Tato has a demo on the way. This could be brutal. Oh, God. Not against Tato um, Hart. Oh! Oh, my ow. God. That demo hit all four ships there. Are you kidding me? Uh, yeah. That was not the greatest moment of unit positioning there for Hart. And now oh. Tato just going to be surging. What? Oh. Are you kidding me, Tato? Seriously, man. Tato I, mean, I know Tato's the... good with demo ships. You don't need to make it that easy. <laughs> that, those were the dream demos for Tato. And uh, Tato eight one KD now. And hard with all this investment. Like, he had the docks up faster. He had the ship lead. Just wasn't able to get the positioning. And, and I think we do have to bring it back to think about land, right? Think about how land is being played out now. And Hardis has to be very reactive there. He has to be paranoid and worried about Tato. And so Tato paid off. It paid off for him big time there on the water. Behind this, he's also going to go archers too. So archers can help against the spear defense. It feels like Hard wants to just go up to Castle Age here with very little activity in Feudal Age. But uh, I could see him getting punished very easily by the archer switch. Well, there is a huge hole open on the right side of his base. So, yeah. Something that Hart's going to need to keep in mind. Can click up the Castle Age at least fairly soon. And at least Hart is still actually slightly ahead in resources collected. Yep. Is trying to dock over in the east and actually will save the villager from Tato's scout. Although it's going to, I think, delay the dock. No, I think the Vil can build that. Yeah, Vil, Vil should be able to build that. Tato knows that. It wouldn't surprise me if we see an archer hit over that way to kill that Vil. And I think Tato's doing the right thing here. Trying to loop around to see if your opponent is open is a risky move. Because by the time you get there that may just be walled up anyways. What you can do is you can get immediate damage here by trying to break through this wall. But I mean, good job from Hart here to have the res to click up the castle and play defensive there. He will be able to click up. It's just, can he defend on land against scouts and archers for the next couple minutes here? Well, at this point, Hart is about fully walled. He can click up the castle age right now. There we go. And even Persians research castle age a little bit faster. 
Uh, are we going to see a second stable, though? Because you're going to need at least uh, several units to clean up Tato's army. I mean, Tato has a fairly sizable land army. Yeah. And he's not going to be too far behind either. I think he needs a tower right now. Like, I, I get what he's trying to do here with the houses. But once this once this house goes down, the archers are going to be so much closer. And he's playing real, real cute with it and trying to pull back the weak vills. But you just sometimes you just have to drop the tower, Ornlu. And this is as good a time as any for Hart. You cannot let these units break in. You cannot lose villagers to this. Absolutely not. Uh, well, one goes down right there. Possibly another one. She does escape. Tower is going to come up. I like that the tower is at least on the high ground, so it can uh, kill these units at least a little bit more effectively. And, uh, I mean, you lose some bills there. It's not the end of the world, even if it isn't as pretty as I think we would have liked. Yeah, your TC still works faster. You're still in Castle Age way faster. There's ways to recover from this if your heart. Still do need to keep people updated on the left side pawns. The heart hasn't given up on it. Tato's slowly working away at this dock. It looks like there's just going to be one dock remaining here from heart. I mean, if heart gets a big demo, he can still be competitive on this pawn. But it does feel like he's going to lose this one. And he does have the one on the right side right now. He actually made two fire galleys. He was that paranoid that Tato was going to go over there because Tato scouted him. He made two fire galleys there, which is <laughs> insane. Yeah, that is uh, very safe. And the war galley upgrade is going to come in immediately. And perhaps with those castle age ships in, you can take better, uh, slightly better fights. But the thing is uh, with fire ships is that they're only a little bit better than fire galleys when the two units are fighting each other. So it's yep. really that 20 extra HP that matters. I think the demo can make a big difference, though, inside that dock. Um, there are three ships that are clumped, so that could help. And that's definitely something Hart needs right now. And he also needs the... Uh, yeah, he pops out. Nice job. That's oh. a beautiful demo for Hart. That's exactly what he wanted. And he also will have the knights at home to work with. Tato notices this. Lands as good a demo as he can ask for. Still can be remain competitive here, but nice job from Hart. Absolutely. Uh, another fire ship coming out there for Hart. And although Tato won water super decisively early on, it didn't actually translate to much, right? Yeah. How much, how much value is winning water with fire ships when you can only make one fishing ship? It's not that big of a deal. So this is about as good as Hart could ask for. Although a couple demos, of course, can get the absolute perfect hits because Tato. <laughs> and uh, yeah, okay. even fight now. Tato going to get Bodkin now for the archers. Of course, Crossbow should come in too. Tato is not, once again, not completely walled. And he will drop a town center as well as send two vills over to the east. So I think he will try and dock there. Tato's army activity has been amazing. Hart has the eco lead, though, with 10 fishing ships. So he's got some on the right side. He's also got this su southern area. But he is soon going to run out. This is the problem with going above, like, you know, five or six fishing ships here. A lot of players will stop at, at where Hart's at seven because you're going to need fish traps sooner rather than later. And, and I always find that really complicated to get the timings down with fish traps. It feels like more often than not, I've just got fishing ships that with nothing to do for most of early Castle Age. That's why you need to play more uh, BF, man. <laughs> I, I, I can think of I can think of a couple counts of reasons why I don't need more Black Forest in my <laughs> life. <laughs> uh, well, Tato's actually running into the same uh, issue. He even has more fishing ships there, I think, than his opponent. Yep. And the Japanese are going to run out of fish even faster. But Tato is making that important switch over into the fish traps. And he's also got gill nets to further improve his Japanese fish. Yeah, really interesting, too, how Tato has not gone for the crossbow upgrade. And, oh, there's a hole, and Hart's going to get through, and Hart needed something. He, is, he hadn't killed much Ika from Tato. And this is what you want with those knights. Kill a couple of villagers, be able to run away before Ballistics comes in as well. And this is this is messy stuff for Tato right now. Hart's done a really nice job this game. Finally getting some control, getting some counter damage in. It felt like the previous two games, he was never able to do that. So a nice find. And what I appreciate from Hart this game is even when things started going, you know, quite poorly for him early on with Tato getting those amazing demo hits, he's not panicking. Yeah. And it's something that's always a little bit of a question mark with Hart, especially, you know, these days in tournaments. Um, but yeah, no, he's he's playing quite calm and collected. He's defending everything at the front. He's getting another town center. Persians don't need to be on as many TCs as quickly as their opponent. And yeah, he's still developing towards Knights and Scorpions. So not really a whole lot to complain about for Hart. Yeah, I agree. Cav Archer number isn't that high for Tato. Tato is going to attack Scorpions with Spears, which is just pretty much to give his himself time to get away with the Archers. And you got to think about Tato's military count right now. I know that it says that he's got more, but he's got, uh, well, the Spears are now dead. The Archers are, well, Archers. 
And then he has five fire galleys in that pond on the western side. So he could fish there, obviously, but he hasn't done so yet. And just the military in general is actually a lot better for Hart than I think the score and the stats suggest right now. Yeah, whenever you're introducing water to a map, the scores can be quite misleading. Uh, as, you know, having an army of 20 fire ships doesn't matter if they're just kind of stuck in the corner of the map. Yeah. Still, Tato is keeping pace with his opponent. And of course, the thing with Japanese here is that you are developing towards a very strong long-term uh, long army with these cav archers. Scorpions can help, but especially as the knights don't have plus two defense, they will just get uh, gunned down there by the uh, cav archers. Yeah, Tato might need some knights or siege of his own here. Tato is really heavy on stone. I think he sees these forward golds from heart. And, well, the forward golds and stone of, you know, his own base here. And I think he, he really wants a forward castle down for that reason. But it is definitely a timing, at least with this many bills on stone, which is unique. You're usually seeing the third town center come up. Then you're seeing 10 villagers on the stone later on. So Tata wants this sooner rather than later. And Tata wants to kill these scorpions. And he's trying to dodge them. Hart has ventured out so far here. And he's going to lose oh, but these... look, more scorpions incoming. Ah! This man is not messing around. <laughs> Yeah, actually not bad. I mean, a couple more volleys on these cav archers, and the cav archers will start to go down. And Tato knows it, so Tato's going to drop a TC. Nice job there from Hart. Yeah, I mean, the thing with scorpions is that it looks like they're not doing anything and not doing anything, and then everything dies all at once because of that pass-through damage. Yeah. Now, it looks like Hart... Okay, he sees the town center, and those bills are they're all lined. lined up, so... Uh -huh. I mean, it feels like Tato's got just enough yeah. resistance. Nice shot there. Just enough army here, and the TC's close enough to going up where he has to back away. Tato, again, has to deal with more scorpions. Hart saw the previous game from Tato and said, good idea, let me try that. But uh, now we're going to see a siege workshop from Tato, and as long as it goes up, he can make a mangonel. But Hart, that again, has not made it easy for Tato, and the res collected is dead even right now, actually. The closest game so far of the series. Yeah, and again, it's just, it's really nice to see from Hart in particular, just able to keep on going. I mean, it's a best of seven. It's a long series. You drop two games. It's certainly not ideal, but it's not something you can't come back from. You've got a Maganel coming in as well. A lot of those Cav Archers are quite low in HP as we are going towards the third TC of Hart. Very nice reaction time, though, from Tato. Yeah, I thought Tato maybe wouldn't notice there, but he not only notices and splits away from it, but then he takes out the siege. Talk about making it look easy there for Tato. And now he just runs away. I believe he has husbandry right now. That, that could explain the speed difference. Yes, he and does. he's using that speed difference pretty effectively. And now I'm a little bit more concerned for her heart. Oh, God. Tato can't split away from that one. Dang, man. Scorpions. Oh, we got some Matrix levels. Dodge this. <laughs> I mean... Second time in this series, we've seen Scorpions do really well. So I, I don't hate it, but it's never a unit like that you could just make on its own, right? Ideally, you need to have it combined with something. Dang. Uh, yeah, it, that, that's always the thing with Scorpions, is they are not very useful on their own. Cav Archers, I mean, a fantastic spling there from Tattoo, but the second Mangonel is perhaps not something anticipated. The Peasants are uprising. What is happening, oh, Tattoo? I mean, he didn't hesitate before. And so maybe this time he should have, because <laughs> he just ran yeah. right into so much siege, and there's still scorpions around, so I'm really concerned that Tatsu's going to run in, into even more shots here. My goodness. This has been Tato getting destroyed by siege simulator, and yet again, more Seriously? scorpions. My goodness. I mean, the mass siege play with Persians is not something we see every day, but you know what? Tato has been reluctant to make a ton of knights. He's now going pikemen plus cav archer. So if you're leaning more into that siege for heart, it makes absolute sense. Tato doesn't have uh, that many mangonels, just has one. And he doesn't have monks with redemption or oh, his own knights. So not really a whole lot to counter them. Look at the outpost from heart. Okay, so this is, we're going to have a big moment. Both players are going to build a castle here. Heart yeah. might be a little hesitant to build it near the siege workshop. So I could see him building it to the right, but like... There's so much gold exposed on the front for both of them. A castle in this area can make or break the game. And I think Tato's going to try and do it too. So it could happen at the same time, which actually means the, the mangonels become the most important thing, right? Because they need to... They, if you lose your mangonels, you are likely going to lose the position. 
Oh, yeah, man. and I, I love the outposts for that very reason. The rush distance is so short, and if your opponent just commits with a ton of villagers to building a castle, then there's very little you can do to stop it if you're not in position. So just try to make sure you are in position in the first place, and Tato seems to be doing the exact same thing. Just really smart from both of these players. Also, Ballistic's going to be in on the Cav Archers, which is quite important, as the Maganel battle's now starting up. Yeah, and this is this is the composition that we talked about can be a problem for the Persians. The, the pikemen for the Japanese with the Cav Archers. It's Usually it can just be one of them, but it's both here. As Tato loses his siege, but takes out all of Hearts. And he takes that as an invitation to drop a castle. Hart has his scorpions here, though. Hart's going to drop his own castle. And he knows this could be a problem. He's got to place this first. He's oh. not building it. Tato isn't either yet, because the Cav Archer's on the foundation. And there it goes. Oh, but there's a Manganel, but the knight is right there, and that's all you need is just that one knight. And now I would imagine both castles are going to go up, but this is just so much of an uglier position for Hart as he just doesn't have that more long-term sustainability with his army composition that Tato does. Yeah, exactly. And and think about the gold position now. He was he TC'd this gold. Tato's castle is on a TC, and it is on a gold, and of course the opponent's castle, which is going to kill Bills now. And if Hearts Castle goes up, which it will, it doesn't deny anything from Tato. So Tato can happily shift around to the other areas. The Scorpions weren't able to do enough in the long run. And Hart just needed more sustainable army. Now, he did get some kills with some knights in the back of Tato's base on the gold. It looks like Tato sees that or will deal with that. And Tato's going to drop another castle, which is going to lead to then him stealing all that stone, most likely. This is going to be so awkward for Hart to maneuver through. Yeah, that Cap Archer Pikeman already composition is really tough to stop, especially for a sieve like Persians. Tato is a little bit late on getting those eco upgrades, just now getting Bow Saw. And to his credit, Hart is on his way up to Imperial Age, and Tato nowhere near it. Yeah, so you have you have two choices in these instances. Choice one is stay in Castle Age, go Petards, Rams, everything you can do to take out that castle, because this is gonna come down the Trebs. Option two is you don't produce anything and you click up to Imp, and then you figure out what you wanna produce from there. So clearly they've chosen different options here. I, I prefer Hart's choice. I think that he already is struggling, or, or sorry, I think what Hart is doing for him is the correct play here because he is in a really awkward spot already with army. So I don't think staying in Castle Age is going to change that. And then for Tato, he already has good army control. So I could see why he'd want to go as crazy as he is. But you need eight Petards to take out a full HP castle. And he has a four... And then he's gonna have the Rams here. So we'll see if Tato can take this, this castle out. If he does not, Hart's gonna have two of them and the ability to make traps. Yeah, unfortunately though, for Hart, uh, he doesn't have any gold income right now. As uh, I mean, that's the whole reason for going for this forward castle in the first place is you were denying so many yep. resources of your opponent, garrisoning the pikemen in onto the castle or onto the, the Rams, going Look to go at... after the castle and can shield the petards. Sorry to interrupt you, but can we appreciate that Tato recognizes there's no gold and is going to preemptively tower that two tiles just in case Hart finds it on the right? Uh... Like, like the bottom of Hart's base, like near the pond. Oh, I, I didn't even see that tower. Yeah, like, first. <laughs> I'm looking to see where can Hart take gold, and he hadn't scouted that. Tato knows it's there, and Tato is walling it. So he, in the moment, which we all know is so hard, can recognize this guy doesn't have gold, so I could kill him, and I need to make sure he doesn't get there. He's getting guard tower, he's bringing in the rams, and this is before but the petards come in. Hearts coming sappers, so the vills get extra damage to rams. Which is new, right? I yeah, think they recently new. changed it, so the vills against vills get extra damage against rams. Heart using that new damage, but still, dude, it's villagers underneath the castle. <laughs> Oh, man. This is just such a weird game at this point. Uh. Chemistry coming in as well. And Hart just doesn't have an army. Tato is max pop. And that castle is unfortunately for Hart to go down. Zero gold income, zero stone income. Now, he will have bombard cannons available to him in just a moment. But he just doesn't have that standing army that you really want to take down Tato. Tato's sticking to everything we know about him, right? Demos, towers, things he's always been really good with. He's going to get Yasama now. So his towers are stronger. And we have yet to see the petards. So these rams are zooming their way in. If the petards can make their way over here, that castle for Hart might go down. He might never get a treb, honestly. 
Uh, it's pretty close. Uh, I mean, garrisoning the, the pikeman is also really smart because it adds so much extra damage. I mean, you're getting, what, 30 extra damage a hit with yep. the, the pikeman garrison? So... That is not half bad, and that castle is just going to go down so ridiculously wow. fast. Wow, that's insane. And the petards are even on their way, but Hart will not get a treb. The treb is denied. His golds are denied. He calls the GG, and that went from 0 to 100 so freaking fast. But again, Hart's playing incredible. He's so good, but then there's just Tato on the other side of him. That's the problem. What insane play there from Tato. You, you got to love watching this guy play. Absolutely. And it's just, it's so distinct, right? Tato is winning his way. He's having like these really smart timings, good unit control, doing a little bit offbeat stuff with the towers and the big demo ship hits. But at the end of the day, it's just, he has the solid mechanics behind it. And that's really just what puts him way over the top. Yep. I also love Tato's tendency in some of these games to recognize he, he doesn't want that imp timing that so many players shoot for, right? Like Tato mm -hmm. here is getting armor for knights. He knew if, if Hart had any chance, Hart was going to be limited on resources and probably going skirms and a couple traps. He said, Castle Age Knights can deal with that. Who wants to go Castle Age Knights with Japanese? Not too many people. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Batards, the Rams, the Castle Traps. I mean, man, I thought Hart had a really good game there. The Scorpions found some good hits. But again, it was, it was consistent army. That was the problem for Hart. He never really had over 10 knights this game. It was... I remember a couple instances where there's three knights in Tato's eco, they died. Three more knights in Tato's eco, they died. There's never a big ball of knights next to his scorpions. And I don't know if that comes back to what we said before about the Persians, where you never feel like you have the resources to make army and boom at the same time. Um, maybe it was the shortage of gold. But uh, ultimately, again, to repeat myself here, I think you just you got to look right over on the other side of things and say that Tato's just playing his best Age of Empires ever. And there's a reason he was a favorite. Oh, for sure. And I do think that there is a bit of a Persians problem there. Just having the food intensive unit in the night, it's so expensive to get upgrades for them and to have the numbers you need. And it's a much easier switch for Japanese to go into cav archers, especially yeah. if they have the food income um, from their fishing ships. So they can just invest more bills on uh, wood and gold. Yeah, well, 3-0 here for Tato. I mean, I, I think I said before the series... 4-2 for Tato because Hart is is that good where you think he could snag some wins. But 3-0 now. And I do wonder, so obviously um, the, the winner of this series qualifies for the main event of Hidden Cup, right? That is, is clear to everybody. But the loser gets a second chance tomorrow in another best of seven. And I do wonder if, if you're already kind of doubting your chance to win the series... I do wonder if you, you begin to kind of have your mind in tomorrow's best of seven already, if you're in Hart's position, you know? Because I saw that a little bit from Ganji. I was like, okay, Ganji, he was down bad against MBL. And then I realized, like, maybe he's got that other best of seven living in his brain. I, I don't know, but it is a thought. And it is a positive, I guess, for Hart that he this isn't going to be it for him if he loses this. Yep, and I mean, whoever he faces will have also just lost a best of seven, so Correct. it's yeah. that might be giving you a little bit more confidence, but uh, he'll be going up against, I believe, either Sebastian or Babarum, and both of those guys are playing really well. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, although Hart is, you know, trying to push his way back into the top ten, I, I don't even know if he's a huge favorite versus either of those guys at this point. I like what someone just said over in my chat. He said, if you're losing badly, you should go crazy mode. Let's see Hart go crazy mode here, dude. I like that energy. Yeah, yeah. Crazy mode on a map that I'm sure Hart is just obsessed with. I'm sure he he is so excited to see it in the map pool like <laughs> everybody else who's watching. I'm at zero seconds if you are Ornlu. I am. And uh, three, two, one, go. The map that Hart will have to go crazy mode on to have any chance here today is Islands. And we've got Hart playing as the Italians. We've got Tato playing as the Vikings. And man, like from week one to now week, I think technically three in this qualifier. I know you've been casting a lot, Ornlu. Yep. What, what have you been thinking about this Islands meta? What is the meta right now? Because I've seen it change. So on the one hand, you have... Players starting, I think, opening either with landing or with fast galleys, like, you know, we're playing islands back in the day. Now we see a lot more fast castle. Uh, back docks, 
either a landing or maybe fast castle, especially Vikings, you know, trying to go for the fast castle longboats, greed style. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of different ways you can play this map, to, uh, contrary to what Twitch chat always likes saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, that's what I felt. And I think it'll be interesting to see if the main event players and, of course, all the players who end up qualifying end up agreeing, right? Because when it comes to a uh, meta in a qualifier, you have that mix of people not being entirely sure what's working yet, combined with maybe certain things are working because one player is better than another, right? But uh, to see, have seen a Fast Castle against Fast Castle game twice, I think, this week, when the level should be more competitive, it should be closer, is, uh, is pretty wild to me. And I wasn't expecting it to really go that far. But a big thing when it comes to the approach here at least from Hart's point of view with the Italians, is the Vikings don't have as many options. They can't go for the fire galley, which is such a common tool on water maps. So I always feel like if you're going to go landing and make it messy against any civilization, you might want to make it messy against the Vikings. That way the Vikings don't have that easy breezy galley type build. Yeah, and... You know, I, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, where you can play the various water sieves because it's been so long since we've had the pure water map in a map pool. I mean, now you just have so many more viable water sieves. Sure, yeah. Vikings, they really just want to keep the game as standard as possible. They don't like dealing with landings. They have bad monks. They don't really, you know, don't really want to invest into knights or anything like that. And you can't go for fire galleys, as you're saying. So you can't go for really any sort of a hybrid approach. So Vikings themselves are also bad at landing. Yeah. So that does make Vikings somewhat limited. That said, they're really good at what they do. So yeah, yeah, it's gonna be an interesting one. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, Vikings are super smooth at what they do, which is why the win rate's actually been really, really good um, compared to what I thought it was gonna be, anyways. Um, and I, I also thought we would see Portuguese played a ton on this map. That's what everyone thought. Because remember, Hidden Cup 4 Islands, uh, Portuguese, uh, their Feitorias had way more HP. I think they were cheaper back then. They were also way less uh, civs viable on water. We've seen the Dramans introduced to water. We've seen Armenians. Bengalis, I think, will actually see in the main event on water. Um, I must be missing some here. Uh, uh, Dravidians. Dravidians is um... an obvious one. And, you know, the list probably goes on in, in some of the balance changes that happen on water, like cannon galleons, right? We're actually seeing cannon galleons utilized in fights now, whereas in the past they were useless in the fights. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been interesting for me as well. Tato uh, indicating to us he's going to go for more passive play with the dock in the north. And Hart is gone for kind of a back dock. And I did want to point out that this strip of, of sand here is very likely passable i'd be very surprised if that is actually uh like locked off in yeah. some way that should be passable terrain it does look weird but uh don't worry it's not like not a true island here for hardy he should be fine <laughs> it is technically a peninsula <laughs> yeah yeah and it shouldn't be dockable uh, either to my knowledge what you but can do might probably be... is wallet yeah it might be wallable yeah that's true you could yeah. technically like stone gate that which would be really interesting yeah i don't think that would be like bug abuse or anything like that i mean it's just kind of aoe2 maps can be weird sometimes right yeah i mean i don't know if it would benefit you but if there was one on the other side and this was like viper he would stone gate stone gate stack docks in there and go for fish boom <laughs> yeah. absolutely Okay, so this is a fast castle war again. What in the world? I know. Well, maybe not for Tato, actually. Tato could be going for some delayed galleys. Um, there is a build that I think you can do with all sieves, which is underrated, in my opinion, against this. Which is you go double dock, uh, you make two galleys, and then you add six or so fishing ships here. So uh, yeah, we could see that. Yeah. Um... And then you go for a, sort of a semi-fast castle age. Correct. You yeah. get to like if you go, if you're going against a fast castle, which is almost certainly what Hart is doing, that can give you okay. I can put some pressure on my opponent's fishing ships, but still not be too far behind them in the castle age time. Especially maybe if you're a sieve like Vikings who can come back on water very well in early castle age because of the longboat, it might be even just that much more viable. Yeah. Well, so um, I've I've seen it and I've talked about it, and my thinking is, you will know. So, so in Tato's position, 
you haven't seen heart in feudal yet and it's cheaper for italians you know with certainty it's his fast castle for heart and so if it's fast castle for heart where's he gonna dock he's gonna dock the back that's what everyone does so you're never scouting the front and then if it's fast castle for heart you're gonna eventually die to fire ships so the two galleys are more than enough to snipe as many fish as you could possibly get and then you go the two galleys into a couple more fish and i think this will be a tell it's tricky because everyone's going to be seeing this but this build here i think will be a lot more common what tato's doing so but if tato wins this game and wins the series makes it to the main event tato confirmed possibly if we see this it's really nice build order yeah i am a fan of it it's not impossible to defend because uh, especially for a civ like Italians who have such a smooth, fast castle, you can easily just make like one fire ship and sort of push the the galleys away. I mean, it's only two of them. Yep. But I, I still think it's an interesting build from Tato. And it's again, we, we see these little differences and adaptations uh, as the metagame develops on islands in 2024. Yeah, it's fun. It's really good. Yeah, it's been it's been really fun to to think about. And um, there's there's still some variations I think that people have not figured out just yet, which will possibly come in the main event now tattoo just misses the forward dock from heart which might actually end up helping him because he might have stayed there and lurked around for the fish but yeah like we said he doesn't want to scout the front he wants to scout the back and he does get very fortunate here because some it could be the other side you know um he should be able to locate this dock and know there's fish here and yep there he goes he sees the fish this <laughs> is actually the dream scenario for this build order for tattoo Absolutely. It is six galley shots to kill a fishing ship, so just three volleys of two. And that fire galley is going to have a very bad day trying to chase down uh, the regular galleys. And the fishing ships are trying to uh, scatter as best they can, but still denying a bit of food income. And like I was saying, you're not that much slower to castle age with yep. this sort of build. It is interesting that Tato put so much priority on going up still. Because he sold the stone, right? But I like how smooth this is you kill two fishing ships you have eight behind this you also get the wheelbarrow upgrade with the vikings already and then in castle age you're soon going to get handcart for free and this must be longboats which again have been really really good for the vikings longboats have lost but they have also won and looked incredibly strong if you can get enough of them i mean yeah that's the thing is longboats are very population efficient especially relative to the the regular galleon line but they are expensive, and especially on the, the gold cost. So if you invest too much of them, too much into them in the late game, you can get out cost efficiency to buy regular galleons. So it's a really tricky dynamic between do you want to invest all the way into longboats? But at the very least in the mid game, longboats should be uh, the ruler of the seas for the Vikings. Yeah. yeah. And it's just the, the downside is can you get by without any defense when these fire galleys are coming in? And the answer should be no. The cheap dock techs are in for the Italians. Obviously, we saw the pro of Tato's strategy. We're now going to see the con because these fires should shred all of Tato's fish. So the investment into fish, I think, did pay off. He brought in a lot of food with those fishing ships. But he could start to lose some of them on both sides now. Great job from Hart to immediately loop around to the back. Just like Tato did to know that the fish are going to be there. And longboats will be on the way for Tato, of course. But Tato will have some fire ships to deal with. I love that Hart sent fire ships around both sides yep. just to make sure that the, the fishing ships couldn't uh, escape in one direction or the other. Of course, longboat production has begun. They do train a, a fair bit faster than the uh, the war galley, I believe 11 seconds faster. Yep. And uh, so it's going to be pretty easy to mass the numbers that you need. But still, you're losing a lot of your fishing eco. Tato only on one TC to his opponents too. Yeah, Tato also another dock. So, so usually what happens here... Is the Italian player, they're, they're happy with this. All they want is they just want to snipe the opponent's fish. They know the opponent will take a lot of investment to kill their fires. And then they just plan towards in. So the second TC and the third TC timing here from Hart, this is pretty much textbook. And this is something that I want to like, make sure that people hear. Because two years ago, maybe three years ago with Hart playing on a water map, he might have looked clueless. But even though the scoreline suggests that... You know, he's well obviously the score like suggests Tatch has been better than him. That doesn't mean that he doesn't know what he's doing on these maps. He's played really good, really textbook. But now it becomes difficult because you'll have those three town centers. 
you're still waiting for imp basically and with this very narrow island i could see heart having a really tough time dealing with uh longboat fire that is a transport ship here for tatho it looks like he's gonna go for the the relics in the middle very early on Ooh. well think about it though the it is likely that fast fire and early imp will push tatto back at some point and the idea behind these relics being here is to give the player who has more map control or water control um some some level of advantage so it's very interesting to see him do it this early this might be the earliest we've seen someone go for relics but this is tato and i can't disagree with how he sees the game the only uh more amazing long-term planning is if you rush out the farm upgrades because that's when you know there are true islands <laughs> oh man when ganji didn't disable auto farm yesterday i was i felt so bad yeah, was, I mean, I, was I felt, I felt not really bad for him. I think that's a lesson learned. I think he should have known yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Look how fast this TC goes down. Yeah, man. Oh. Longboats are good. <laughs> oh, man. They're re... I mean, I, I kind of forgot. I thought the villagers can be ranged. But the TCs are just melting. Hart needs something more on water right now. This could get bad. He's going to be on a one town center if he doesn't defend from this. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the strength of going for a longboat slash war galleys. You can just bombard the shoreline so much more effectively. It's now really awkward for Hart. Now, Tato is only on 39 bills to 57 right now, so that is a very sizable difference. Yeah. But he has the navy. He has the map control, and that is going to be so impactful as the game goes on. Hart is going to try and expand over to the side again, where I'm, I'm fairly certain he can still be ranged by longboats. Oh, man, and then you've got, like... You're staring down at three wins from Tato. Like, oh, it must feel so rough right now to be hard. <laughs> oh, so painful. This is why people may be going Fast Castle. And then maybe this leads into Fast Castle Caravel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Although I did, I was thinking uh, the Thirasadai would be really good against longboats because they are, you know, so good against galleys. I did a, a bunch of testing yesterday. Okay. Apparently they're awful against uh, longboats. The extra little bit of damage that longboats do, like, they easily win. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking, I think that ship should be combined with Galleon. And then maybe, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, but no idea. I think because you can only make that ship in Imp, you need to be making Galleons anyways. But, yeah. Well, I mean, Hart needs, Hart wants to, wanted an easy 3TC boom to click up, drop a castle, go fast fire. He is completely surrounded, and he has been unfortunate with the shape of his island as well, right? Yeah. Because like Tato's island would, if Hart had that, the galleons wouldn't range, uh, these uh, longboats rather, wouldn't be able to range as much. But Hart like really in a tough position, both because of the strategy from Tato and the shape of his island right now. But you also have to possibly adapt your strategy to the given map, right? If yep. you, yep. your entire strategy is just contingent 100%. on my opponent can't range me when I'm comfy on my island, and your island is uh, rather elongated. Like, maybe you have to try and think about some doing something different. It's not like Italians can only do this. They're yeah, very it's, flexible. Exactly. Italians have the galley option. Italian, Yeah, there's a lot of different things Italians can do. Res Collected is higher for Tato, which is crazy considering he is behind by so many villagers. And he already is, He's going to have six relics. Actually, there's nothing to stop Tato from getting maybe all of them. Because he can just transport over to, to Hearts Island next. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing stopping him. Both of the relics are actually far forward, and Tato has the vision of both of them. Yeah. Hart is trying to work, I think, towards a castle and an Imperial Age. He doesn't have either of the buildings he needs to click up. Uh, I'm sorry, he's building them over towards the east of his island. So, yeah. I mean, he's kind of getting there. But, I mean, there's so much, <laughs> so many units you need to uh, make to start climbing back here on the water. Yeah. Now, I think. I think he still has a shot if he can get a castle up near this gold, which also, again, he doesn't need it right now. But, I mean, it, the more I look at this, I just the more bad I feel for Hart. I mean, <laughs> when you've got 36 longbows surrounding you, it's always going to be bad. But this is especially bad with, like, that gold position, for example. But he needs to get a castle up there. And then once the castle's up, he's able to drop more docks. That's the idea. But you can't have the castle too far away from the shoreline. Because then the docks can be ranged, and you can't have the castle too close to the shoreline, because then your castle won't go up. So, again, best of luck to Hart right now, as Tato's about to get relic number five and six, and Tato's clicked up at a very similar time behind this somehow. 
Yeah, that's crazy. This just comes down to efficiency, right? I mean, despite having more villagers, the efficiency between the two players has actually been somewhat comparable. Yeah. And that comes down to uh, Hearts Island looking like uh, Britain there... circa 900 CE. 38 <laughs> just... <laughs> longboats right now. 38. This is crazy. Like, you shouldn't be able to imp with this, right? Like, this doesn't feel natural. And okay, there goes Hart. There goes Hart. He's going to try and build a castle in the back. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's at the season. Wasn't uh, Doubt a direct invite to the tournament? Yeah, he's invited, all right. And, uh, well, he's going to be there. Oh. And Hart will not just yet. Hart drops the GG. And on islands, look at the, the total amount of ships created. Just eight fire ships for Hart and 42 ships for Tato there. Now, obviously, we knew the approach. I, I kind of explained it. It has become quite common with the Italians to actually give up water control. And the water control was needed more so in this game than ever. But Tato wins 4-0. The good news for Hart, I, I know it could be easy to, to let this get to your head a little bit, but there's a second chance qualifier for him tomorrow. And Hart is going to move into uh, playing the... Well, I actually forget at this point. Uh, we'll, we'll have to pull that up, who's going to play the, the loser of. But every player who plays in these best of seven deciders, if they lose, they move into another one uh, as the backup qualifier. So I I think Hart... It's the loser of Sebastian Babarum. Loser of Sebastian Babarum. Well, I think Hart will be the favorite in that series. Um, and Tato was always going to be the favorite here, which he showed why today for anyone who maybe hadn't seen him play in this qualifier or seen him play recently he is he is truly one of the one of the greats of the game right now and so um while the 4-0 hurts i think tato winning was expected today Ornu. absolutely um i mean you saw it from as soon as you just look at how the the brackets shape up you know the tato is the one top player that wasn't invited yeah and uh i mean other than the you know turs nobody can take a game off <laughs> the dude's still 96 seed Getting that one win on Tato. That's funny, man. That's the only loss Tato had in the whole qualifier. Maybe I'll invite yep. Turs for Hidden Cup 6. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, that, that checks out. Um, well, anyways, dudes, it was great time casting. I really enjoyed it. I'll be in touch about the main event. Thanks for sure. hopping in here. And, and also, um, all of the coverage of the earlier rounds. When I wasn't casting, you and others were. And I'd always have your stream up, uh, just watching the games. It means a lot to me to have some of the early rounds covered when it's, I know, a little bit um, less likely that people do, right? Because they might not have, yeah. like, the big matchups then. So thanks thanks for the support of Hidden Cup uh, and the event, and thanks for the cast, all right? Yeah, it was a lot of fun, man, and uh, looking forward to the main event, as always. All right, see you, man. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Salutes and chat, please, for Orlu, everybody. It was a great cast, and like I said, he'll be one of the main event casters. I had a good time casting with him today. And, uh, well, again, repeating myself, but also puts, put a lot of time and effort and energy into the early rounds, which meant a lot uh, for the coverage of the qualifier, and he's always been that way. So, um, also, welcome, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. Tato qualifying for Hidden Cup, maybe not a surprise. Um, I feel a little, a little rough for heart there, man. It's like, you know, those games were maybe a bit closer than the 4-0 suggests, but Tato just doing Tato things. Heart, we will see again tomorrow. Uh, but excited to see Tato back because he is such a big name and has so much skill and, and, and so much preparation. Like Tato really is one of the masters at prep. And uh, something that I will explain a bit more at the conclusion of the qualifiers tomorrow is how it's structured. But basically, once we, excuse me, once we have our players, we then release the maps, right? We announce the maps and then it's, we give the players like a week and a half training time. They could take all the time they want to practice things. There will be uh, new settings, new maps, new changes. So it should be good. Um, so yeah, congratulations to Tato, who's qualified. Um, I don't have an image to show all the qualified players yet. And I'm making Hardy uh, freak out right now if he's listening. But what I can do is I can show you... <laughs> Hardy says dot, 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 because I said maybe we'll just do it at the end of the day. Now I'm changing my mind. So dot, dot, dots in chat for Hardy. It's definitely my fault. But here are the qualified players excluding Tato. <laughs> because Hardy, I changed my mind. <laughs> so we'll get Tato onto the list, uh, including yesterday. These are all the qualified players, all the main event players that we'll have. 
Uh, Tato obviously fills into this spot, and then we've got five more that are that are TBD. All right. Um. Anyways, I sh we should have another series coming up here, and it should be a good one. Next one is going to be Barros against Stark. Very different storyline than the the series we just saw. Uh, Stark was was like never expected to be here. Um. He, I had Stark losing in the second round. He three owed running in the second round. Then I had him losing in the third round. He 3 2 Dogao. And, uh, I mean, Sark's had this incredible career, right? But everyone just kind of wants to believe we're in this new era of Age of Empires, right? The next generation. Where are all the young guns at? Well, Stark's like, I should probably look this up. I think he's over 30. Babo Rum is going to play Sebastian later. Is over 30. Like, we've got, we've got a veteran here in Stark who's up against Barl's. Barl's kind of falls into the the veteran category as well to be completely honest with you but uh Barros will be the favorite in the next series so a couple quick shout outs then we'll take a break then we'll move into the next one I want to say thank you to some of the people who subbed today uh also shout out to everyone who's watching on YouTube right now happy to be multi-streaming this to YouTube I know it's more convenient for some of you maybe your uh you know your your internet doesn't jive well with Twitch or maybe you just don't want to see Kappa uh in the twitch chat or something I, I don't know uh thank you to the people who subbed here though so thank you very much thank you marcus man thank you d slats some long time subs here from d slats thank you uh rayo nice to see you back buddy i know he was rooting for tato mlzk thank you um Bla blair cast of the wind <laughs> jurassic pork uh galestro bvc thank you for the thousand biddies uh, Javido, Argy, Dreo, BF, Moritz, welcome back, man. Thank you, Mord. Um, Fraser, Seawill, Talwin, Zark, Brother John, Crick. I mean, I miss names, okay? I've missed names. This is getting dangerously close to 5k. If we hit 5k subs today or tomorrow, I'll drop 20 gifted just to tack it on as a thank you to you guys, okay? So, thank you very much. Uh, break time, though, as we prep for the next series. So, stick around. The next one should be awesome. I think Stark is going to have some strategies, man. I think, I don't know. I've talked to some people about Stark and his chances. Stark is not the favorite, but some people said they've done some, some games with Stark and they've been really surprised by some of the strats and some, uh, you know, the level that he's bringing. So, um, yeah, it'll be a fun one. We'll be right back soon with more action, guys. Thank you. All right, ladies and gents, this just happened. Just now here playing a 1v1 on Mega Random. You'll notice zero on wood, zero on gold, zero on stone. We both start with a Victoria. We don't need wood. Super, super, super strong. And he's like, wait a second. Getting ahead of the game. Next level strap. I'm buying stone. I'm like, ha, 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 ha. He's gonna have to mine it. Or if he tries to buy it, it's gonna be more expensive. Here I am, little T90. Little naive T90. Just so happy. Just feeling so good. Oh, pass slate faster. Just feeling so good. Oh, ha, 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 ha. So here he is, and he sees my Fatoria, and he's like, wait a second. My Fatoria is nice and snug in the back of my base. He's like, wait a second. His Fatoria is in Narnia. Wait a second. His Fatoria is in Narnia. So maybe we're going to do something about that. Guys. He's going for redemption and monks. Okay. Guys. He's going for redemption and monks. 
monks, okay? And there he is, converting my Fatoria. my Fatoria. Okay, thank you for waiting, everybody. Man, I love that song. That song, 
puts me in a good mood. I don't know what it is. It's very, it's it's got a nice vibe to it, you know, which is always good. Puts me in a really good place, and uh, I was already in a good spot because Stark vs. Barrels is coming up, right? Not bad. More music. Sorry, sorry to interrupt the music. I could sing for you. I could go full a cappella, but I prefer to keep my viewers, so I'm not going to do that. All right, we'll save that for a, a maybe liquor league at some point this year when I'm a little, maybe a little too tipsy or something. Uh, yo, the bombers, thank you for the gifted subs. Thank you, Atomic Sausage as well for the dropping the gifted subs earlier, uh, passing them around so to speak. Uh, guys, I did want to mention, and I should continue to mention this. So thank you, uh, mods, for reminders. Um, if you're in the USA and would like to join the only U.S. viewing party that has ever happened, the first, uh, and hopefully not the last viewing party, please check out the pinned links at the top. We've got a Discord server as well as the, uh, the, the tickets. The Discord server has more info. Um, on the final day, the main event of Hidden Cup, we will have a viewing party in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It will have the third place match, the grand final, the big reveal, your food, your drink, your alcohol will all be included. And I will be there afterwards to get to meet you guys too, all right? We've got people flying in. I had people from the West Coast, apparently. We've got people from Canada making it. I don't know how many people here already have tickets and where you're coming from, but those are just things I've heard. Um, I don't know if we have anyone crossing the pond. I know we had some people in the East Coast of the U.S. headed over to Germany, for example, for some meetups recently. But uh, yeah, it's going to be great, all right? And a lot's going into it. So if you haven't already checked that out, if you have interest, please join Accept the true nerd that you are, all right? It'll be awesome, okay? Um, another thing I wanted to mention with the main event uh, is the heroes. And we have these heroes thus far. We have 14 heroes for the main event. So the players who make the main event are playing on hero accounts that they are given. And so there's 14 of them. We have like a six-hour countdown. I think a six-hour countdown until the polls close that I posted on Reddit, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Uh, I'm missing. I'm probably missing one or two. I posted them. Oh, YouTube as well. YouTube poll on the community tab. So basically, we have four more heroes that you can vote for to vote for the 15th hero. Um, right now... Uh, it is not very close, I will say. It is not very close. Um, Emperor Sigismund is winning by a long shot. But if you would like to change that or maybe add on to the votes, please check those platforms. You do might need to do a little bit of searching because there's so many of them, but please, you could vote there. Uh, and we're going to tally it up at the conclusion of the 24-hour period, which again is in like five or six hours, and then we'll have 15 heroes. And then tomorrow, tomorrow... The live stream here on Twitch and YouTube uh, will get to vote on the final hero, which is a cheat code, actually. Because we've had a cheat code in every Hidden Cup. Last year, we had Cobra Car, or last year, well, last Hidden Cup, we had a Cobra Car. And so I have three options for you to vote in a cheat code for Hidden Cup 5. And then we'll have our 16 heroes. And then the bracket will be drawn on Monday or Tuesday. Still have to figure that out. Probably Monday. We'll do that on stream live. And we'll have our bracket, and then we're like dangerously close to the main event. Which is that like surprising to you guys at this point? For me, I don't know why, but I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> uh, we're so close, you know. So, um, I guess there's been so much going into this, and there's so much build up to be suddenly quite close is is pretty wild to me. So, anyways, I got that stuff out of the way. Just want to explain how that works. I think we all know Salim the Grim's gonna win. Salim the Grim will win the whole event. So. I don't know who's going to get Salim, but uh, definitely rigged. Okay, so there's the maps. There's the sieves. Game one's going to be slopes here. And Stark is the underdog. But he has been the underdog the previous two rounds. Maybe we shouldn't be saying he's the underdog anymore. Um, I did go to Stark, and I told him, you know, congratulations. Well played. Like, keep it up, right? And Stark, he did not say too much to me. He said... Uh, I said, freaking insane, bro. Keep it up. He said, we'll try my best. Keep sending them. And Stark uh, is notorious. He has a bat. And he will... He will write the names down of the people that he has beaten on this bat. So I, I responded with a little gif of, of someone hitting a home run. 
Um, and, you know, he hasn't said much more than that. He's getting down to business here. So I appreciate that energy. I like it a lot. So uh, game one slopes. Usually see quite a few scout civilizations there. We'll see what the approach is. And then Stark's got Gold Rush, Cross, and Mudflow. Barls has Islands, Quarry, and Arabia. But there are only seven maps. So I think it is less home. It doesn't feel like this is a home map as much as if there were more maps. I think at this point, it's like the players have to prove they're the best on those settings. But guys, what do you think about Vikings first pick? That's pretty wild to me. Italians, Portuguese, and Armenians were banned out. Those are three really strong water sieves. Vikings first pick from Stark, that's probably for islands, right? And he's got Bengalis and Saracens. It's an interesting draft. Valuing Vikings, Bengalis, Saracens as top three is very unique. I don't know. Thank you, Major Joy, for the four months. Jerbot, thank you for all the stats, dude. And thank you for the two months. Thank you, Woozle, for this six months. Guys, we are going to be adding so many emotes for subs. It's going to be unbelievable. In fact, I don't think we should add too many. It'll be too overwhelming. We will maybe add them as we go on throughout the main event or something. But it'd be cool to have some, some emotes for Hidden Cup. On top of the emotes we already have. But, uh, yeah, Bone Zone says, Any commenters on how T90 agreed to do the stash only until he skydove? Then we'll get it shaved. Was that three years ago now? Yeah, pretty much. And I still have the mustache. Because I didn't skydive with the mustache. So, that's the plan. Any questions about Hidden Cup? Anyone want to chat? We have a little bit till they get started. Robo, I don't know if you're listening. But I'd actually, I told them to start in, in one minute from now. So, we'll probably be starting soon. I'm going to predict a 4-2 Barrels here. Because Barrels is in that category of inevitable in some ways, for my opinion. I'd love to be proven wrong by Stark. Should be pretty crazy, so. Can we run ads now to avoid getting some in the game? If Twitch lets me, yes. If an ad was run recently, Twitch will not let me. I have the lowest possible amount of ads run on YouTube and also Twitch. So if you ever get one, it's, it's the lowest possible. Yeah, it looks like I can, I can run a minute now. So here we go. Boom. Enjoy the ads. Thank you for bringing that up. Where did I hide the cup? Well, it's hidden. I can't tell you that. <laughs> How do servers get decided? For the main event or for this? Um, basically, you, you, get, you get given a server. The, the admins will say, hey, you host here. You play on this server, right? So um, we won't give players servers where there's like one big advantage to the other. But there are instances where we want like more of a neutral server to, to potentially mask the identity. So like... Let's say, um, why am I answering a server question? This is like, Elbanovic, no offense, but this is like one of the worst questions to ask right before a, ser right before a series starts. But anyways, so let's say like you're, you're both like East US and you're like sitting at like 30 ping or something, right? Both of you would be 30 ping on East US because you're both from the same town. If we, we give you like UK server, you're at 90 ping, which is still low ping, but it doesn't make it as obvious as you're someone on East US. Does that make sense? Um, Spectly started. Thank you, Robo. Why? That's on me. Why did I choose that question to answer? That's on me. But that makes sense, right? So, um, that's basically how it works. But obviously, we're not gonna like force a uh, force force a server to to mask the identity in the main event if it leads to like massive advantage to one player. Okay. T90, how on earth did you manage to stay quiet about Hidden Cup Five for two years straight on Facebook? I had a lot of questions on Facebook about Hidden Cup. Um. Truthfully, I had I had an option to do Hidden Cup while I was on Facebook, but it was when I was pretty sure that I wasn't going to be renewed by Facebook, and I was like six to eight months away from concluding. So waiting longer meant it was it took a longer period of time until we got a Hidden Cup again. But at that point, when the countdown was on, I kind of felt like, like, are you guys happy I waited? YouTube and and Twitch. I mean, maybe you're not, but. I kind of felt like it would make sense to just wait, come back, do my thing, and then do the event right 
on Twitch and YouTube. So, oh yeah. Uh, Magyar Saracens game number one should be an excellent series. I thought I had plans for a co-cast. And uh, there was some miscommunication. I'm going to roll solo on this one, guys. Hope you don't mind. And this will give me some time to talk background a little bit more on the players. And, and just some, I mean, some, some tournament history, but also Hidden Cup history in some ways. Because I think both of these players deserve to, to have a lot of praise. Um, they have launched. I just need to get the game stuff set up. And once we do that... We're good to go. But hey, shout out your predictions in chat. We should have the the gambling for the channel points in Twitch chat active if you so wish to to gamble with your internet points that do absolutely nothing. But um but get your predictions in, in chat right now. I want I want you guys to put something on uh onto the internet so there's record of it. All right. And here we are. Ladies and gents, welcome to another best of seven decider winner here joins the main event players. In Hidden Cup, we'll be playing the main event on a hero account. And man, oh man, did we not expect this matchup. You know, there have been expected brackets, like the Tato Heart bracket. That was expected. Everyone predicted Tato Heart, and that happened earlier today. But Stark, he was he's a player who's been around a very long time. He's an older generation. He's a veteran of Age of Empires. Has actually accomplished a lot throughout his career. Um, But the thing is... He is quite possibly the slowest player in the entire qualifier bracket. <laughs> I mean that. Like, of the 96 players in the qualifier bracket, he might actually be the slowest. And let's face it, you do need some speed on top of the strategy in Age of Empires. And Stark has shown that core strategy and consistency is key. And he was able to beat... Um, he was able to beat running in the second round, where I had said... I'm, I could lie to you guys, but I did say that running was the favorite. And then he beat Dogao, which, I mean, and that even felt, I mean, it obviously felt way more convincing. Dogao had deep runs in previous Hidden Cups and on the map pool, right? And Dogao is, at least by Brazilians, like Brazilians watching right now, like, who's the best Brazilian? Well, Miguel is in my chat just a moment ago and resubbed, so you got to be careful. He said hello, beauty, to me four minutes ago. So you, you might want to say Miguel. But I think a lot of people wouldn't say Dogao. And maybe now people should be saying Stark, right? Um, over here on the other side, Barrels, it was an expected run. Uh, Barrels made it into Hidden Cup 4 through a qualifier. He uh, did lose the first round. I believe Barrels was Jacqueline. Yes, a Jacqueline of High Nuts, I believe was his account, which I'm sure he loved once he got told that that was his account. But Barrels, very consistent, very strategic, but also very aggressive. And very and, and can be quick at times. And I think a lot of people like to say that Barrels is a um is like a closed map player, but I think that's incorrect. I think he has the ability to play closed maps very well, but he also has the tools in his locker to be aggressive. So he has gone for the Magyars. You would expect some aggression through scouts from the Magyars. And Stark is the Saracens. Now Stark has a lot of wood at the back of his base, which does sometimes happen on slopes. But his main gold is pretty far forward here. And so he's choosing not to take that, as he too is also pushing in some deer. And he's going to be going for the gold in the back. So most likely an archer build. Saracens, they, they want to be on gold to buy and sell things from the market a bit earlier. Um, I, There are some funky builds you can go for with Saracens and go like to gold and buy the food for scouts, but I don't think we'll see that here. But yeah, Stark has been doubted before. Uh, and he has been the underdog before. And when I messaged him and said, dude, like crazy play after his previous round against Ogal, he said, thanks. Keep sending them. So I, I like the mindset from him. And I've spoken to some players who apparently did some training sessions with him. And they, they basically said, don't count out Stark. His strategy is really strong. So it was funny. And both players I spoke to about it said, Obviously, his APM is low, but his strategy is really strong. So, we'll see how it plays out. Thank you, SAHD guy, for the almost two years now. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, Tea Time, for 30. Good morning, Alpha Crit. T90, did you play against Barnes and Stark? Barnes and Stark. Why does that sound like a, a thrift store? Head over to Barnes and Stark and get some 
get some get some stuff. Um, yeah, I played against both these guys. Um, Stark, I have had more success against, but I will be honest with you, and I hope this actually adds to the fascination with the player. He is quite possibly the most depressing player to lose to because if you watch his stream, you realize how slow he is. And uh, sorry to keep bringing it up here, Stark, but uh, you get it, dude. You're just not as quick as some of these people these days. And uh, he gets the job done anyways because he's so freaking fluid in his decisions. So what is what is this? What 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 is this from Stark? This is not something we've seen at all on slopes yet, as he wants to be incredibly safe, and he does not want to give the Magyars any possibility to get through. So he says, forget the full walls. I'm going to start this off with small walls. And here comes Barls, and Barls is going to be like, huh? The Barls may actually choose... There's a chance there he could have run in there to try and steal the geese or something, but he didn't want to lose the scout HP. All right, so behind this, stable, no surprise. Here's Stark scouting the base of Barls. And can Stark get the job done today? He just passes the TC here. He's going to look to confirm what his opponent is doing. Neither player taking any risks here to take the resources on the sides. Can Stark get the job done? Get four wins against Barls, who is the favorite. If he beat Dogal 3-2, I can believe in him here. And this is just a really safe and smart approach. Basically, it's like, yeah, you are investing into this, but it it makes it ensures that at the start, the Magyar player can't do anything to you, and then he slowly branches out with other walls. And Barls is looking for damage, and it's like, wh where are you supposed to go to do damage right now with the way Stark has built up this base? Very tricky. Yeah, no arena in the qualifiers. Why? Mm, because I because John Slow has banned Arabia one too many times and whined to me about it. That was the core reason why I didn't add arena into the qualifiers. Um, no, that's not true. Um, the reason I don't have arena, he's in the chat. He says you hate fun. <laughs> no, 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 that's not. Well, I mean the fact that he's very, very whiny is true. Um, no, the reasoning was. I felt like some of the other maps already have closed elements. And like Quarry, for example, has closed elements. Gold Rush has closed elements. So I thought it would be too closed of a map pool if we included that. Um, also, if you know me and Hidden Cup, I like to have unique maps that aren't seen in other events. So that arena is, is seen in a lot of other events. It's very well known. And so for that reason, we I did not include it. So those are kind of the basics of it. Um, I will have six maps added to the map pool for the main event. And there will be a map which is is brand new, has never been seen before, and fits that category of closed. So that, that'll be something to look forward to. But here comes Stark. He's going to move forward now. He's really taken his time, hasn't he? Moving forward here with archers and spears. Now, he's going to go for the Blacksmith just yet, so he doesn't have Fletching yet. No kills here. Barrels has had some idle T... Or, sorry, Stark has had some idle TC time, which he would have wanted to avoid. And he actually came over here to take these resources. So, a little risk here from Stark, but... You know, uh, from Barrels. Man, I can't get their names right. But he probably felt like he could justify this, because Stark was never moving out. Skirmishers are here now. Still no fletching for Stark. He really needs that. And Stark is looking to be sneaky. And Barls is looking for him right now. And is like, where is he? I cannot find him. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I think Barls thinks he went home. Because Stark saw Skirm. And a lot of players would go home against the Skirms. But he's just sneaking around. Sneaking around. Shh. Don't say anything. <laughs> Don't say anything. <laughs> Look how sneaky. Back at home, he has archers still. He's adding farms now. And Barls is like, okay. All right, he went home then. I saw archers at home. And hopefully there's no hotkey issues here as we have a pause. But yeah, at the moment, Barls is just kind of staring at the front looking for that big group of archers. He doesn't see them. And Stark with a real opportunity here. 
and and it just it's very bold here but that's the type of risk you want to take here i think if you're stark um i think if you think you're the much better player you might just go home and conserve your archer mass but that's the type of thing that stark is happy to do stark says damn sorry cat fight arl says yes stark says sorry 14 so i i don't know what that means uh, he might have he might have had his cats running across his keyboard, and now he runs directly into the base of Barrels, and Barrels has got to be like, "Are you kidding me here?" The villager has gone down already. Both woodlines have to be abandoned, and Stark is, is just in dreamland for a player who's opened archers and his opponent has gone skirms. I mean, dreamland would be killing a few more villagers. Barrels has done a really nice job. But still, look at all the idle time. Look at all these villagers having to move off their resources. Fantastic finds there for Stark. Now, only killed one villager in the end. Does want that archer mass to be there for the long run. And Barl should be able to kill this now. But really impressive stuff. And here comes Stark again, actually. So he took a fight here, and Barl says to be careful. Defense here from Barl's. There is a weak villager there. Stark might not realize that. And yeah, Barls should clear this. And now Barls has to just run away from this. But guys, Stark has been able to find control in this game. And I'm looking at the eco for, for Barls, and the efficiency has gone way down. I rarely reference this, but look at the WELM bottom left. Worker efficiency last minute, 49% for Barls. And that's just because of his eco moving so much. I'm surprised it's even 49% in all honesty. And so at the end of the day, some archers were lost just to kill one villager, but Stark will be able to beat his opponent to the next stage. Needs a little bit more gold income, and he'll be clicking up. And here now he needs to micro his archers, and this is really good for Barls. This is what Barls would have wanted. After all that harassment from Stark, he clears this up, and now the army count is not really going to be there for Stark in the next stage. If Stark could have just gone home, maybe he'd have more to work with in Castle Age. Dang, so that was a really nice find from Barls. Barls can sort it out, shake it off a little bit, and ultimately click up to the next stage here. So it does feel very natural now for Stark to just go into Knights and Camels. The opponent has Skirmishers, so a lot more Archers doesn't really make a lot of sense. Actually, with it being Magyar Scouts, I think it's very likely this stable could go down soon. So Stark has to do everything he can to, to try and keep this stable up. Because you need that you can only produce out of this in Castle Age, and then it still takes however many seconds to produce the knight. Or camel, of course. And 400 HP has already been taken off. Also, Barls is just attacking farms with the skirms, because you cannot farm if your farm is being attacked. And did you see that? Did you see that? Okay, I thought Stark was gonna sneak. Stark was sending new archers into the TC, which, again, is not something pro players usually do. This is just like... St Stark has a lot of old-fashioned tricks that he sticks to. Yep, right into the TC. And, uh, I mean, those archers hopping out was just to give him a little bit more time for the stable to produce something. And I think Knight makes the most sense here. You gotta have something more than just Camel here if there's gonna be some spears there. So I think two knights into camels would make sense. Knights can push away these skirms, maybe. Stark hasn't really expanded much this game, and Barl's is double-checking that right now. And we'll see if this if these two knights are going to be enough here for Stark. No bloodlines. Does have armor. Barl's about to be up. The spears will get these, some extra attack here as well for Barl's. But then there's still archers around. And the skirms are going to dive for those archers now. Nice move. All the ranged units will be going for certain targets. And well played from Stark, actually. Stark gets really close to the skirms. Because the skirms have minimum range. He focus fires down the spearmen. And now it's 15 to 15 on the KD. And Stark's got a couple knights. And now the spearmen and the skirms both aren't a worry anymore. Barls loves his cab archers, though. Just loves his cab archers. I remember in Titans League playing on... He played on a map called Spiral. And he would go scouts with Magyars into cab archers. One of the first players that really started to show me the strength of that on that map. 
Second town center for Varls. Maybe a little bit more desire to try and catch up economically after losing the Ville, but it does feel like the natural play would also be natural to expand to the sides. And so Stark is looking for that. But Varls is safe. Varls will rewall behind. He is also checking to see if Stark is going to expand to the sides, which is just so cool, man. I It just... Oh, it makes me so happy. It makes me so happy to see it. It's such a simple thing. I don't know how I get so bent out of shape about it, but... I do. Archers are still at home. I probably would just move the archers forward at this point to get some value, but... Stark figures I might go into arbs at some point. Might as well keep these at home. I probably won't do too much on the front anyways. And Stark kind of controlling the game in some ways. Just because Barls is reacting to his movements here. And he does push away just some scouts here. And now he wants a TC on the front. And that is on the gold. Now, he researched the gold mining, gold shaft mining upgrade. So he's really hoping to get lots of gold income here and utilize the market with the Saracens. Just nonstop, he's been using the market. That TC is really important. And this is starting to get tricky now because Barls has quite a few cav archers. So you really are going to need to have plus two armor on these camels. Oh, God, the camels are feasting. They didn't get a kill, but they did weaken a lot of these cab archers. It's worth reminding everyone, Saracen camels have 145 HP in the castlades. The devs recently removed zealotry. Ripped to zealotry. I actually really like that tech. And they just gave the camels for the Saracens that HP in the castle age. Which was was surprising to me. I, I think that that is a person. I think that's too strong for a Castle Age camel, but is very very good for Stark in this instance. My opinions aside, and it's interesting, Stark saved the archers. He's now going to get Bodkin. He's going to try Camel Crossbow. Look at this. Three ranges now. Two TCs right here for Barl. So a lot of people want to see the APM. I'm curious if it even shows. Yeah, see, I mean, the APA thing is maybe overblown. Also, do we trust these stats when we look at it, guys? Do we think this is everything? Because I don't. I uh, I, I uh, know that... I mean, I casted Loey the Legends game a couple months ago. I still remember where someone peaked at 400 APM, and the guy never went over 40 villagers. So I'm not really sure how that, that is, is tracked, but in some ways, it can be a little deceiving. Why wouldn't you go camel skirm? Uh, you need a lot of food for that. And camel crossbow kills. Like, and when I say kills, like kills villagers, kills buildings. The archer line for the Saracens also destroyed buildings faster. So this is going to be a terrifying army to fight up against here if you're Barls. I think what Barls would need is to have something like cav archer and maybe even some siege. But I think this, this combo can get really strong for Stark, and it's not something that Barls is expecting here. He hasn't really seen anything that tells him this is going to be happening. That was the classic Stark wanting to know where Barls had the cab archers, so he attacked the stable, and then Barls had to show him. And now Barls will find out about crossbow. It's very rare. Typically, it's going to be eco and one unit type, and then later, after the eco, you switch into another unit type. To go into crossbow now is really rare. Barls had a scout here. He just lost it. So Barls spotted that Stark was going to go build a TC there. And is this mix good enough? Remember, the camels aren't fully armored yet. You do have that HP. But I, I'm looking really good for Barls right now. Look at the micro sitting on the hill. He's whittling down the crossbows. He does have to leave. But that's the beauty of having cav archers. You can't back away. Now Stark is going to head over here. I expect a TC to go up there. Yeah, it feels like the Cav Archer Mass is in a pretty good spot here. TC did come up over here for Barls. He's been banking up some stone for some time. I think where players build a castle is always a fun thing to talk about on this map. And Middle Castle is becoming less and less of a thing that's overrated. <laughs> Sorry, I was initially I was going to say it's something that's underrated. But I think... As I was saying the words, I was just remembering a lot of people are casting the middle. I think some players, though, will still give up the middle and expand to the sides. But there's so much stone and gold here. And this, these fights for Barls are incredible. 
So far, Crossbow has not done it. And now he's thinking maybe I need Elite Skirm. But this economy for Barls is flying now. Res collected is higher. Still taking incredible engagements. Wouldn't mind seeing the Thumb Ring upgrade from him. Feels like a very natural spot for a Siege Workshop too. Because the Camel number is not big enough to be able to take engagements. Maybe it just becomes a forward castle here. Here come the villagers for Barls. This hill feels like it was meant for a castle. This is a aggressive yet safe castle. But if you really want to end the game, you can go for a castle further forward. And a castle here would take Stark completely off of that gold. And then Stark might not have options. He already worked his way through the other gold. And yeah, there's the castle. Barls maybe realizing safe castle is the way to do it. Honestly, though, he continues to take good fights, so I could have understood if he wanted to build it further forward. This castle is still going to make life really awkward for Stark and really good for Barls. And he will protect some stone and golds here, which could lead to more castles, of course. This could just be a stepping stone. Some players would force it down there, but with the lead skirm out and crossbow and now ballistics coming in, you never know. But the Cav Archer mobility has just done so many good things for Barls. Like, Barls is choosing when to take the fights. This is why we've seen Cav Archers. This is why we've seen Cav very frequently on this map. And now Stark's going to move forward and see a castle. And he's probably like, oof. Actually, you know, <laughs> you know who else is like, oof? Barls. He's got knights and camels in his eco. That's super annoying. But now, nah, Cav Archers should be able to go home and deal with that. And I don't know if Stark is really paying attention to this at the moment. He just kind of tossed his units in there. And Barls should be able to go up to Imperial Age soon as well if he wishes to. Look at the vision from Barls still. Active on the right side. That does lose a villager there. Stark has killed three villagers. Barls has killed zero. He's going to castle the left side. Ooh, this could be dicey. Stark sees this. Stark also needs to react to this. It's kind of a small thing to react to. He does react to it. Army's coming. There's ballistics. There's skirmishers. This could be really, really awkward for Barls, but it feels like he's got enough army. Basically, Stark would have to choose. Do I fight the army or do I fight the Vils? You can't do both. And he will always choose army here. And it's fine. Like this, for Stark, this isn't actually the end of the world. You killed some Cav Archers. You didn't lose anything. That castle does not make your life any worse. But the siege does. <laughs> the siege makes it way worse. And I did not see that happening. Man, and, and this this is just such good play from Barl. Super smooth the whole way through. Stark did a great job to find some early damage. And make life difficult for Barl's. But then once it got to Castle Age, it just feels like Barl's is flying. Still though, Stark... Will be able to click up to the Imperial Age. He, he does click up to the Imperial Age. He will have a castle. And his hope now is to be able to treb down this castle from Barls and push the middle. Barls, though, takes down a TC. So now Stark only has one TC producing Vils with the other one advancing to Imp. And I wouldn't even mind to see like a third and a fourth TC right now from Barls. Just like a crazy economic play. Feels very, very likely on this map longer we we go into like hidden cup obviously this is you win here you go into the main event but i think you look at these resources you look at how much space there is it makes a lot of sense to me to drop a town center here maybe even another town center somewhat at home and boom big shot from barrels and stark reacted but he reacted right after he got hit Meanwhile, Barls is going... Oh, God. Now, meanwhile, Barls is going for herbal medicine. He's going to heal up his Cav Archers in his castle. And oh, geez. Stark just getting wrecked there. And, you know, maybe in some ways... You now I do think it's it's something that maybe I've brought up too many times. But I, I do think in some ways, it, if you have a greater ability to multitask, it pays off in those instances, right? Controlling the eco, controlling the army, doing all of that simultaneously is really difficult. But that was the moment there where Barls was in more places than Stark. And he's in Imp, which makes it look very difficult for Stark now. The knights here will clear up the skirms. The first treb is on the way for this castle. It will be primarily skirms for Stark. 
Doesn't have too many camels now. And that's why the stables were added by Barls, and Barls is wasting no time here. He's like, I think he recognizes that there's no way that his treps can be killed because it's underneath his castle. So instead of staying here and waiting, he's just going to push this area where he knows Stark has a lot of eco right now. Cav, Arch Cav Archer upgrades are coming in. Barls will drop a very aggressive castle there. Interesting positioning. And most of these villagers can be protected because of them being on the wood line. Barls could always try and break through this way. Still do need to see. Stark might try and do something desperate here against these trebs. Barls is only going for the siege workshop right now. Again, knights are finding skirms. Like, these knights don't even have many upgrades, guys. These are just... I mean, they have the attack upgrades because of Magyar's getting them instantly. But just one armor upgrade. Usually, skirms can still kind of deal with that. But Stark is getting picked apart. And right now, he's going to go into a trebor. Now, there is a difference in the situation with the trebs because the Saracens can make Bombard Cannons and the Magyars cannot. But then the Magyars have Cav and they also have Magyar Hussar, which have a bonus against Siege. So they both have different tools to take care of those trebs right now. I don't actually know if Barros is really planning on Knights for that long. I think he's happy with what the Knights did for him. And this two villager castle he wants to protect. He will absolutely protect it. He's got heavy Cav Archer in. Thumb Ring coming in. This is before Recurve Bow comes in. And Barls will control this right-hand side. So good luck, Stark, ever, you know, calmly collecting resources over here. Stark is still alive. His population is decent. His army count is actually higher. He's got a lot of skirms, which counter Cav Archers. And while the momentum is there for Barls, if Barls loses this castle... He could have some real problems. And I'm still not seeing enough cav to counter the skirms, which makes me think there is actually a chance here for Stark. Here, he's still alive. He'll kill that siege. This castle isn't pressuring him at all. The skirms are going to loop on back here. And, and it's crazy how Stark is just so consistent and how he isn't killed. Stark has a population lead. And he could maybe start to take some really good engagements here. Barls is going to use this castle now to start to trep down this TC. This could be brutal for Stark. Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if Stark just builds another TC behind it just to buy himself some time. Barls is trying to buy himself some time as he's getting the Hussar upgrade and starting to mass. So, yeah, some upgrades on the way, which he didn't have before. The Stark Skirms are now headed this way. God, Skirms feel so slow right now. <laughs> oh no, oh no! This is so good from Barls! I love it. He knows there's pressure coming too because he can see it with the outpost. So he knows he's got he's to do a bit, little bit of a drive-by here, kill as many villagers as possible, and then just get out of here and back to his castle. Beautiful play. Kills quite a few villagers there. Has a massive villager lead now. And wait for it. Wait for it. Cav Archer's out of the castle. Snipe the Bombard Cannon. That's intentional. Back into the castle they'll go. And now the army for Stark is kind of out of position. And the Hussars could swoop in to take the Trebs. Barls could keep this castle up. He can actually hold this position. And Stark is still trying to deal with all of this. As the Hussars loop into the front. That is... Beautiful play from Barls. And while it looked like Stark maybe had a chance, I think it was all just a matter of time until Barls was able to get this composition. Heavy Cav Archer, Hussar. On paper, Saracens have like the, the camels here um, with the skirms, and that army composition can also be good. But the Vil count's not there. The Eco's not there. Barls is 50 on food right now, and the GG is called. You see Stark was paying attention to that, but just going to lose the middle. Had Hussars in the back of his base. Barls was even making a stable here. And Barls, who is the favorite in this series, takes the first game. But, you know, there, there's something about how long it took Barls to finish off Stark when Barls is such a killer that that makes me think we're, we're in for an interesting series here. Stark was down 2-1 against Ogao, came back to win 3-2. He just stays in these games. He's got some sneaky aspects to his play. The sneaky archers that could have maybe done more. Maybe if it killed more than one villager. I thought it was going to kill like five or six. 
Maybe in instances like that, things could change. Barls takes the first win, though. Really, really good play from Barls. Not much more I can say. Um, the, the, the fights were great for him in Castle. I think that the camel crossbow move from Stark... I mean, I can see why he... It had potential because I was explaining how good it can be. <laughs> um, I do think in Castle Age, Camel Crossbow can be insane. But he wasn't able to max out on both things because it's two different unit types and it's really expensive. Eventually just fell behind economically. And, well, the economy took Barrels to Imp. And I really like the castle position from Barrels too. That was really smart. Again, a lot of players on this map, they're going to castle here when they have a lead to protect that eco. But the stone and gold through the middle is is arguably more important than that. So, good stuff. Hopefully it's a long series. Dang. Um, Joey, what's up, man? Uh, Joey, I see your message. Joey says, side question for the chat. I signed up for the subscription to support T90, but I'm new to Twitch. Does T90 get that money? Some of it. Does it all go to Twitch? How does it work? It's a 70-30 split. So 70-30 sub split on YouTube and on Twitch. Um, and, and, you know, if you are perusing around Twitch and watching other creators and, and subbing to other creators, that's not the same for everybody. But recently, I earned the 70-30 split because of the, I say I, we, you guys earned because uh, of the amount of people that sub. So, really happy that I'm on the 70-30 split because I kind of feel, I kind of feel greasy about, like, a platform getting half the money, right? I didn't really like that. I think it's a bit of a, a bit much of a cut, so, um... Yeah, very happy that Twitch has that that offer. And like I said, it's the same on YouTube. Thank you for the sub, by the way. Thanks for being here. They're already in the next game. And this is going to be fast. So we got to keep it moving, apparently. Uh, put Barrels back in the blue. And here we are. So game two. And the way we described Stark was a little bit slower and a little bit more strategic, right? So this map. Someone had asked in the previous game, like, T90, why no arena, right? This map is a closed map, right? But there's a lot of things that can happen before you close it up. Obviously, the wall potential is very th much there. Um, Stark could do that right now. But Bengali's Malay. So Malay were winning here nonstop in the first couple rounds of the qualifiers. And Malay's win rate still might be one of the best win rates in the qualifiers. Someone could maybe check. Um, yeah, someone could maybe check that. Uh, we have... Shoot, what's the... AoeStats.io has a tab for Hidden Cup. And then we also have HiddenCup.com that has stats. Hopefully we don't crash those sites again. But, yeah, the Malay were really good, is my point. And it's all because of their timings. But the Bengalis have been shown to be quite strong by one player in particular, which is Mihai. Mihai will be playing again tomorrow, trying to qualify. And... We saw Bengali's Malay, and the Bengali's just completely smashed Malay in late game because of those elephant archers. But that is late game, which means you do need to protect yourself, and you do need to get there safely, which Barrels, I'm sure, is going to be out here trying to avoid. So we will see. Thank you again, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Schlopsy, uh, Sunski, Hendy, Gorilla, Bubba Gump, you're welcome, Justa, uh, Arrives. Thank you, Macintosh, for the year. Uh, yeah, obviously, with this whole sub thing, primes also go directly towards the crater, too. It's a little different, though, because depending on where you're from, the primes are worth different amounts, but who cares? It's free. You don't get ads. You get the emotes. It supports your, the content, so. And galleys actually have the highest win rate. Yeah, I guess that's true because of this new trend, but how many games have been played? I think Bengalis have only been played twice, and it was both by Mihai. Yeah. Malay, 62% win rate on Quarry with eight games. Okay. And in general, Malay have done really well on other maps, too. So, guys, I actually remember... This is so funny. I have a memory from three years ago that just entered my brain. It was Stark against Capoch Invisible Cup. Look it up. It was on Quarry, okay? And Stark snuck a vill. It's coming back. It was deep down in the basement of my brain. And um, it was actually the same series. Do you guys ever remember the the uh, sneak from Stark on Bay where he snuck a villain to the back of Catwatch's base? It's one of the best casts I've ever put on my channel. Is a deep dive. 
with the sneak vill. Anyways, um, did, Stark's gonna try this. And this is the second time we've seen this. MBL did this in um, his series against Ganji yesterday. But it's a really smart play. Because from what Barl sees right now, Barl sees the barracks, Barl thinks, I'm making militia, he's making militia, that's it. But this vill is gonna chill back here. And she could be the key to something special here for Stark. Because like we said, the, the Bengalis want to play defensive. They want to take it to late game. That is all that Barls is likely going to assume. Now, this makes killing the scout all the more valuable right now. If you're Stark. If you can get a kill on that, that'd be wonderful. He gets a kill on the militia. His scout is weaker, though. He is ensuring that no damage is going to be done. Now, we have a vill from Barls. This could be interesting. And I think Barls realized himself... I'm going to be spotted so he doesn't continue to run through. Meanwhile, in the back of Barl's eco, we've got a villager building an aggressive house. All right. So Barl's will think, the good news for me is he invested into these militia. These militia are stuck. These militia can't go anywhere. These militia are going to run into walls at my base. But, dude, uh, guys, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. This is amazing. And it's so good. Like, guys, I even need to go back to show it. I, I gotta wait. I feel like I should wait till this militia dies. But Stark saw Barl's pushing in the deer and, and snuck around there. Like, he knew that the scout was there and he dodged it. It's going to be interesting because Barl's has his scout in here now. He can never get back home. Look at his base. Now, if he sees villagers on gold and he sees a build order that is normally designed around archers, there might be some outposting from Barl's. This really comes down to does Barl's see and sense the right things here? But yeah, you need to do something with his villager. You might as well build houses. But she is definitely going to build an archer range. This militia still actually in this situation guys don't chase with three that this is actually really bad you only need one to win the fight to pull these two into the middle and maybe attack something um but also sometimes the units will block each other which you don't want so uh when, when they turn they'll like this little weak guy he's kind of annoyed that he's so weak and the others are so strong they're gonna block each other you see the blocking it's stupid man they've got too much ego but it actually wasn't too bad. I think I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. And, um... Hey, there he goes blocking again. I mean, whatever. We, sh we really shouldn't be looking at this. We have more walls! Okay, so from what Barls can see, every indication here is Stark wants to play late game. Stark wants to play safe. Stark wants to play... with Eco. Now, these villagers are on gold... And Barls will have seen that. I just wonder at what point you see double walls. He likely will not see an archer range here. Will Barls recognize that gold double walls here means no army at home and army forward? <laughs> this makes me so happy. Yes, Stark. We love it, bro. We love this. Let's go. Oh, it, it really, it just made my day already. Just made my day. Don't call me a goblin. <laughs> Don't call me a gnome. This is sick. This is sick. This is, I love this stuff, man. I think like, obviously we have some incredible talents and the competitive scene is incredible. But like some of this stuff gets lost at times. The sneaks, the scouting, the vision. And Stark's like, his old style um, is really showing here, I feel. I, I just wonder, at what point does Barl sense it? He clearly doesn't. Like, I don't think that he senses this at all. He thinks this is just eco from Stark. Actually, what you would look for here is, if you don't see, like, 8 to 10 farms here, that's when you should sense archer ranges. But nope, he's just gonna stop making army. He sees stone walls from Stark. He sees a tower from Stark. And meanwhile, Stark is massing archers here. And Barl's is going to try and go Castle Age. 
to rush everything down. And guys, what do you do when you want to rush Castle Age and go all in? Oh, he's actually getting town watched. That's interesting. That might be... That might tell us he has a suspicion. Yeah, if you want to go up to Castle Age quickly, you sell your stone. And then you don't have the stone for a tower. Wait, is he going to outpost? Where is he? Oh, okay. He's suspicious. I think he might have seen there weren't many farms here. So he's outposting here out of suspicion. And oh, Town Watch actually pays off. Town Watch actually pays off big. Look at that. He, if he didn't get Town Watch, he would have never seen that. And Stark's like, surprise, buddy. I'm not booming. I'm in your base. And Vil goes down. Next Vil will go down. Meanwhile, Stark is living the dream behind this with crazy eco. And he's untouched. Except for some random militia. Barls actually loses his scout. And Stark has taken Barls off of every single important resource except a few farms. Look at this evacuation now from Barls. That's game changing. And that's just a sick strategy. And it started from the beginning. And it just this is why Stark is here. This is why he's got a chance today. He's going to make a stable now. And we'll have more archers. He's just going to stay in feudal. Because he knows now his opponent will go skirms. Look at this! <laughs> Look where Barls is chopping wood. Barls is in the middle of the map chopping wood right now. Holy crap, man. That villager's changed everything. And I may maybe this becomes more meta, honestly. Because both times I've seen the sneak vill, it has worked out well. Uh, don't want to speak too soon here, of course. But Barls... You must feel very helpless at the moment. And the thing is, you're just thinking, well, if I get skirms with armor, I'm okay. In a normal game, like an Arabia game, you're going to be up against scouts next. But this is not something Barros is expecting. And, well, there's the scout. And now he's going to know. And now he's probably like, shoot. I can't make archers because I'm off of gold. And I need spearmen now. And, I mean, he's just completely surrounded. This is This is awful. Now, we'll see how Barls can micro this. If he's able to micro this well enough, he can still kill all the archers. We'll see how Stark can micro this. Stark kills villager number four. But this strategy has worked perfectly for Stark. And it all started back when he passed the scout from Barls pushing deer. I'm going to go back and show you that. We did have it on screen, but I don't think you fully appreciate it yet, guys. And you will, you will appreciate it, trust me. This is sick. And and at this point, you might not win the game in Feudal. But I think you've done enough to take a very big lead to the later stages. Boros just has to think, I'm Malay and I have a lot that can help me recover from bad situations with the faster uptimes. So you know, he, he has to hope that Stark takes some poor engagements and that he can clear this. And maybe then he can recover. I mean, he's got gold in the middle. So there is that, right? That's something he didn't think of till now. There's hunt in the middle. There's wood here. And he also does have the spears. Now, again, Stark. The micro's not normally as good as maybe some of the other players out there. So there is a chance that maybe you could take a better fight. That's not a bad fight for Barls. Stark just going to simplify his game here. Focus on one group of each unit type. Resources collected, obviously, higher for Stark. Stark still has this villager here. She's the key to it all. And more range units coming forward now from Stark. Score says this game is quite close. Stark, as he's microing, has had quite a bit of TC idle time. It's a very good point. Look at that farm eco, though. That is so good. 20 farms. He'll drop the market. Will probably be able to click up, but, but, but his scouts go down. Again, it's the unit control. So for Stark in this series, it is the, the amount of units, it is the timing of the units, it is the overall strategy. For Barrels, obviously those things matter a lot as well, but he is the player who's going to be known for having the better unit control and the multitasking. And so, you know, the unfortunate thing for Stark is occasionally you see instances where it's it's like very much clear that there's a bit of a difference when it comes to the unit control. Lost all of his scouts. 
Lost quite a few archers, but he is on the way to Castle Age. His villager's still going to be alive. She's actually standing right there. That's not what I would do with my forward villager. There goes Barls on the way up as well. In the middle, Militia have come. Militia have killed a villager. Make that villager number five. We thought these Militia were going to be useless now. As Stark will now know that in the middle of the map is Barls, and he's very exposed there. Now, if only you could make knights. If you could make knights, this would be sick. You just stream knights right into the middle. He might make an elephant. He might actually send an elephant to the middle because the Bengalis cannot make knights. Maybe he's just going to make scouts. I think light cap upgrade could make sense. It's crazy what the Malay can do with the faster uptimes. They spent so little time researching the next age. We might actually see elephants from both players. We have Barls making a stable now. Also, Barls made two markets. <laughs> <laughs> in the same spot <laughs> uh that is most likely because of how stressful this has been it's kind of funny that he made it in the same spot though here comes the cheap elephants hey man meant to pick magyard legend of the liar style for those that know that and oh god that was painful stark needs to upgrade these archers where is she at okay so she is over there a nice job from Barls to stay alive in this game. Seriously. Really nice job from him. And it's it's 50-50 one. Stark needs this one. If he has any chance to win this series, he needs this one. This strategy has done so well for him. He is going to get the light cap upgrade. He's making double light cap production from home. So he's got three total stables. And he's going to try and raid the middle. Now, there's vills everywhere, right? The TC's there, but still, the wood line's there. Like, there is no wood income whatsoever. Um when it comes to the main base of Barls right now. Nice micro from Barls. Stark trying to take out the Skirms. He will make a Monastery. Stark will definitely make Monk there to convert these Elephants, but the cheap Elephants have done the job so far. Light Cav's down, still moving around here from Stark with these crossbows. And Barls is maybe beginning to think, I've done it. I've defended from this. I'm safe now. And now there's Light Cav coming towards the middle. Now, can Stark control the light cav while also controlling the crossbows? Seems like the spears are finding hits. Barls is defending from this. Beautiful job from Barls. A lot of multitasking is required here. This light cav are very, very weak at the moment. But there will always be more pressure coming. And the crossbows, the, the mass is still growing. And there's a monk now to convert uh, an elephant. Those elephants need to be deleted. He doesn't delete it. So now Stark has an elephant. And that elephant can can be so helpful in so many different ways. And now the light cap are back to the middle as well. What a stressful game, man. This is insane. I don't actually know who it's more difficult for right now. In terms of, like, controlling the units. I think it's it should actually be more difficult for Stark. Because, like, the areas of the map he's looking at are so wildly different. At least for Barls, it's somewhat the same. This is a lot of pressure. Now, this, this TC is really good here for Barls. Protects the wood, also protects the stone. But what a funny game. That monk there wants to convert the elephant back home. And will uh, not get the conversion. The scorpion could go down. Like ever kind of weak. Doesn't go down. Nice hold here from Barls. There's a monk, though. Stark goes for the Repairville. There's another Monk. Barls back away, back away, back away, back away. He backs away. Crazy game. Stark. He can boom like the best of them, but he needs to settle. He needs to decide on what he wants to do. And he's going to go for Elephant Archers? Well, Elephant Archers are the key to the Megali late game. He's not expecting Megali Castle Age. Not sure I love that move. I, I I mean, the more I think about it, if Barls can get a castle here, that could be pretty sick. But how can you do that? You need to defend. Okay, guys, if you would build a castle as Barls, where would you build it? Would you build it forward or would you build it over here to protect your own base? There's big reasons for both. Really tricky to decide on which one to go for here. Okay, so chat split 50-50 right now. I think... 
I would go for the defensive one, like right here, because it cuts off the units flowing into your base and makes it easier to defend. But then, if you don't do this, then you're letting Stark chill, and Barls does not want to let Stark chill. That is a beautiful castle. And it's hard to disagree with it, right? Only way that's a problem. Stark, by the way, doesn't have stone walls this whole way. The only way this castle becomes a problem is if he now gets pushed at home and dies. And that's why he's dropped the tower. That is an amazing castle. If Stark has random Karambit warriors running into his eco, he is not going to have enough to be able to attack at the same time. Like, he's trying to get conversions here all the time. Even going for villagers. Now Karambits are in. Oh, man. Best of luck to you, Stark. House walls from Stark. Ugh! Quick walls. No, not happening. Need some light cav. Karambits are weak. But you can make a lot of them in a castle there from Stark. Okay. How is Barls defended from this? Barls is a 25 villager lead. Is so impressive. He's lost more villagers, but he's going to kill a couple here. And the castle he has will kill some too. But Stark's castle will go up. Now we have elephants from Barls. They're going to join the party. Oh man, what a mess. And meanwhile, still Barls able to defend with some decent siege shots. Crazy survival from Barls here. He could have. It could have been so much worse. I think that he, I'm, I'm already thinking back and like the town watch choice, so he could see a potential sneak. He definitely felt like there was a chance. That was so clutch from Barls. It prevented him from losing more villagers to those sneak archers. In both games, we have seen sneak archers from Stark in some way, shape, or form. We are going to see armored elephants now. Ooh. So armored elephants from Stark to take down this castle. Stark still has control of this whole area. He also has redemption now, so he can... Don't convert a market! He has two of them! Okay, well, he converted the blacksmith, and Barls only has one of those. Uh, Karambits are going down. TC's going up. Armored elephants will be a surprise. I don't think Barls sees... That. No, he does see that, which might be why he has Karambits. And <laughs> in a crazy messy game, we have a very defensive castle from Barls who's very paranoid here. And this castle does somewhat protect the gold, but not fully protect it. He's going to expand that eco now. Hmm. Okay. Did the villager die, by the way? I think she died at some point. Salutes to her for her contribution to this game. So, Barls has a massive eco lead, right? Um, but what he doesn't have is as much structure to how this plays out from here. Oh, God. Elephants are going to switch sides here. Maybe. Maybe. Like have are going to try and change that. The elephants are escaping. Like have killed some monks. Elephants are still on the move. Actually, not a bad fight at all for Stark. Look how many monks he killed. Look how many Karambits died. It could have been worse, is my point. I think we'll still lose the fight. And now the armored elephants are coming. And the elephants that Stark converted. And what is this game? Oh, there's no more Karambit warriors. Here comes Stark. Stark still has buildings in the enemy base. If he, guys, if he takes this castle out, he could build another one of his own and take the entirety of the middle. And I, I think right now it is looking a little awkward right now for Barls to defend this. Now he's got these, a mangonel to hit the, the elephants. But the, uh, oh boy. Well, the Ratha, they have a melee mode, which Stark isn't using. And they should be able to act like a knight and take that out. Yes. Wow. Desperation time for Barls, actually. And Stark is, is on three TCs at home. Four TCs at home. And Barls is about to lose this castle. Ratha, need to switch again. This is huge. You need to switch here. You need to go in there, Stark. It might not end up mattering, actually. I think the castle goes down anyways. It is going to go down. What a game. What a beautiful beautiful, messy, crazy, strategic, mind-blowing game. I don't know how much strategy matters at this point, but now Barls doesn't have a castle, and he has to drop one behind this. Oh, man. Now, the elephants, I actually think 
that having armored elephants is a weakness because it costs food and gold for this. Whereas going for rams is just wood and gold, which which means you can save the food for techs and, and like Imperial Age. Um, Stark isn't giving up on this, by the way. He's still out here. He's still being a pest. And he will still hold some level of presence here. In fact, I could see Stark converting a villager at some point and building up more things. Yeah, he's gonna uh, maybe lose these elephants because he's distracted. And there goes Barls now on the way to Imp. Impressive stuff from him. And so he will hope to treb this down. And yeah, Monk's still running around. We'll see. That Monk dies. Okay. Market is the only thing that Stark has left there. We now have Monk's as the plan for Barls, I assume, because he's dropping monasteries. But my goodness. The Ville lives. She's behind a house. Wait, what? Oh, <gasps> she's still alive. <laughs> How? <laughs> No, don't kill her. 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 And if Stark might realize that in a second. Oh, Siege gets converted. So now she has a friend. Monks are converting Siege here. The Rams continue in. <laughs> this is so funny. Guys, Barls is no army. In case you haven't realized, he's going to be imp with no army. And these Ratha might be able to make it into his base. Monks from Barls will hope to convert some Ratha. Elephants are just hammering away on the gate. No! She's dead! Oh! She was innocent. Devotion now for Stark, as he will know his opponent will probably go for traps. What does he do? He makes more elephant archers here. <laughs> Yo, he's sitting on the gold. He actually killed some bills there. This is wonderfully chaotic. This is hilarious. And he's going to be through. What a game. Also, he's building a backup castle, probably expecting that he's going to lose the forward one. Look at his economy, guys. We don't see this. Look at how expansive that economy is. And he now has stuff on both sides of the eco of Barls. Now look how many Karambits he's converted here. Stark refuses to quit. What a game. And still, I mean, we're waiting for Barls to make trebs, but he can't advance out too far because he's distracted and there's a lot of things happening. Oh god, the monks, 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 the the elephants on the monks? How does that even go? Well, they're, apparently they're horrible against monks. How is that old man surviving so many hits from a freaking elephant? That doesn't make any sense, game. But okay, apparently they can just flop their book open. A couple times and just repel the attacks i mean still these monks aren't really dying they're, they're gonna eventually die though and guys there's still constant action here stark is always paying attention and he's on his way to the imperial age stark will get two villagers from each town center when he makes it to the imperial age which will skyrocket him to a, a ridiculous vill count he will have a castle Granted, he's going to lose one, most likely. But he will still have a castle. What he could actually do, if he wanted to still build up stuff over here, is he could make a uh, a lumber camp here. I don't know why you know players don't do that more. You can just chop right through. I think players just get tunnel visioned and forget about that. But yeah, there goes a random armored elephant in. And, and I mean, what a game. But what a great job from Barls to stay alive against all this chaos. I mean, great job from Stark to create the chaos. But on the other side of things here, how is Barl still alive when it feels like he's just been reacting to every single play? He's going to have like 20 monks soon. So light cap becomes more important again for Stark. And Stark will do that. He will also drop archery ranges now. I, I assume for skirmishers. And a very forward castle now from Barl's to as he's finally cleared up most of the raids to try and force the issue here. And Stark knows he'll lose the TC, so he just builds a mill here, so his farms will have somewhere to drop off the food, which is hilarious. And he knows he probably can't deny this castle, but he could kill a couple monks, and so he'll do that. And he makes it to Imp, and now the Vill count's even, and now he can make traps. Actually, is popcapped right now. He's starting to get his houses converted... Mm, 
or he's lost them to the Trebs. I mean, he just got a bunch of Vils, right? So getting those Vils actually meant he's now pop capped, which means he can't make the Treb, which is a really big deal. Also, his Blacksmith is here. So if he gets upgrades, he's going to be upgrading that on the other side of the map. He really needs a new one. This is really difficult for Stark now. We saw Barrels put out the fires and settle it down. I don't know if Stark can do that. Also, what the... Stark converted a Vil and walled this stuff in. So that's smart. Push could still continue. That's a lot of Krambits, man. The Malay are just so strong. It's just like they've got so many bonuses. And I think the free armor upgrades just means the Krambit play is so much stronger. They already produce so fast. And we are about to have five trebuchets here for Barrels. Stacked up going after Stark. And Stark might just not have the time to defend this. And he's catch he's getting ballistics. He's gonna go for chemistry. All these really important upgrades. But by the time he gets these upgrades, he might not have the buildings anymore. Barrels is completely popped right now. He's at 200 population, which is insane. And he's got 40 karambits, man. And the Malay win rate continues. Crazy what the civilization's able to defend from, what it's able to do on the attack. And how cheap everything that it does is, which I think combined with the timings is what makes the Civ so dominant right now. And if you lose this castle, you're completely screwed. Like, you need a castle for Trebs if you're Stark. You can't really push the middle without Trebuchets. You cannot lose this castle. He needs a fight. He knows Bengali Elephant Archers are strong. But that is elite Elephant Archers with the unique tech, which he also needs the castle for, and things that he just does not have... The Karambits are here. These things aren't even elite yet, guys. They're, they're just regular, plain old Castle Age Karambits, but there's so many of them, and they are going to tickle these elephants to death. But it will still be death for the elephants. More monks moving in. Another castle now from Barrels, as he so desperately wants to make it to Hidden Cup 5. And surely... This is kind of funny, seeing the elephant still alive. Uh, <laughs> surely he's going to get this castle up. Elephants were converted in there, and now Barrels has more than Stark does, and what a crazy game! What a crazy game! Barrels somehow defended from that chaos that Stark sent his way. That was beautiful all around Age of Empires, let's be real. I know, oops, I put the 1-1 one -one there, because clearly I wanted Stark to benefit from that, but he did not. Um, and, and Well, that's not exactly true. I think he did benefit from his push. But he also chose a strategy which took insane levels of multitasking and everything always had to be right. Barrels, when he made it to Castle Age, somehow made it to Castle Age faster. He just dropped TCs and got that eco rolling. Guys, at one point, Barrels wasn't even in his base anymore. Like, look, he's here. How did he survive this game? What a sick job from him. Because this rush from Stark was so effective. And this villager stayed alive for a very long time. Now, I do want to go back to this. Uh, I know it's a bit of a silver lining here for Stark at this point. But I do want to show you this because I just, I think we need to appreciate it. So, this vill went very early, okay? And so, I want to show you this from Stark's point of view. So, he's already thinking about this strat. This was part of his thinking at 14 pop. But when he goes forward, I want to show you what his scout sees. Okay, so he's looking around. He's going to look to the edge so he can hug the edge. And then he starts to see that deer. And he's like, oh, okay, we have to stay out of range of that. And then the scout's even pushing. He's going closer to the vill, and that scout shows up and is like, no, you don't. And Barrels is just thinking he's trying to disrupt me pushing the deer, but that was actually the villager sneaking at that time. And that's what led to the, to the craziness. Now, I think you can go a bit deeper into that game, and you can, again, look at how good a job Barrels did with his eco. He ends up getting to three TCs soon after this. And the positions, too, were great. Like, he defended with extra house walls. He took all this gold in the middle. He had 49 seconds of TC idle time. I mean, I just don't know how he was so consistently alive in this game. And then turned it into this. So, 2-0 here for Barrels. He's two wins away from being a main event player in Hidden Cup. Stark, though, super fun to watch, dude. I hope we have more games like that. And I can tell you, Islands is out there for Stark. Stark is a really good Islands player. Islands, you are inherently in the dark a bit more. 
um, because you don't have a scout like you do on other maps. So I think we could maybe see some shenanigans there. But that felt like a really important one for Stark to win to win this series. And now he's, he's down 0-2. Like, if he wins that with that sneak, it's 1-1. Oof, man. It feels like 2-1 almost. But now that, that strategy didn't pan out, and that's a painful one there for Stark. T90, do you think Malay or OP? They have a great win rate in the Hidden Cup qualifiers, and their unique techs are barely ever used. I, I said when they received the, the Insta-free armor upgrades that it was too much, but that was, what, like a year and a half ago? Um, yeah, I, I think that that was an unnecessary buff for a Civ that was already really strong. But there are, there are other civilizations which are also insanely strong. We are just in an... A lot of civs have been buffed up. A lot of civs are really strong right now, and Malay are definitely one of them. Um, so Malay obviously get the win there. Let's just cross off the civs. Game one then for Barls was with the Magyars. He also won. Kind of rough for Stark. You've now lost with pick number two and three. That never feels good. But, yeah, I, I don't know. It feels weird to say Malay are OP. Like, they're too overpowered. But players are better at using their timings now than ever. And I think that the melee with the faster uptimes, it's just the perfect use of that, right? Their win rate has been one of the best win rates in all of the qualifiers. So whatever that means to you, do with that information what you will. I think they are the best win rate and they're one of the most played civs. So, certainly says a lot. All right, so we've got good old islands here. Now, what I was just saying was, uh, islands is a map which suits Stark's skill set. It's, uh, first off, we, we rarely have any straight up water maps anymore. Islands is a classic map that we used to be seen in every single tournament. I don't know how long you've been watching viewers, but it was common to have like Arabia, maybe islands. Maybe like Mediterranean. Maybe, you know, just more classic maps in the past. Stark has played Islands a million and one times. It's just he hasn't played most of those games over the last three years. So I've been happy to see Islands back in the pool. I think the games have brought us a lot of variety. Um, the one thing we maybe haven't had as much variety with is maybe just the Civs. Because like six or seven Civs seem to be very strong there and players have drafted around them. Um, but the alternative is we see more civs but then the games kind of suck because the, they don't have a lot of bonuses for them so i actually am really happy with the rotation that we have here and dravidians last hidden cup i uh, was not in we're not around uh and one of a few civilizations that can really take it to the vikings here so okay the last two times i saw vikings it was back dock fast castle longboat um, and both times the Vikings won, but they were very different games, and I felt like the MBL game, I'm not sure how he did it, and it was actually the same matchup, Ganji against, um, yeah, it was Ganji against MBL. So my thinking is Vikings would like to go fast castle, which means you need to pressure them. Or Vikings would like to go fast feudal in galleys, which means you need to make it messy. So I am going to guarantee you a transport here. Guaranteed. Okay, I will give 20 subs to the stream if I'm wrong. We will see a transport ship here from Barls. Promise you that. I think it is the best strategy against the Vikings. I think you go front dock, transport, you hop into that transport, you get over there, and you just kind of... You don't give the Vikings that free boom that they want. You don't give them the time to get the galleys masked, all right? So, might be some free subs on the cards. Speaking of free subs, thank you, Jappo. Squawk. Uh, is it Squake? Like, S-Quake? Or is it squawk -A? It's probably not squawk -A, but I, I kind of want to call it that. It's not, though, because it's probably based on, like, Quake. Um, <clears throat> Last week, Zacho and Cordy. Thank you all for the primes, guys. Thank you, Royal. Thank you, Leo. Um... Uh, Avalanche says, already looking forward to sending you a picture from our small watch party in Hamburg. Nice. Okay, so we're going to have a, a little Hamburg watch party for Hidden Cup main event. That's cool. Yeah, we're going to have, uh, during the main event, the ability to, you can tweet that stuff, and uh, we, we can have it up on stream, possibly. 
So forward dock from Stark tells me this will actually be fast feudal galleys. And as a player, you don't really know what your opponent is going to do based on scouting because you would have to scout with a fishing ship, which most players don't do. Again, back in the day, that happened a bit more commonly. But you don't see that these days. I think they're making more adjustments based on the if the opponent is in feudal age. So you do get a lot of information from the little bloop, the little uh, notification of your opponent being in the next stage. Could be wrong, of course. Stark could try and go fast castle, and maybe he you know, will surprise me here. But I'm waiting for the transport. We are going to see the trend. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. This is three fish. This is loom. But I don't think he's gearing up for a transport. Let's see. Mm, loom would indicate he could transport. Transport ship now. Come on, help me out here, brother. Yeah, <laughs> let's go. Yeah, man. People thought this would be very rare. I think the Vikings have made this be a bit more common because players like to do it against the Vikings, but we've got another transport. And Stark is going for the out-and-out -out galley war. So you need to mass the galleys, micro the galleys, and if you look away for a second, you could lose them. It's like, um... For example, how many people in my chat, my Twitch chat, smile if when you play archers, you look away for a second and your archers die tonight? Not calling you out. Just saying there is someone there, maybe more than two, that will agree with that statement. Okay. So, it's the same logic, right? Between fires and... Uh, back away, back away, back away, back away, back away, back away, dude! Oh, okay. Um, well... Hi, this, Barls has made this very obvious. And, and to finish my point, it's the same logic with fires and galleys. Only the fires are the knights of the sea. So Stark saw this immediately and actually canceled his dock. And Barls sees this. And Stark doesn't have loom. Oh, what are we doing not getting loom when you're the Vikings? You know people are going to land you. I know it. You You should know it. Oh, that's an amazing start here for Barls to kill the Vill. And there's the archery range. Okay, so the, the good news for Stark, obviously not having Loom is a little sloppy. But the good news is that he knows uh, this is here. And he has dropped a barracks nice and early. And he is going to go stable. Ooh. I actually love stable. Because the barracks is at home here with this build. And Stark knows there can't be spearmen. And so a lot of players are going to go like skirms or archers. Wow, that's a smart. Also, speaking of smart, Barlow just goes whoop right back into the transport ship. But yeah, early archers might pop out. They could get sniped. Now, fire galleys. This is now the downside of going for one dock because you need more galleys than fire galleys. And Barlow's is also mixed in some water control. See how stressful this is? This is not what the Viking player wants. And archers will chase down this villager. Stark will not want to reveal his scouts too early because you get like two or three scouts here. You can kill all the archers. You can kill the vills. Now he shows the scout. Now, if this is a different map, then the archer player just adds spears and it gets more complicated. But I actually really like that decision from Stark. And he lost some of his fish. He's going to go out and try and find the fish from Barls. His fish are just off. Off. Just chilling for now. Taking a break. So Stark has to look and see where his opponent is docked now. And, and unfortunately for him, he is assuming that the transport player has fish the back. Which is very common. Normally the transport player will have the fish on the back. But here that's not the case. And so those fishing ships could have been sniped, but Stark in the dark is not going to find any fish back here, which gives Barls a big, big advantage with the food income. This villager from Barls has been walled in and is protected for the most part. And Barls also is building dock number two. 
And he's adding more fish right now, which is actually very risky. He brought this villager home, so she lives to tell the tale. Very risky to add more fish. This could actually end up hurting him. He queued up four fishing ships in one dock. But they're very distracted right now. Hmm. Stark's down two games. His strategy was so fun in the previous game. It was so close. But Barl's just held on. Obviously, it's already going to be bad. If you, you know, being down two games. But you've got to win this one. Right? Tower goes up for Stark. Well, will it? We'll see. He hops out with his army so he can get this up. Because he doesn't have fletching yet. It's a really bad fight for Stark, I think. But, but, but... Barls went crazy with the fish. Barls doesn't think these galleys are out here anymore. Barls cannot push that gold anymore, and he's losing so many fishing ships. A spearman is being transported. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I never thought we'd ever see that. He's like, yeah, I know there's scouts. I need to get the spearman forward. <laughs> now, you know what's wild, guys, about the island's meta is... You might be thinking, uh, why no barracks on the front then? Well, it's easier for them to spot you, and that, but then if they raid you with scouts, you can't make spears. The other thing is you want the archer range to be built immediately once you make it to feudal. And oftentimes with the timing of the transport ship, it gets really tricky to get the timings right. So it's just easier to build the barracks here, but that's funny. I mean, resources collected is ahead for Barls, but if the Vikings make it to the next stage and make longboats... They can dominate the sea. A nice job from Barls to still keep some of his fishing ships alive. But he only has five of them, and it could have been much worse. Transport ship, micro is on point here for Barls. Fire ship going to block. These archers have not broken Stark. Stark will send the skirmishers over. Archer range is still here. The villager is also still here for Barls. And a random fishing ship from Stark, which wasn't even fishing, was just spotted by that fire. So that will go down. But galleys could still swoop back in. And, and if you're just focusing down the fish here, I think this could be pretty good for you if you're Stark. Because you're, you're ultimately going to want longboats anyways. And Stark is making his own transport ship. Yo, yo, guys. Guys. Come on. Complain about islands again. Come on, man. Yeah, I feel so vindicated. These games have been so good. Give me the archers from the tower, Stark. Come on. You know they're there. That's why the transport is here. And bring a villager. Bring a villager. <gasps> Be fast. Be fast, Stark. Be quick, please. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm I'm still waiting. Sorry. Uh okay. So I think four archers and a vill would actually be maybe better than five archers. Because you need a chance to build something over there. But okay, here he goes. He has no navy. Arles misses that. Arles is patrolling the seas. St there goes Stark. Into the darkness he goes. He did check this area with his galleys. And he is most likely going to make it. To Barls' island, where Barls has n very little vision. But if the archers hop out here and attack the house right away, that'd be so unfortunate. Oh, come on! Oh, the, come on! The AoE gods hate him! The AoE gods hate him! That sucks! Instantly, Barls gets the attack notification. It's the only house on the whole freaking shoreline. And poor Stark notifies his opponent that he's here. And Barls can react to it now. We've got a TC and a TC and some quick walling. You might need some siege too, but I feel so bad for Stark. That is so unbelievably unfortunate. There is also a hole here. So can you imagine, like, he could have ran right in, killed some vills, been back to business. Dang. And now he, you know, this is smart from Barls. Barls has placed a TC on wood, stone, wood, gold, and is pretty much protected from this. And now he has the upgraded ships. And with those upgraded ships, he will dominate the seas. We'll see if the Spearman... This is... Shout out to Little John from previous Hidden Cups. This was actually a hero in a previous Hidden Cup. This, it was a like a guy from a campaign named Little John. Uh, Little John, we'll see if he could scout this. 
And a little John scouts it. I mean, on some level, obviously, we got to give Barl's credit for the house and the spearman there. He must be looking around. But it does feel like certain things have just gone right for Barl's here. And oh, he's going to find some kills because of that. And now his fire ships can come directly over here. Don't know if he'll kill that last villager. It's pretty speedy with the Vikings, but Stark is probably distracted with the archers. And, well, villager does not go down. Siege from Barls could come out of this siege workshop to pressure that gold. It's a really awkward feeling right now if you're Stark. Now, some players will actually build houses along the shoreline as a tactic to, um, to distract the enemy ships wow sick from barrels to notice this he, well he preemptively built the palisades but he sensed that this villager could be picked off and so he's gone for the monastery there stark did kill a vild here barrels was very greedy not to add a, any siege here but i think he knew it was only going to be the archers imagine if it was four archers and a villager and the villager could build something here but yeah, one scorpion should be good enough to deal with this. And then that landing is pretty much useless. Villager here is going to get picked off by the range unit Stark has. Stark now has longboats. But there are a lot of fire galleys out there for Barls. So Stark's micro needs to be on point. And he is just on one TC. So Barls is growing and growing with the villager lead here behind this. Barls with 61 villagers. Stark has 41. And Barls wants to be in that main event of Hidden Cup 5. And he wins this one. It almost feels inevitable. There will be a backup qualifier for Stark tomorrow. Everyone who loses these best of sevens gets that second chance. So this won't be the end of Stark if, if he loses this series. But right now, man, the consistency from Barls. And I mean, it's just it's just so good, man. His idle TC time every game is always pretty low. His army count's insane. He's always so fast to getting his eco flowing. The timings on his attacks are always so good. Okay, hold on. Transport's still there for Stark. He could maybe use this army in that. And the longboats are really starting to pay off now. So longboats, once you get to like 10 of them, become insanely tough to stop. And is Stark going to go 1TC fast imp longboats here? Hmm. Someone with their first message showed up and they, they subscribed with Prime. Said, yay, I did it, T90. Now I will delete this app and never return back to YouTube I go. <laughs> well, thank you for the sub. <laughs> Hope you enjoy the, the, the stream on YouTube. I will mention, though, that the Prime does need to be renewed <laughs> it doesn't auto renew which isn't stupid so it just just saying <laughs> um enjoy the broadcast on youtube thanks for the message here on twitch uh castle's gonna go up for barrels and barrels just knows how devastating these longboats can be to the shoreline so he's dropped the castle here to protect his docks but you know, his forwards aren't accomplishing too much. It does look like he did kill the monk there, which is probably annoying for Stark. Stark is shredding this dock. Man, I didn't... Did they change something with longboats? Where they destroy buildings faster? I know they were always strong in the past. We just never see longboats these days. Like, it, the docks are going down insanely fast. TCs too. It feels like it's, it's like abnormal. I guess Navy in general always does a pretty good job at destroying buildings, but. Um, longboats. Whoa, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Party! Uh, misclicked something on my keyboard. These longboats are looking insanely strong, and Stark probably thinks my only way back. I'm behind an eco. Remember, his three. His, his archer saw the three TCs. So he knows I'm going to be way behind economically. So what I have to do is I have to make sure my longboats are upgraded. And that's why he's going up. I don't know if this will be enough because he's so far behind economically. But this is his best way back. And a great job from Stark to recognize that. And now he goes for more town centers. 
Transport is still chilling over here. And there was a transport from Barls. Where did it go? Ooh! Barls! Well, dude, you're on the wrong island. You're on the wrong island and you haven't built three. What are we doing? Two archer ranges here from Barls on the enemy's island. And we'll see if it leads to more. But he wants to take the fight to Stark's Eco yet again. So he landed on this side. He snuck away from those long boats. And he's going to now sneak on this side. Could actually drop a castle here. I'm not going to rule it out. Oh, dude. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure about this one now. I appreciate it, Barls. But there's only so much room to move around on here. And that is... You got to cancel that. You have to hop into the transport. You have to cancel that. And you have to go somewhere else. Yeah. And Stark actually says, I'm not even going to complete my tower now. Well, it was a good thought. The longboats are going to be on the way, though. The villagers have done the right thing to leave. These ranges are probably a waste of wood in the end. But what Stark will not be able to afford is elite longboat. He also won't be able to afford... I mean, even like Bracer and Chemistry is, is tough. And then the Bugs Vigar upgrade out of the castle is a long ways away. And now Barls isn't losing docks because the longboats have had to come back over here. I think Stark is actually searching for the transport, too. And what do you open with here if you're Barls? I think it's just Galleys. Uh, war Galleys. Just go War Galleys into Galleon. I think that feels like the best play. Another castle on the shoreline could be huge. He's going to rush this down. It is spotted, but it is just one ship. Now, you do get the Teresa Die ship. It's this big, chunky ship. It's, um... It's like a... It's like a longboat and a Korean turtle ship combined. That's probably the best way to describe it. Um... So, it's strong, but you can only produce them in Imp, and you can't just wait till Imp to produce, right? Actually, maybe he will. He's in Imp in 30 seconds. Guys, I think he's going to do it. It makes sense. If he was making... If he was three minutes from Imp, he should be making other things. I mean, Fast Fire could still make sense, but maybe we'll see that. These longboats are a pain right now, denying resources for Barls, but he has the lead. I mean, he's collected so many resources. Fast fire. Okay, do it for the people here, Barls. Do it for the people. He's not going to do it. Okay. Shipwright. Ooh, okay, that's a big one. That's a big one. Because games go late on islands very frequently. Stark is trying to deny this from happening. And we are going to see a town center? I don't know about that one. Okay, he deletes it and is going to flee. Huh! Huh! Huh, huh. Careful! 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 Run! I don't know how those things didn't hit there. But hey, the villagers make it to the shoreline and they are still going to die. But uh, hey, well, that guy survives. That's cool. He's got a good story to tell. This is funny. I don't know how this happened, but Stark is underneath the castle. Slowly destroy. Dude, I see slowly. Look how fast they destroy the castle. He's taken 500 HP off that castle already. But obviously, if he moves, he gets shot. Now a fire comes. It, it definitely feels abnormal. The amount of damage longboats are doing against buildings. But I don't know what's normal because we don't see longboats that frequently. And this is kind of fresh and new to us. So, Oh, oh the chunkers are there. The three Sedai are there. They're in the docks. And Barls is just being patient now. He's just waiting. Must be so annoying to have these blue buildings all around your base. I'd be so paranoid all the time. Elite longboat now on the way. How are you supposed to deal with these guys? These things are huge. They are clogging up the waterways. And they shoot massive, massive javelins. Now, according to what I was told in the previous cast, they lose to elite longboat with Bugsvigar. Because of the extra arrows from the longboat. And the firing speed. That, that's what I was told. Now, I do not know if this... You know, there's other factors involved. I do not know in this instance if the longboats are going to be enough. But if that's the case, right? This could be pretty epic water battle. Stark could maybe win this. How is Stark not dead yet? 
Also, he did loop around the outside. He's got a lot on the gold for Barls, and I don't think Barls realizes that right now. Maybe he does. He just now does, but he's got to micro the ships as well. There's a lot more longboats in there. I don't know where that one is going. <laughs> Maybe that's a strategy. <laughs> it seems like it glitched out. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing. And we now have heavy demo for Barls. And also a very important castle on the neutral island. He can get those relics. He can get the gold. He can get the stone. Yeah, so my this is my opinion of this unit. I don't think it's good. The three Sedai. I just don't. Um, I think the best thing for you to do with this is you make Galleon. And then you mix in the three Sedai with the Galleon. Because the chunkiness helps. But the damage output is not that great. At least compared to the cost. That's my feeling on it. Now, the sails are super beautiful. It definitely has the cool factor. So, well, give Barl's cool points. But the castle gets denied, and Stark is refusing to die here. And this is before the longboats even get the unique tech, Bogsvigar. What a crazy, crazy hold from Stark. It really just came down to going imp with such low economy. Oh, God. Oh, God. Not a Oh, God. Not again. He's got 38 longboats right now. Crazy stuff. And he's going to transport it. I think he's going to transport and castle over here. Now, you can use Trebs from this neutral island to this castle. Interestingly enough, that's not always the case. Longboats are looping around behind for Stark. There we go. Stark is not engaging. Now he's engaging. It's also, you, you are also deceived on how big your force is. Because there's only five here. Whereas there's 17 longboats. The numbers matter so much here. Barl's has 36 villagers in cube? <laughs> Barl's has 36 villagers in cube with 115 bills. And he will run out of resources here eventually. So he's like, I need more resources to produce these things. And let's see if he can deny this castle from Stark. Stark's turn to get a castle denied. Longboats are split up right now from Stark. He doesn't have his main force. And now we're seeing a combination of fast fires with the three today. That's pretty good. There is also this castle. Oh, dude, if he garrisons here, Stark doesn't know about this castle. That could be huge. You got a garrison there. Actually, can Stark just position himself underneath it? What is happening? Villagers over here are going to go down. Villagers over here are going to go down. I don't think Stark knew about that. He could actually sit underneath it. There's no murder holes. Crazy battle. More longboats on the front. This is pretty close. This castle for Stark is going to be denied, I think. It's at 75%. He will need to get more villagers here. Stark has lost so many fills this game. And Barls has a lot more in Q, so Barls will have a lot more eco. Again, you do wonder, do you want to have 150 villagers on islands? They'll, they'll, they'll just, you'll run out of resources faster. But the food doesn't really, you know... I don't know, you're not going to spend the food on anything else. Maybe the ship is good now? Like, maybe Theresa dies good? We still don't have the 8 plus 5 for Stark because he didn't have a castle, so he can't get Bogsvigar. And maybe it was just a numbers thing before. Maybe Stark's doing it. Certainly has the chunkiness, and now it's his turn to build a castle. Guys, just give up. Can we just have an agreement that no castles can be built here? Both players having a doubt castle in the same spot. That's not something you see every day. Uh, why don't we just ferry more villagers over here? Okay, more villagers are on the way. I'll keep you updated. I think Barl's is... I think the ship might actually be good. Clearly, it was a numbers issue for him. Okay. Do you try it or do you wait? You try it. Yeah. I actually forgot that this was the castle for Barl's and this is the castle for Stark. So Stark's castle will go up. Stark also has a castle here. And he's taking some of that extra gold. Both players got the two relics on their islands. But both players have not gone for uh, any of the neutral relics yet, which is, I think we know why. Barls could actually complete his castle, funnily enough, if he used the ships to distract the castle from Stark. 
Stark just has so many ships. I mean, he's forgotten about these. He could use those. Look at these two Vils to the left of the fight. Just fishing away. Listen, it's a time of war, but people still need to work, right? You don't just get the day off. Heated shot now. Castles will do more damage against ships. And Barrels is going for heavy demos. If he can get some big hits, here we go. This is new. We haven't seen this yet. This is the best time is the first time. And that was the worst time. Actually, uh, today we learned that using demos against longboats is also not very strong because you need to get in close and boom. Bad timing. But GG. Yeah. I mean, it was hype, right? We got the highlight. But listen, at the end of the day, it's still, you lost like 20 ships to kill seven. All right. Let's not forget about that. You're spending resources on a unit that can be used once. Those longboats brought the game back from Stark. I was thinking GG. Many people watching were thinking this was GG. And I was, my mind was kind of half already in the next series here when Stark was 30 villagers behind and when Stark had lost so much control. You know, I think for Barrels, I think that this this chunky ship, I just don't think it's great. Or at least I don't think it's the only thing you can rely on. And, uh, you know, he also had poor timing with this castle. That got denied. And Stark just kept taking good engagement after good engagement. Beautiful job from Stark to defend from that, honestly. And Stark was extremely unlucky. Do you remember this house with those archers? Like, that house, if it wasn't there, would have potentially led to Stark getting many more kills and surprising his opponent. But well done. Um, you can see the difference in the amount of ships created. I don't know how many fires we saw created from Barls, but I know it wasn't over 56. So, yeah, Ornlu did say in the cast with me earlier, he says, T90 in chat, remember when I said three Sedai are awful versus longboats? Exactly. Yeah, Ornlu said it. And I, I, I never saw him have over 20 at once. It just took so long. And Barls just could never get the momentum going there. So Stark has a chance. 2-1 now. It's, it's a completely different series because of that win. He did play with his first three civilizations, which is notable here. Whereas for, uh, for Barls, he's got some of his stronger civs still remaining. But happy to see that for Stark. The games, the strategy's been super good. I mean, guys, he could have won game number two. Game number two was pretty close. Does that ship need a buff? I think it's in a weird spot. I don't think you can buff that ship without the Dravidians being the number one civilization on... Um... Like, Dravidians are already so good on water, so I don't think you can buff that ship. I think it might just be a bad matchup against Longboats specifically, right? By the way, Stark said... He said, GG... At the end of that game, it didn't show up because it was, it was after the game ended. But it was in the chat. He said, GG, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> GG, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> that was funny. The Stark's like, come on, man. There's too many DLCs. I've been playing since early 2000s. What is this garbage? <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. Um, all right, here we are. So we, we will have a little bit of speeding up to do. And I imagine there could possibly be some laming involved. And uh, we're here live time already. Scores 2-1. Barrels is up. But you know, think about the series if you've watched it the whole way through. Game 2 was incredibly close. The strategy from Stark I felt was great. If the execution was slightly different or Barrels didn't play out of his mind, it might be Stark up 2-1. So that island's game and Stark's ability to stay alive, like... Every game has gone to the Imperial Age, which is telling. It does make you think that uh, Stark's definitely got a chance here. I do think Civ-wise, he'll have to find his moments here. I think Vietnam Vietnamese are a bit easier to play. And this would be a big one for Burrows, obviously, on the back of that loss there on Islands. Um, in terms of the Civs they have remaining on their draft and how they valued and prioritized them, Burrows does have his higher picks still available. Which, in theory, means he's he's obviously still the favorite to win this. And then qualify for the main event of Hidden Cup 5. Barrels lost first round in the previous Hidden Cup. I do not remember who he was up against, actually. I think it might have 
If I recall, I think it was Jacqueline against Warwolf. Can somebody check that? And I think that Barls won the first game on Arabia. I think it was Mayans against uh, something. I, I forget the other Civ. For some reason, I'm thinking Mayans against Huns, but I don't think that's accurate. And then I think, if I'm correct, ACCM, who was Warwolf, won three straight, and it was a best of five, and ACCM won three one. So yeah, please please check that because I this is always fun for me. But Tatars here, they have uh, extra food on their sheep, or in this case, pigs. That helps out a lot. You also do more damage when on top of hills. Those are really the two things. So you have a smooth Dark Age and Feudal Age, and then every fight you want to be on a hill. But I think Vietnamese, cheaper eco upgrades, faster researching eco upgrades, really strong range units can be great against the Tatars. Uh, but so both civs, I feel, it could be very natural for them to go archers um, throughout the game. Is anyone checking Liquipedia for me right now? Nobody? Nobody? Come on, chat. Please, somebody. Uh, maybe I should be looking at YouTube. Check. Can somebody please check Liquipedia about Hidden Cup 4? It was Mayans versus Vikings? Okay, got it. Thank you. And he was against ACCM, right? I'm pretty sure it was Jacqueline against Warwolf. Mayans Vikings. Yeah, Mayans Vikings makes a lot more sense. But Vikings have the same architecture as the Huns. Oh -ho! Wait, do they? I think they do. So, uh, yeah. So my brain was, was half there. But yeah, he wants to be back. He wants to be back in Hidden Cup. Three on wood right now for Stark. Stark plays a lot of Arabia. He is a player who does not reach the heights as others on Arabia. I think he's 2400 ranked, which basically, let's be honest, is is basically an Arabia rating. The majority of players are not playing mixed maps on the ladder, which is a shame. But um, I think Barrels is around 26 or 2700. He does maybe mix in some arena every now and then, but for the most part, he's playing a lot of Arabia as well. So there's the barracks for Stark, which indicates he'll go for some militia here. So this could be the Frush, little French Drush. The one Sato invented and perfected. Sato already in the main event after qualifying yesterday. I'm pumped for him. Was talking to him a bit about that. Excited for him. And Barls is going to click up here for what I'm assuming is going to be something like scouts. But he has not scouted his opponent at all here. So in theory, this could be a little bit of a surprise. Uh, someone said T90 is the main event seeded. Uh, no, the, if the main event was seeded, right, you'd be able to know who was against who pretty easily. So it's a complete random bracket. Anything can happen. Can have some big matchups in the first round. For example, uh, Hidden Cup 4, I think the biggest one was Tato against Hera first round. But yeah, it's it's a it's a random bracket. The players are given names at random. And that's how the event plays out. This time, I haven't talked too much about this yet. Um, so this time, instead of doing best of fives, for the first round, it's best of sevens. Pretty much the whole event is best of sevens, with the exception of the third place match being a best of five, and the final is a best of nine. I still may switch the final to a best of seven, actually, but there's some things we got to work out there, so. You can't do, like, a half seeding situation. <laughs> yeah, we're going to play some players, but not others. That that would be... Th th then you're picking and choosing, and that would be... That would be rough. Now, speaking of rough, Barl's never scouted this. And now he's got Militia coming in. And this barracks could be denied. And this strategy is designed to hit right now. And this is what Stark needs to get back into this series and tie it up. Even delaying the barracks can be annoying. De you know, hitting the villagers like this. I mean, this could still be a villager kill if Barl's isn't careful. This is the perfect frush, as we call it, from Stark. And Barl's... Still doesn't have his barracks up, which still means that he's unable to add an archery range or a stable as a follow-up. Wow, Stark will be very happy with this. Still no barracks, still no archery range, still no stable. Barls hasn't lost a Vildo, and he probably won't, at least on the barracks, because he's so close to the TC. Oh! Oh, do you delete the Vil? Okay, sometimes these villagers could path out of this. Stark repositions. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That is an amazing start here. I don't think the other villager will die. 
But beautiful play there from Stark, and Stark's now up a bill. Behind this, Stark will go for an archery range. Stark will go for his mill, which he delayed. He's, he's heavy on gold to go archers. Might have early blacksmith as well, and still no building for Barls. This is shaky. Did he forget? No, he thinks it might be scouts, maybe. And he thinks he can just defend with spears. He brought his scout home. Um, oh, and now his scout got hit as well. Yeah, he brought his scout home to fight that off, so I think he is guessing right now. He is guessing that Stark is going to go for scouts on the back of this. And obviously hoping. And there he goes for his archery range now, but... If Stark moves forward with two archers right now and gets fletching, it could, end, it could be game ending. But the timing on it's huge. We'll see if, if Barros has more walls down in the meantime. But yeah, there, there's just like more, um, you know, the scouting was really important here. Barros knowing where his opponent's TC was, wanting to push in the deer. He took some risks and he kind of got punished for it there. And that was a really well-timed build there from Stark, who's already moving out and getting fletching. Barros has his scout. Stark does not. He saw the gold and not the range, but the gold should tell him enough. I love the eco so far for Stark. He's still taking sheep, right? That's the Tatars for you. Now, the walls have happened this way. Stark is using the spearmen to scout. And now he sees the skirms. You can still force engagements against these skirms before upgrades come in. Especially if you get to the hill with the Tatars, because you have more damage. But it isn't ideal. And knowing Stark, he's going to sneak. Look at this guy. He is the sneakiest player I've seen in this entire qualifier. See this? No one else does this. <laughs> Guys, he, he snuck the vill in game two. In game one, he went edge of the map sneak archers too. Barls doesn't have a lot of reason to go forward, right? Because he just has skirmishers. So he's just waiting at home, and that's the right play with Stark. Look how sneaky it is. Barl's thought, can I get away with a wall this way? There he goes. <laughs> Stark is like, we got him right where we want him, dude. We got him right where we want him. <laughs> That's insane. That is so good. That is so good. I love it. I love it so much. And he somehow works his way around. And he's going to find another villager kill. This guy's so sneaky. Who needs the speed and the micro and the APM when you can get the strategy and the timings down? Just beautiful play from Stark. And I'm beginning to believe now, guys. Game two felt like a really tough loss because in game number two, it was such a good strat. He is the underdog and it felt like it had to work. But now, I mean, his follow-up look, I mean, he's not sacrificing army count. Timing on his walls feels pretty good. He will have scouts with more archers to be able to pressure Barls. Barls doesn't have any map control, so he's just taking the back golds here. Main gold's fairly brutal, but he also could have walled this way and built up in front of it if you're Barls. Scout, archer. I mean, I've been really impressed with how what we're seeing from Stark at the moment. Just kind of missing a gate here. Um... Everything will be in the back of his walls over time. And I, Barls has no clue that Stark is adding scouts. I think, I wonder if Barls is underestimating Stark and his Arabia play in some ways. Because I know I always do. I'm like, oh, I'm up against Stark. Hey, okay, he's super slow. And then all of a sudden, I've got sneak archers in my base. And then he outbooms me in Castle Age, and then I die. He did sense there's going to be scouts in some way here, Barls. He added the spears. It is going to be difficult for Stark here with that many skirmishers. And these are Vietnamese skirmishers. Barls has fletching now. And now this is where the micro matters. The scouts need to be used against the skirms. The archers need to be used against the spears. The skirms need to be used against the archers. The spears need to be used against the scouts. You get it. You see it. Stark losing a lot of archers here, though, and this is really good for Barls. And Barls may even be up to Castle Age a little bit faster with a good economy. Res collected, of course, hasn't been as good because of the idle time and losing the bills. 
And Stark will just drop another range. Okay, so if Stark makes main event, I found something about him that I think is is a tell. But I'm not sure if I should mention it. Should I tell? Oof, what do we do? Because I'm going to have videos on this stuff. I definitely have a tell with Stark and his openings. Which is a bit unique to him on a map like... Uh, on a standard land map. I think I'm going to keep my mouth shut. And we can make that content for the main event. There's definitely something within the first 11 minutes that has been unique to him every single game besides Quarry and, like, Island, so. Sneak Archers? Well, well, that's an obvious one. Yeah, the Sneak Archers is definitely a Stark thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's something specific. It, it, I'll make a video on it, most likely, if he makes, in, makes it in. Uh, anyways, he's walled. He's on his way up here. And sure, he lost a couple archers, but he did kill three vills, which I think is the trade you'll take. More range is here for Barls. Barls is obsessed with cav archers, guys. He's going to do it again here. He did it with the Magyars on slopes. Stark will go for crossbow, and he will go for bodkin. And then Tatar cav archers also seem pretty strong. So, I think that early window, like... If Barls doesn't get elite skirm... And instead, he goes for the Cav Archer numbers. It could be an issue for him. Yeah, losing um, losing today means you still have a second chance tomorrow. Uh, it should be... I think the loser here faces the loser of... I think the loser here plays against Ganji tomorrow. Because Ganji lost against MBL yesterday. There is also another set after this one today. It'll be Sebastian against Baba Rum. Baba Rum, a player very similar to Stark, who's been around a very long time. But that that's even a crazier story. He, his career is not near as... Like, his, his career achievements is not near as long as Stark's. Even though Stark is, is still the underdog here. But, uh, man, that series would be interesting. Stark against Ganji. I know Barls and Ganji are training partners, so they would kind of know each other really well. I think they both would like to make it into the main event and avoid knocking the other out. But that's up to Barls now, right? Barls has to, has to take this lead the whole distance here. He does go for a lead skirm. He is massing Cav Archers. He does drop the Town Center. Again, just very passive economic play here from Barls. Stark can do that too. He will drop a TC as well. And Stark has added us a, a Lancer just to help on the front against any skirms. And it's going to go directly to this wood line. Barls might sense this though. Because you're not vulnerable here anymore. There's the red on the minimap. And look at his immediate reaction. Really well played from Barls. So, house is not necessarily something you want to have to break through here. It, it gives your opponent time, but I think Stark will be happy to know that his opponent's still at home. And then know that his opponent's on Skirm, which is something he doesn't necessarily know right now. He didn't actually see it, though. I'm sure he's expecting Elite Skirm. Why get Crossbow Tech if you're going to make Cav Archers anyways? Well, he had, like, 10 to 12 of them. Or... And 10 to 12, like, not upgrading 10 to 12 units can be really, really bad, right? Obviously, if you've got, like, four of them, I think that's something you need to consider. But I think at this, at the amount of units he has, I think it's really nice. But I think the longer the game the game goes when you don't get Arbalest, it does begin to feel a bit awkward. And Stark would have hoped to find more value from these crossbows. And he hasn't been able to find it. And look at what Barls has done. He's just got skirms in defense. And now the cab archers are going to go forward. And it's really smart thinking from him to do that. And Barls has made it very tough for his opponent to break him right now. Hmm. So two TCs. Third TC now for Stark. You get the sheep when you complete a TC. Which can be good for your eco. Helps you get to the Vill production. And Stark hops out. Stark surprises Barls. Barls in that bloodlines. Barls never expected Stark to have a whole military force in those ranges. He thought it was going to be one or two. And Stark's patience pays off again. That was crazy. He killed like four CA. And now the crossbows are going to find kills. Oh, man. 
So, you know, as this transitions towards a cab archer war, it's now two cab archers for Barls. It is 13 for Stark. And sure, there's skirms, but I mean, the cab archers can run away from the skirms and they get to decide on when they take those fights. That, again, is a very... Something that is unique to Stark. No one is going to have 12 cab archers sitting in their ranges. They're going to eject the units. They're going to move them. They're going to be active. Stark is just chilling. And he's booming. And then when he needed to, he moved out. Crazy. Knowing skirms are out, Stark will now walk to the middle to build the siege workshop. Guys, I'm loving Stark's play right now. I'm real. I'm sure you could pick up on it. This is really impressive stuff. And remember, this is the guy who beat running, who had an amazing past two years in Age of Empires 2. He beat him 3-0. He beat Dogal, who was like a lock for me in this group. I just thought he would, I thought he would qualify in some way, shape, or form to Hidden Cup. I'm shocked that he's not going to have that chance. And he beat it. It wasn't like Dogal was. He, you might, if you were to ask Dogal, maybe he, you know, players are going to say they could do things differently, but. Stark is just playing at an amazing level. And when I congratulated him after beating Dogal and said, let's go keep it up, he didn't say much, but he said, keep him coming. And Barls was next on the list. If he were to deny this castle, this could be massive, guys. If he denies this castle, it'll be 2-2. And we'll be going to the fifth game. Does he know about it, though? Oh, that is such a risky castle. Like, I would never in a million years place that castle if I saw my opponent had a siege workshop. Never. But I think Barls knows it's worth the risk because if he doesn't take this hill, it will be stolen from him. And man, oh man, is this castle going to be critical. I think it can go up. If Stark was just a little bit faster here. Yeah, that, see, that castle's so close to going up, Stark might not take the engagement. Yep. See, Stark has to back away because he knows the castle. Nice shot, but the castle will shoot down everything then. What an interesting game. Well, now, Stark might think about Imp. Maybe his own castle. Maybe a Trebor. Hmm. Tricky stuff. He does have his crossbow still around. He does have a random spearman on the right. Skirms find a nice kill here against Stark. Stark not paying attention for a moment, getting picked off. How does Barl's deal deal with the siege? Hmm. Hey yeah, guys, the final series of the day is Baba Rum against Sebastian, where Sebastian is the favorite. He's that next generation. But Baba Rum beat Nikov in round two. He then beats, um, I'm trying to remember who he beat in round three, actually. Why am I brain farting on this? Oh, Kingston. Yeah. The young uh, talent from Mexico, who was again favored there. It's been a crazy qualifier, man. We are going to have a lot of new people playing in Hidden Cup 5 that have never played in Hidden Cup before. Or some that have never even had a top 16 performance before. Potentially, right? I love how calculated Stark's aggression is. He always has just enough. He clicks up to the Imperial Age, and Barls is panicking here. And he should be, because he cannot engage against this. This force of crossbow and cab archer is, is strong enough, but then you add the siege in. Barls also clicks up to him, and he builds a castle behind. This castle will complete, but some amazing control right now for Stark. He might need to shift home into some defense, though, because we've got Skirms and Rats and Archers from Barls trying to attack here. The castle, again for Barls, will go up. Does Stark even see that? Ah! Where are you going? Turn around! Oh, jeez. That was that could a bit horrible. I mean, he didn't actually lose that much. I thought he was actually tempted to run back there, which, I mean, you never know. But what you do know is if you don't go back there, you're not going to lose your army. <laughs> so, so it's a guarantee you save your army if you don't take the risk. Stark is getting armor now for Cav. And he might be thinking about Hussar. Could be Lancers, but the Tatars have that silk armor upgrade. That's extra Pierce armor to their uh, Hussars. I think that can be really strong here. 
But I mean, Barls has two castles. Barls has solid economy, and he the, those castles can produce Rattan archers, which are a really good unit in late game. He's got 16 Rattans right now. If he can get one big seed shot on these Maganels here, suddenly the Skirms and the Rattans can clear all of this. This could be really good for Barls. Big moment incoming. Stark is kind of getting surrounded. He notices that. The Rattans finish off that Manganel. Amazing play from Barls. He's going to get the next one. And all of a sudden, Stark is completely surrounded. He has to run through Skirms. And the Cav Archer Mass, which we thought would be so important here, disappears. Beautiful defensive play from Barros. I don't know how he does it. I just don't know how he does it. The initial castle was great. This castle was great. That fight was beautiful. He's got 40 army right now. He's getting relics. He just collected a relic at one point. Now he will get upgrades. And the Rattan Archer is a high... It is a mo mobile archer. It has solid damage output once you get elite. But the big thing about the Ratsan Archer is that you can't really counter it with anti-archer things. Well, that's not true. Huskarls would shred it. Um, it is an anti-archer archer is what I meant to say. Um, so, like, skirmishers even aren't that good against them because of their high armor. So, Cav would have to be your choice. Stark, look at look at this corner. Look how, look how cute this base looks here, man. He's going to drop stables. It will be light cap from him. But how is he supposed to raid when his opponent has castles everywhere? I like the houses and the outposts for vision over here. I like the patrolling army on this gold over here. He has scouted this, a lot of this base. He's not seeing too much from Barrels right now. He's also not showing Barrels too much of what he's going to do. But I'm pretty sure Barrels knows because Barrels is going for Halb. Yeah, he caught a glimpse of those stables there. Okay, there's Silk Armor. That adds extra armor to the Hussars. And the Hussar upgrade's also on the way. So that's definitely the plan here. And those upgrades are going to be in. So now Halb is very much needed. There was a hole here. And this villager walked through. So if stables start to go up here and Barrels never realizes this, that could actually be a big deal. There's other things to prioritize right now, though. This is interesting. Okay, Step Lancer kills a monk. Stark will know that there's a castle there for Barrels on the extra gold. He's going to make a castle there, so he might treb that down over time. And there he goes, building the stable. But Barrels did realize this. He was going to wall in the stable, but instead he's just going to convert the vill. And, oh, wow, the Hussars were actually looking to come through there. The villager actually hurt Stark. Because it alerted Barrels to the hole. But Hussars are just going to go right through anyways. And Stark? Is there another hole? No, he's kind of trapped, actually. Uh, he'll find a villager killer, too. But the Halbs being out is not going to be something he's excited about. It's really interesting, though, how Stark is playing this. It's still very patient for a player who's behind. Or is he behind? Look at him stack everything into this corner. Come the trebs for Barls. Barls, the second he doesn't have to defend with his halbs, he's going to move forward and try and force the issue here against Stark. And Stark isn't ready for that. But he's going to have fully upgraded Hussars. He gets behind his treb. Now he's using stand ground here. He's got to select the unit. And there he goes. He's going to take one treb. That's not bad. Stark has a lot of resources. That gives him more time. Stark is also taking this gold and starting to mass trebs here. Barls may be distracted over here. Stark might actually go over there and raid it, honestly. Over castle from Barls. That army from Barls is so high. 70 army. But Stark's economy is unbelievable. We see Timurid Siegecraft. I doubt we'll see Flaming Camels, but that adds extra range to the trebs. Actually, the second time I've seen that solely for the Treb range here on Arabia in the Hidden Cup qualifiers. The other one was Vinchester. In maybe the best Arabia game of the whole qualifier when he played against uh, Mihai. If there are any gaps in your walls here, these Hussars are going to wreck you. And Barls has to be so careful. I think right there, Stark is realizing he can't get through. So he'll take the Rats and Archers. He will go for the Houses. 
This is where the Trebor needs to start for Barls because he's got all his army forward. Here come the Trebs here. Barls will lose this castle. Barls will lose that gold. The Hussars are breaking through. If they break through, Barls could have some real problems. A lot of his economy is back here. And he seems distracted. It did seem like that house could maybe have gone down. Maybe not, though. Now we need defense from Stark. He doesn't have heavy cab archer. He doesn't have chemistry, even. I think he's planning on using his trebs in defense here. Cab archers can help against the halbs. The Rattan archers could be an issue, but the Rattan archers are not elite. And Barl's being distracted elsewhere, running into the castle fire because he's about to lose his villagers here. And Stark is still here. And Stark is still here. And there is a very good chance that we are going to see a game five if Stark continues this patient play. This is crazy. Again, it's, there's no elite rats and archer. There's not a lot of ranged units out here. These cab archers from Stark can, can really win him this fight. And his Treb has additional range. But maybe have enough firepower there to take down the Trebs here from Barls. Look at Barls. Bring in more units quickly. Chemistry is now on the way for Stark. Stark needs gold, by the way. He's, he only has this for gold income, and maybe there's something else. He's going to roll his Trebs over here to break through. He's still holding. His castle's being repaired, though, and it's really close to going down. And Barls always has just enough to defend here. The Skirms will be great. The Hussars are going to be great. More repairs. More Hussars. Hold on, folks. Hold on. What's happening? The Trebs have to back away here. The Trebs for Barls. Go down. God, man. I mean, chemistry is such a nice tech here. That extra damage is going to be so helpful. And Stark isn't finished yet, guys. He's going to hold. And actually, if he could wheel these Trebs back home, he could just take this castle out then. I think Elite Rats and Archer was queued up somewhere. I just saw a bunch of resources disappear for Barls. Maybe he got Halb. He queued up Halbs. No, no, no. Elite Rats and Archer is going to be in queue. And, but he doesn't have many of them. He doesn't have many skirms either. He really doesn't have an anti-archer unit on the field right now, which is a wild thing as the Vietnamese. And it makes sense because like he he prepped for Hal because that's pretty much all Stark, all Stark had was Hussar. But what a fun game. Also, this Hussar will maybe eventually break through. I'll keep you updated. I saw that blinking on the mini map. Stark needs to win this game, right? This this has to be a win. Going down 3-1, Barros is too good. It would be really difficult to come back and win the series then. And, you know, Barros, he's taking a fight that is more than fine for him here. He's still killing units with these halves. And actually, he's freeing up population space for his rats and archers, which he needs the most right now. And his trebs are stacked, and they will go from this hill to, to hit the, the trebs from Stark. And Stark will lose every single one. Barros will only lose two. And even though Stark has some gold on the right side, I am wondering, can he deal with the composition the Vietnamese have? It feels like Hal, Ratan Archer, is so strong. And Stark doesn't have as many defensive castles. Stark can't take this stone. Stark isn't maxed out. He doesn't have heavy Cav Archer. You can see Barls, he just will occasionally micro down the Cav Archers here with his range units. I think this comp is unkillable. I think Halb, Rats, and Archer is just the ticket. Trebs, though, I mean, secretly, silently, not really secretly, these Trebs back here have been chipping away at the Trebs from Barls. So that's good. Still lots of gold income for Stark on the neutral golds. Maybe Barls runs out of gold. Vietnamese do have a pretty cool tech available called Paper Money if they've been running out of gold. They receive some gold income from their... Uh, from their lumberjacks. This Hussar got through. I'm not sure how, but it did. <laughs> and wow, <laughs> I mean, Stark is still holding. <laughs> I, I love Stark's... Stark's uh, ability to stay alive in games is wild. You know what hurts him, though? This was supposed to be his gold. Arles has been taking it this whole time. That is really bad. I guess it kind of evens out the gold situation then because of the neutral gold that Stark has been taking on the right. Uh, hold on. Trebuchet's exposed for Barls. He'll lose it. He's wheeling his Trebs over here to take that castle. Stark has to deal with this. 
I don't know if he has the army count. The army count has been the issue. He has to consistently back away from these halbs. If he does not, he could lose the, the cav archers. And then the rats and archers are better than the cav archers at this stage with these upgrades. The villagers are going in for the trebs. Stark is desperate. It's actually going to work. He's going to take one treb. The rest of the villagers come to repair. So clearly Stark feels like if he loses this castle, he will lose the game. The villagers continue to box down the trebs. And he, I mean, is castle still up? More Hussars can come in, maybe? I mean, the Villagers are still there. They're, they're, they're the ones that have the secret. But, oh, man. just there's just there's This is the golden come for Stark. These Villagers aren't mining gold anymore. And there's so many pointy boys from Barls all the time. He's been so consistent. Stark trying to raid now, trying to break through. Actually, is a little Halb raid there from Barls, which might catch up to Stark. Stark has never been able to get over 50 army. It's always been about 40, and Barls has been at 70 with consistency. And these trebs are still standing. I mean, Rats and Archers are just such a good unit, man. It was such a nice decision to go that instead of Cav Archer. I know Vietnamese Cav Archers can be tempting too, but it just made sense once he got his, his castle set up. Maybe one more big fight from Stark. He's going to wait till he's fully popped here. 200 pop. He has no gold income. He is trebbing down this castle right now. We'll see if that stays up. Big engagement. Really bad start to the engagement for Stark. He's trying to ensure that his Hussars are on the front. Hoping the Cav Archers kill the Halbs. And then, you know, the Hussars could deal with the Ratans. But it's just Halbs do way so much damage. And then the Rats and Archers do not die to Cav Archers. Sappers now for Stark. So they recently changed that. So villagers do more damage against uh, Siege after Sappers. So Stark reads his patch notes. And here he goes again. He didn't have Sappers before. He has it now. He takes another Treb. How is he not dead yet? <laughs> I, I, Dude, I, I've been loving Stark's play here. He killed two, tre two more Trebs with Bills. And he's still tre going to treb down this castle. He can get gold. He still has 70 on food, guys. His eco is insane. But can he kill the army? Can he keep this castle up? I just... I do not think this castle stays up. But now, this, this area is kind of exposed. And maybe Stark can try and raid there. Stark's still not giving up this position. What a player, man. 1990, it's more damage against rams, but trebs have ram armor. Okay, cool. Well, in my mind, right, thank you for the specifics, but in my mind, I think, does it help against siege? If the answer is yes for most, that, that that's fine for me. But, yeah, I imagine they share the same type of armor. Why no skirms from Stark? Well, so think about it this way. Skirmishers, they do... Uh, Skirmishers against a unit like Ratan Archer, which actually he's probably going to click Elite Skirm here shortly because he's running out of gold. But Skirmishers don't do all that well against Ratan Archers, in my opinion. I think that Ratan Archers, because of their tankiness, are still going to take decent enough trades there. Sometimes when you're fully teched, you just need to YOLO it with what you've got. Now, I do think that when as gold becomes a problem, that mixing in Skirms is something we'll see from him. But Stark, for now, he's going to try and do his best with this comp. The Cav Archers will also do more against the Halbs than the Skirms will, at least in some ways. But he really has struggled. He doesn't have enough Cav Archers. So I do actually, the more I think about it, like Skirm. Because if he had more range units here, this could be better. Oh my god, look at that fight. Bad day to be a horse. He just brute forces his way into that fight. Loses. I mean, all the Hussars died. Most of the Halbs died as well. But Stark refuses to freaking quit here. He's got two traps now. But Barrels has not allowed uh, Stark to take this gold. He was just on that with the raid. His rats and archers shred the traps. Barrels will have relic number four. I saw a monk walking with a relic. Yeah, this guy. So he'll have four relics. Plus he has access to paper money, which gives him gold from chopping trees. Barls has the perfect late game setup with his castles now. He's got castle here, 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 here. The only thing he's missing is a castle on this side. And honestly, I think he'll do it 
within the next 30 seconds. It'd feel very natural to drop that castle. And, uh... Yeah, Stark needs to find some type of way to get some damage done. And, and I think with all these castles, it's going to be extremely difficult. There's Elite Skirm now. But Stark has not been, been killed yet, right? I think that killing blow may come soon. Stark's done an amazing job fighting here. I think if... I think if he would have been able to deny this castle... Like, this castle was so risky from Barls. If that castle gets denied, the rest of the game changes. Barls got a really nice castle up in Castle. He then placed another one before Imp. Played into the Wrath and Archers, the Halbs, everything. And he's kind of feeling like he can do no wrong from this stage. There's a castle on the left. Protects what's left of the gold. Even getting some light cap into Stark's economy, finally. Finally, he's killing villagers. And actually, having said that, Stark has killed 100 villagers and only lost... Uh, sorry, Barls has killed 100 villagers and only lost 50, which is really impressive. And his light cab are going to go through and snipe the only trap that Stark had remaining. Stark sees this castle. He tries to deny it, and Barls quick walls it. That's insane that he notices that. But he does because he's Barls and because he's hidden cup 5 quality. And now the pop for Stark will start to go down. The Skirm Edition will see won't contribute all that much. The buildings are even going down. Barls could go elephants with this economy. 5,000 gold? He could still get the fifth relic, too. Crazy hold from Barls. Crazy play. He's such a good player. And maybe Stark could have gone for the heavy Cav Archer upgrade. It always felt like he never had the resources floating, but that can happen sometimes when you're queuing Hussars. Because heavy Cav Archer... The 500 gold's not that crazy. The 900 food is crazy. When you're making Hustlers, sometimes you just don't realize. Round 2. Villager, or round 10, actually, as villagers go to box down the traps. But I don't think it'll happen this time. And I think Barls is about to go 3-1 up here. Which means Stark would have to win 3 straight to win the series. I actually think the games have been really competitive, really close. It almost doesn't feel like a 3-1. Every game has gone to Imp here, and every game has been so wildly unique. Both from the maps, but even on some of the maps where you think the gameplay might be similar, we've had very different approaches. This was an epic one, and one where I think we just saw the power of the late game of the Vietnamese. I said that in the Dark Age. This is a civilization that feels like they have more bonuses flowing for them in the late game. Stark finally realizes, Stark finally taps out, calls the GG. Again, we've got three more potential games. But if Stark loses one more, Barls will be one of the main event players in Hidden Cup 5, and he will qualify. A fun one, man. A fun one. And I'm curious on how the next few games go. I, 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 just, I don't know. I have, usually with a 3-1, you say, okay, well, Barls is probably going to do this now. But honestly, while that's still the case, the games have been closer than a 3-1, and Stark has been close in a lot of these games. He was even closer at the winning... In game two than he was here. He had some really solid play here. He's not playing bad at all. Love this series. And I want more games just for more entertainment. Of course, we have another series after this one then too. But uh, yeah, there's the KD for Barls. Just took really good trades. I really think the key though, like Stark had such good control over the game. This castle. Like right now, if Stark moves forward right away with this army, this gets denied. And it doesn't just get denied, but it's at 50%, and then he loses a lot of stone. He loses this hill against Tatars. Like, this castle was so risky from Barls, and so many players don't place it because it's risky. It, it's like, honestly, on paper, it's really bad. <laughs> they would place it here. But then if they place it here, then they never get access to these resources. And this castle stood... At the end of the game. Like, this castle started it all. It started the Ratsun production. It gave him that position for the stone and gold. And, yeah, I think that's what Stark will look back to. And that's just... That is what's so amazing about this game. It is also what sucks about this game. Because one moment, and it's like, ah, I screwed up once and I lost. It wasn't really a screw-up, but there's so much depth and there's so much timing involved in it. And that's why we have so many people watching today. So, thank you guys very much.
thank you guys very much for um for being here and watching and and appreciating this game that's uh you know nine years ago i was told was a dead game and that i should stop playing and uh here we are so welcome thank you Bowley. For the prime sub, thank you guys. Thank you, Ziggin, for the new sub as well. Thank you, Medi Wheeler. Odoa, thanks for the 47 months, my friend. Good to be back. Uh, that Wasabi, rooting for Stark. I think there's a lot of people rooting for Stark right now, dude. We're going to have Gold Rush next. That could be good for Stark. But um, but yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to have as many people watching right now on Twitch. And I haven't checked YouTube numbers. But we have quite a few people watching on YouTube as well. So if that if that's um, something that you guys preferred, feel free to toss it up over there. Streaming on YouTube was a good idea. It brought me here and gave you my Prime sub. Sick. And now Red Bull's watching. Red Bull. Red Bull gifting 20 subs. My goodness, Red Bull. Well, thank you for giving us wings. <laughs> no, sorry. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. Huh. Red Bull involved with Hidden Cup. Imagine that. Interesting. Good to know. Thank you, Red Bull. Hope you're doing well, Red Bull. Doc Eagle. Bad timing. Gifting five subs after Red Bull. Don't worry. Red Bull's probably got deeper pockets. But hey, I thank you for the five gifted subs anyways. Let's keep it moving here, guys. Let's hopefully get more games. And then hopefully the final series of the day is also epic after this one. We've got 3-1 right now for Barls. We go to Gold Rush. And again, it's the freaking humans, man. The, 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 the sieve that is so difficult for many people to play with and against. I feel like the last three Gold Rush games we've seen, we've seen humans. Right? We saw um, humans against Spanish yesterday. We saw humans against Portuguese the day before. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, but it's been a theme. And this civilization is almost always going for the second town center in feudal. And then it is just, how do you stop it? Humans also have continued to lose. <laughs> but the games are really close. Like, you can't look at it and be like, oh, they suck. The games are always really close, but people have been able to find a way. Um, but yeah, anyways, thank you again, Red Bull, for, uh, the, for the support. And um, we may see here a little bit more about Red Bull at Hidden Cup at some point, guys. So, main event, 25th through March 3rd. You guys are already here watching live for a qualifier, so I imagine you guys will be there, but just in case you needed to put it on your calendar. Hmm. Okay. Um, someone with a dono here, I to fix, asking about information about the civilizations. Hmm. I'm going to have civ pop-ups for the main event. Uh, on screen, which I think can be more helpful for beginners to to kind of read through bonuses I don't touch on. In general, though, and this is probably going to be the worst thing for you to hear, but get ready for it. I will talk about the bonuses that I feel are really relevant to the game, and if I'm not doing so, I'm probably not doing my job. I will glance over some, but it, most of the time, the best way for you to hear about bonuses in the game is just to listen to me speak, and it's I do my best with that. I think having the Civ pop-ups for the main event is something that we're already going to integrate. I just don't have anything right now. I feel it can be... Um, to have it all the time can be a little too much on screen. So that's kind of my answer, if that helps. So, on that note, humans, fast feudal age. They can build the second town center in feudal, and they can get a massive eco lead. The downside to that is that then they're stuck in feudal. So what we've seen a lot of people do is they've gone for some way of punishing that. Um, but I think one of the best ways of punishing is to go for a castle drop. And it, not just a castle drop, but a unique unit. And the Byzantines have an amazing unique unit. Like, eight-year-old me loved Cataphracts. But I don't know if the Cataphract is really the type of unit to punish. Um, usually you want ranged units, or you want like something that's really strong like gunpowder. So Conquistadors... Uh, Janissaries, uh, Oregon Guns, uh, Hussite Wagons, all those things are strong. You can't really use the Cataphracts in the same way. So the next thing, if you're not going to incorporate a castle, can be some type of forward with Siege and Knights. But again, Byzantine Knights aren't the best Knights. So 
I've got an interesting little prediction here, okay? I think we're going to see, like, a Pike Siege forward here from Barls. And I think Stark... Again, this is next next lever prediction. I'm probably going too far. I think Stark will actually make Feudal Age Army much earlier than the other players have been doing with humans. So, I didn't really shout him out too much. But I've noticed that as you guys are chatting and people are emoting and 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 reacting and complaining and laughing and all the emotions that humans can have. Stark, as I'm casting, was always chipping in with some chat. Like, I could pull up his chat history right now, but when I was casting all these sets this week, Stark's watching, right? And his brain is, is churning and thinking about things. And we just haven't seen people go like archers um, combined with, uh, like maybe archers combined with the TC. And I think We'll see the TC right away, but I wouldn't surprise me at all if he makes Feudal Age Army to just stop the other player from coming forward here. And people are saying that someone lost a boar here. Everything looks fine at Stark's base. Everything looks fine at Barles' base. I think people are getting confused when the TC is shooting to weaken the Rhino. Barles is going fast castle. He has all his food. He's fine. T90, why is Stark the underdog? Mm, because Barls has had a much better couple like, last couple years. Barls has reached greater heights in his tournament results. Good example uh, is an event called Titans League that I host, which has promotion and relegation. And in promotion and relegation, Stark made it to uh, gold, which is 25 through 48 in the world. And he lost like every game, unfortunately, in the group. Like he really struggled there. Um, Whereas, Barls is usually in the top 24 league. So, like that, that's one example. Um, the thing is, Stark has been around a really long time. And his heights to his career were in like 2013, 14, 15. And he doesn't grind the game as much as, as like, you know, other people do these days. But he does still, he is still around and he still plays. But you think of the map pool... Thus far for the qualifiers. We have more classic maps, right? It's three villager start instead of nine villager start, which I don't want to start that whole conversation on what I think is best, but I think three villager start is more pure strategically. Um, you have islands, which is a map that no one else is putting in their tournaments that used to be in tournaments all the time. Gold Rush used to be in tournaments all the time. A lot of comfort maps for Stark. And in some ways... Um, I think that his skill set's also very underrated. So, I I am surprised that Stark beat Dogao. The more I watch Stark play here, I'm not surprised by it. Super solid, man. Super, super solid. Okay, so again, my, my bold prediction was that he would do something to stop the opponent from walking forward to punish this. I think my prediction was wrong. I, I think... It was wrong because he's instead going for walls, which humans get more HP on their walls. This does make sense. He is not showing me any signs that he is going to go for a barracks anytime, anytime soon. Excuse me. It's a bit of an interesting town center. You always want the town center to be on a wood line. Uh, this wood line could have worked. Maybe he felt like it was too exposed from the hill, though, with the siege push. Yeah, you would never want to place the TC beneath a hill. He was already on this wood line. There's berries there. I think this TC is fine. The ideal is if you go for a wood line and a gold, that wasn't an option for him. Okay, so blacksmith market for Barls. Okay, if I had a prediction, I would say he goes barracks still and tries to go spear monk siege push against this. But this is where I think it'd be so strong if you added a barracks. You're guaranteed to have the vill lead now. What players want to do is they want to farm to keep their TCs working. Hey, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's saving for it. Oh, he added a farm. Okay. Oh, he added another farm. Okay. Never mind. Mm -hmm. Someone says two gold spots for Stark, one for Barls. It's good. Barls has this gold. It was not showing on the mini map because of the mining camp and the villagers. 
and they were covered by blue. T90 official, can you predict my future? If I could predict your future, that would be a scary thing. No, I cannot predict your future. I'm sorry. 10 villager lead. No army contest. Nothing to stop these villagers from coming forward here from Stark. But the thing about the Cumans is that that is something that you can still be okay with. Because this two town center boom is so good. We did not have a barracks at all yet from Barls. He knows where his opponent is. He did not see the TC, but I think if he saw... It's a bit weird, but I'm pretty certain he could tell based on the farms and the lumberjacks. And so there's the barracks for the spears. And yeah, this will be monks and siege. So what Tato does, and I think Tato is one of the best players in the world, but also the best human player. Tato, he will stop making farms at a certain point, And he will go barracks, archer range, stable. He will just make army, right? Even like four spears to just try and deny and delay this is really strong. So it's just an approach that I think players are going to need to figure out. Because at the moment, they're they are allowing the player who has to kill them to build these forward buildings. And at the end of the day, it's really just two villagers here. That's it. Okay, so someone says Stark has 200 more resources collected. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you got to pay attention to that, right? It's growing massively. Because right when these vills started coming forward, it was tied. Now it's 700, right? It's the farms. So many farms... So usually by the time the cumans are make their way to castleage, they haven't taken losses. It's like 2,000 more resources collected. Stark did see this. The resources will grow for him. He knows it's spears. He knows it's monks. He knows it's siege. Arles will hop out with a mangonel here. Behind this, Stark is on stone. Now Stark needs to click up the castle. He needs to get there fast. He needs to make sure the TC that he's using to get there stays up and then he needs to build a castle ideally in a spot that protects all these villagers so they don't die this is crazy that's his castle htc okay well i i've been thinking about this more and more a lot of players do this i would never go castle age in this tc but i think the expectation is you don't want to populate this area more right because this is getting attacked you want to populate this area more and you're just going to repair this anyways. So I think a lot of the times you're just going to wait until it, it's almost down to repair it. But if he doesn't pay attention to this, Castle Age will be denied and the series is over. By the way, res collected. Bottom left. 1,300 more resources right now for Stark. Crazy. I, I, I really like this Civ. I get why some people are annoyed by humans because I've playing against them i always die playing with them i always die it's so tricky but the um but the balance of the sieve is so interesting because of the pros and cons of it all like it is it is there's obviously a huge positive dying to vills but this is the negative your base is getting attacked you're gonna have a camel in your base now you're gonna have a freaking night loop on by and you better repair this town center here stark I think Stark will drop a castle right here immediately and then just give up this TC. Yeah, I think right behind the TC. Just right here. It's, it's actually the perfect castle. As perfect as it gets. Oh god, there's knights. It's perfect. Uh, okay, this is not perfect. Build the castle. You gotta build it, I think. Just, oh god, oh god. Okay, there he goes, there he goes, there he goes, there he goes. Now, if the TC goes down, the Siege can actually roll underneath it. Enough spears are here. Castle's on the way up. The Knight's there. The Knight will likely kill a Vill or two. The TC could still very much go down. Behind this, Barls has added TC number two. And it will soon be one TC for Stark and two for him. And he's killed a couple Vills. He's destroyed a lot of... You know, he's disrupted a lot of the eco. And I actually think Barls is kind of in an okay position. A really nice push from him. Because at the you still have Siege and Monks, which is something that Stark has to deal with. 
and all of Stark's villagers are not towards the middle, and Barls is going to build a TC there. Very well executed here from Barls. Well, okay, this is... So, so just to, you know, mini T90 rant for a second. Do you see my point of why I think players need to have a little bit more resistance in Feudal here? Instead of just straight booming on two TCs, the way Tato does it now. Of course, be like Tato. Yeah, be like Viper. Be like Hera. Great suggestion, T90. Just win. Like, I'm not trying to oversimplify it and be, you know, act as though it's easy. But I do think that a little bit of feudal age aggression right around the time that forward's going to happen is really strong. TC's going to go up. Thank you, Swiss Kiwi. With, for the 31 months, who said, you got this Stark. Big Stark fan in chat. Stark's only TC is now being attacked. Any Kipchak fans out there? Or Kipchak haters? It has not been a good tournament for Kipchaks. <laughs> no one gets bloodlines on them. And I... I <laughs> it bothers me so much. You have 40 HP on Kipchaks. You need to get bloodlines to add that extra 20. If you get hit once by that siege, you are going to have a rough time. The stable is there. You've got to think the upgrade will come in, but Stark might be too focused. Too distracted. Barl's 52 villagers. He has a TC up in the middle gold area. He's also going to start to outpost the sides because it is likely that Stark may choose to escape to the middle. We've seen this in other games, guys. If you've watched other qualifier games, you'll remember that players will like to escape and build castles and TCs on these golds. And look at this vision with the Byzantines. It's a sick, crazy vision. You cannot be surprised as the Byzantines. Like, look look at Stark. This is the point of view of Barls. It feels like it's all visible. And, well, Monk goes down there. Stark's going to move through this way. I love the outposting from Barls. Devotion now from Stark. Interesting technology to see. We'll resist some conversion now. I would prefer bloodlines, though. <laughs> I 40 HP on the Kip checks. It, it's so low HP. Oh, boy. And now a castle here from Stark, who had the villager lead at one point, but doesn't anymore. Or, sorry, he still does, but he won't for much longer. This feels very dangerous. <laughs> this is a very dangerous situation right now for Stark. Desperately wants this second castle. Micro! Ugh. Ah! God, they're so weak. It's still kind of weak with bloodlines. It's the damage output that's strong. I don't think he knows he doesn't have it. Or maybe he's not able to think about it. Honestly, though, if you see this castle go up if you're Barls, I think a castle here, idling all your TCs. Wow, great shot. And then going up to Imp with the cheap Byzantine's Imperial Age is the right play. And you might have an issue of how you defend an all-in. But if the castle's up, it's very hard to ever take down in Castle Age. At home... Man, what a sick job from Barls. He's made this look so easy. You have to have the perfect amount of pressure. And then you also need to have the attack. And also, look at this. He knew. He knew Stark would maybe escape. Now, he didn't actually see the Vils. Ooh. But he will with this outpost. I wonder if Stark will take that stone. Big fight as the Kipcheks run forward. The Siege being out of position. The Lightcap kill the Monk. Kipcheks going in to kill the Monk. Siege! Not hitting. Kipcheks getting some nice kills. And they are still very weak themselves, though. And Stark runs right through some shots. And that is... I don't know if that's worth it, man. The Campbells are so cheap for Byzantines! 40 HP per Kipchak! Would Bloodlines have helped? I don't know. Now, hold on a second. Stark is making a run for it. And somehow, he has evaded Barls. <laughs> it's, what's wild is, guys, what's so epic about this, as the Kipcheks continue to die, is that Stark knows it's Byzantines and saw this. So he was extra sneaky. Now he gets bloodlines. Well, there was blood, all right. Um, well, Lightcap now. I mean, this is all in Castle Age from Stark. And this is definitely going to be Imp. 
from Barls. And Stark will know this. I don't think you can go imp yourself. I think you have to get as many upgrades as possible and try and make things messy here. It's difficult to surprise Barls, though, because Barls will see this every single step of the way. Everywhere you go, Barls has vision, except for, well, here. But even still, that's still just a couple villagers on gold. Also, another thing is, like, Barls at home, look at the defensives. If he feels as though he needs to defend here, he can just add more buildings. And he's making more camels now, which should still be pretty solid. And he didn't have upgrades before. He can get upgrades now. Stark's villagers are just going to continue to build TCs on this gold. Does get interesting if Stark gets through here. I thought Barls was going to drop buildings there. There might be a temptation for him to drop a castle at home right now. I think you have to fight that temptation and build the castle somewhere in the middle. He's actually going to walk to the hill. That's interesting. Some light cab and a knight get through from Stark, who is making things very messy. The Kipchak's got some kills. Barls does not know. No, he just encountered that TC with the monk, actually. That monk that was going out there saw this. And so he will build that castle. That is a really good castle. Barls still doesn't see this TC from Stark. I love Stark, dude. And he just goes through. <gasps> Boom! Big shot to kill two. But I, I really do love how, how Stark is, is going all in here. He's such a fun player, man. And he's got such a big army at the moment. The worry is... He's not going to have gold. He's not going to have his castle soon if he doesn't find an answer to drop. Oh! Like I said, I love Stark. Big Stark fan right here. Stark says, fine. Go ahead. Take my base with Trebs. And I'm going to raid your eco because everything you're doing is to protect the middle of the, of the map. Stark has 105 villagers as well. He's got a ton of kip checks. This castle makes life so awkward for Barls. Barls has to buy a new castle, which is really good play. And actually, I got so excited. Now I'm like, oh, kind of like crap, you know? <laughs> I think it's going to be tough for Barls to make trebs everywhere, though. Like, trebs aren't cheap. So I guess he'll be trebbing this castle for now. And maybe this castle. But it's not like he has a ton of resources. Stark also is bringing Vils to mine the gold that started at the base of Barls. Because he can. And there's nothing Barls can do about it. Here Stark's TC is going down. He does still have this TC though. And he does still have this gold. And that is a lot of Kipchaks. This many Kipchaks will kill the camels too. But this TC will go down. There should be a treb here at some point. But there's not. Because the treb from Barls has to deal with this castle first. You do have to be careful if you're Barls because Stark might go capped ram in Castle Age, which the humans can do. And also could use these light cap to kill these trebs. Barls needs to have his quick wall fingers ready. Stark's eco is completely untouched because of this, guys. Such a sick job from him to to turn to give himself a chance here. Look, capped ram in Castle Age. I mean, the, only the humans can do it. Just like the Feudal Age TC, only the humans can do it. The camel number is not big for Barls. His food eco is completely... is a complete disaster because of all this army here in the castle. And he could lose Vils. He should lose Vils to this. He, he can only use villagers, actually, to attack that ram. Man, if there was just one more ram for Stark. Nice job from Barls. Back in the TC he goes. Castle will go down here. TC number two in the middle will go down. So now no TCs in the middle for Stark. There's three castles for Barls and Stark is gonna... He just ran through with Vils. And Stark is gonna build another TC on the gold. And yeah, this is actually a really good one too. And he's now on the way to Imp. He's now on the way to Imp. The economy for Barls took some hits here with these attacks. His eco was so idle. He still has so many idols. And still, it, it feels like these Kipjacks are so good once you get that mass of them. Oh, God. TC is going to be denied here and trapped down anyways. Nice job from Barls. He's getting imp armor on his camels. He needs more food so we can just make more camels. Camels and trapped. <gasps> Stark, you animal. Stark snipes the trap with the Kipjacks and keeps this alive. This guy's amazing, dude. The Stark hype is real. 
And he also sees the traps and he runs through and Barrels does not have the army to protect this. What a crazy, crazy play from Stark. This is, this is unbelievable, man. I mean, he's lost, what, three TCs in the middle? He continues to be found. Still is taking good engagement somehow. And I still think he could be in a really bad spot. The Byzantines have really cheap units, but let's see how these camels do now. Camels will should shred the Kipchaks if, when they're hitting them, but the Kipchaks do enough damage to maybe get some kills. I say maybe now. The Imp Armor and Heavy Camel paying off massively for Barrels. And Stark is just ratting it out. He's going to go Pikes now, which makes sense. But I do worry anytime a player goes Pikes against the Byzantines and the Byzantines have this many castles. Because the Byzantines already have the cab upgrades in this instance, and they have four castles then to produce the Cataphracts. And they certainly are going to have the gold to make the Cataphracts. And Cataphracts combined with um, Camel is really tough for the humans to stop. Finally, this TC will go down. Nice job from Barls. Stark makes it to Imp. And he is going to go for a Ram push while he still has time because he knows it's bad. If Barls can close this out, Barls will join the main event of Hidden Cup. He'll be one of the 16 main event players playing on hero names. And honestly, he'll be kind of hard to spot because he's just... He doesn't have like a specific thing that he does, which stands out to me. He is just so solid overall, all the time. He's going to be a real threat. And here come those rams. Now this is against a Byzantine castle. But there's still, there's still rams there. Mm, Trebs going for this castle as well for Stark. Stark has no gold. Stark has no gold. Stark has no relics. He will not take the castle. Barrels will hold. Barrels has all the gold too. And the GG's called a really fun series, man. A really fun series. And honestly, I, as, as excited as I am about Barrels making in the main of Hidden Cup, I am also very excited to see Stark and Ganji now tomorrow because Stark still has that second chance qualifier against Ganji. That series is looking more and more exciting to see who also joins Hidden Cup, but... Congratulations to Barrels. Salutes to him. And listen, when I looked at the bracket, Barrels was my favorite to go through. And that's what the best players do, right? They they deliver the level that you expect from them. And this was a really nice job from him to punish the humans. I felt like the push did just enough. His eco behind this was just good enough. And then also, there were multiple instances where Stark made this extremely messy today. And Barrels was able to put out the fires. That is a skill. That is not an easy thing to do. The sneak villager on quarry. The, uh, you know, this game here with the, the TCs somehow going up when many players would never do that. Just really impressive stuff. So never bet against Barrels. Never bet against the Byzantines. Barrels joins the main event as uh, one of our main event players. And we have four more spots now, guys. Actually, we, we have 12 names. Already, uh, the next series is going to be Sebastian versus Baba Rum, which should be epic and completely different storylines there. But then we'll have the, again, the losers from all these sets playing against each other on the final day on Sunday. Well played to Barrels. I don't know if he's out there. And guys, because these days have been so long, I, I decided against doing interviews, um, which, so, so that would just tack on another. I can't stop talking. That would tack on more time. So we'll, we'll try and take a break here. Move on then into our final series of the day, which is going to be Sebastian against Baba Rum. A show of hands from anyone in chat who wasn't expecting to see Baba Rum in a best of seven to qualify for Hidden Cup 5? Me. A lot of hands. <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't supposed to happen. He, uh, he is just another crazy story in this qualifier. And is... Uh, yeah, it'll be exciting to talk about. So, congratulations to Barrels. Uh, we should then have a uh, an image here just to show you all the qualified players. Obviously, we have this qualifier. Um, but then we also had the main event players already pre-established. So, this gives you the full list just to really help you envision it. And, yeah, there it is. So, um, is this alphabetical? It's, just un it's unimportant if it's alphabetical. Anyways... 
the biggest names on there uh, on the left hand side some of the players who are invited to the main event and then so far in the qualifier it's very much not alphabetical uh, we have Vinchester, Sito, MBL, Tato, and Barles on the list of qualified players. There's still four more spots to go. All of these players will be playing on one of these names uh, right here. We only have 14 of the hero names there. We have another, we have a vote going on Reddit. Um, okay, so it's like Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, and some others I'm forgetting, Instagram. You can vote on the 15th hero. I believe the 15th hero is going to be Emperor Sigismund. Because that seems to be what people have been voting for the most. But technically, that could be overtaken. It could be one of the other heroes there. And then the final hero is going to be uh, voted tomorrow at the end of the stream. And that's a cheat code. So I'm not going to give you the options yet what the cheat codes are but it would be fun for you guys to to vote for that okay um anyways i need a quick break we'll be back soon the next series should be fantastic thank you again for the support the subs have been insane i did hold on i did promise that i would gift 20 subs if we hit 5k subs today so let me do that first give me a second then i will take my break it's been a fun day the support's been unreal, this qualifier. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. YouTube, I'm not gifting subs on YouTube. I'm sorry, this is just on Twitch. But thanks for watching over there. Um, let's see. Okay, 20 gifted subs. I have gifted 2,376 subs to Team 90 Official's channel. Gift 624 more to unlock your next badge. Well, thank you, Twitch. I'm very excited for that next badge for this T90 official channel. <laughs> give me, give me like a smaller step. <laughs> Only 625 more. I guess at that level, I've already done so much. There you go, guys. Uh, I did not, this is not rigged. I did not choose you guys. Well, no, if you, no, it was just random. I just try not to, you know, piss anybody off here if you didn't get the subs. If you didn't get the subs, say Jodge, you know the deal. And uh, once again, we'll be back soon, everybody, with more Hidden Cup Qualifier action. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Enjoy the tunes. All right, ladies and gents, this just happened. Just now here, playing a 1v1, a mega random. You'll notice, zero on wood, zero on gold, zero on stone. We both start with a Victoria. We don't need wood. Super, super, super strong. And he's like, wait a second. I was getting ahead of the game. Next level strat, I'm buying stone. I'm like, ha, 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 ha. He's gonna have to mine it. Or if he tries to buy it, it's gonna be more expensive. Here I am, little T90. Little naive T90 is so happy. Just feeling so good. Oh, I'm past slate bastard. Just feeling so good. Oh, ha, 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 ha. So here he is, and he sees my Fatoria, and he's like, wait a second. My Fatoria is nice and snug in the back of my face. He's like, wait a second. His Fatoria is in Narnia. Wait a second. His Fatoria is in Narnia. So maybe we're going to do something about that. Guys. He's going for redemption and monks. Okay. Guys. He's going for redemption and monks. And there he is, converting my Fatoria.
Aetoria. Construir, cultivar, degrado, escalar, repilar, 
agora Eu vou buscar, passar, Chopa. construir, cultivar, Chopa. degrado, escavar, remendar Agora Chopa. vou Chopa Ei! The dead tree protects the only access to your phone. Yeah, would be a good idea to build a watchtower on this hill once you advance to the funeral. Yeah, yeah. Build a watchtower. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Would be a good idea to build a watchtower on this hill. Yeah. Would be a good idea to build a watchtower on this hill. Yeah. Would be a good idea to build a watchtower on this hill. Yeah. Would be a good idea to build a watchtower on this hill. Yeah. Don't forget. Keep exploring the map. Build a watchtower. Okay, guys. <clears throat> Thank you for waiting. Sorry that I'm not a robot which runs on electricity and uh, I needed to refuel. Okay? Uh, we should be back in a moment. I actually have to sit here and fix the scoreboard, but I just hope you really enjoy the vocalizer movement at the bottom of the screen. Um, I always try and bring the baddest and the best vocalizer movements to the channel. So enjoy that, because that's cool. <laughs> um, just got to get the scoreboard up, and, and we'll kind of move into it here. Also, question for you all. So many of you may know this, but the player Baba Rum is based on, his name is based on a French comic. And uh, I was given some information by one of my mods, who is a big fan of that comic, and is, is French. And I was kind of curious if you guys would be interested in me showing you that real quick before we dive into the series here. It basically is a, um, here, we'll go to face cam now. Basically, it is a, uh, it is a dessert, but I believe it was a location, and I'm going to pull it up here in just a second. Let me do some stuff. I believe it was actually a location in the comic. Maybe some of you guys know this. I'm gonna, I gotta pull it up and we'll look at it real quick before we dive in, but should be an excellent series. Babo Rum versus Sebastian. Exciting times, man. Exciting times because this is not the series that many people would have expected here. But it is definitely like, it's not actually an established player who's always been top 16 against an underdog. It is actually someone who wants to be an established name. The young gun Sebastian from Uruguay against the you know an, an older more experienced player who hasn't reached these heights before uh who's who's looking to continue this crazy run in um and make it to hidden cup it'd be such a cool addition um all right cool so we should have a draft here for you so let's just look at the draft first and then let me see as we're discussing the draft if we can find what i'm looking for here so there's the draft baba obviously on the left hand side and then we've got sebastian on the right game one's going to be arabia and notable things there, Mayans, Bengalis, Bohemians, Chinese, Hindustanis, Burgundians have seen the ban. 
Armenians, Malay, and Persians, the top three picks for Sebastian, and then Malians, Byzantines, Aztecs, the first three picks for Baba Rum. Okay, so let me see if I can find this. It was Tarzis who told me about this maybe last week. Shoot, I'm totally unprepared. Um, I don't remember where it was said in the Discord by, by Tarzis here. We've had so many discussions. It's a Roman camp in Asterix. Thank you, but there was a map screenshot that I was hoping to show you guys. Uh, maybe I could, maybe it just Google will do it for me. Let's see. Aha. Okay, well, there's a little bit more backstory. Funnily enough, if I search for Baba Rum right now on YouTube, Baba Rum vs. Kingston comes up. Let's go. <laughs> Getting all the Asterix fans. Let's go. Also, you appreciate how the dessert is on the thumbnail. I have the best editors, man. That's so good. Um, so anyways, there's a map, uh, let me see, in the comic, is a Roman camp, you guys are saying? Uh, trying to blow this up. This website is French. The quality is awful. The, the quality of this image is awful, but here you go. Boom, right there. That. Yep, so there you go. That's where, that's where the name came from, or maybe it's a dessert. Because he did have an alt account, which is also based on a different French dessert. So maybe the guy likes his pastries. But um, crazy series here between these two. Again, back to the Civ draft. All the maps are going to have to be played. So there's no disguising. There's no banning. There's no avoiding the maps at this point. There's seven maps here. Already, we've established 12 players who are in the main event. And we touched on that a little bit earlier. But just to do the thing, remind you guys, for the people who just came in. Because some people... Were, Someone just asked, where's Viper at? Why is Viper not playing in this tournament? Well, Viper's already in this tourney. Viper is in the main event. You'll see him to the, uh, yeah, to the left of me, I guess. Uh, and all the other players that are on screen there have now made it to the main event. Once they are in the main event, though, they will not be playing on their names. You will not know them by their name. You will instead see a list of heroes. We've got 14 heroes on screen. We have a vote finishing up on all my socials for the 15th one, which last I checked will be uh, Emperor Sigismund. And then the 16th vote will be voted here on Twitch and YouTube tomorrow. Okay. So that is the, uh, that's, that's kind of the situation at hand. That's how it all works. Main event is February 25th through March 3rd. And you guys are going to freaking be there. I hope. Um, obviously it'll all be on YouTube too, but, uh, let's, let's get the series started here. Thank you for your patience. It's been a long day. I prefer to, to keep moving with the games. The games keep me more energized than the in-between stuff anyways. So, um, I'm gonna load up the Rex. This series was played earlier today for convenience of their, uh, for, like for player preference and whatnot, just making sure they had time to play. Someone did point out that there's a lot of red on the flags um, that of the qualifiers or the people who qualified, but isn't there red in the majority of flags? I guess that would I guess Sebastian doesn't have red in his flag. So no. We'll see if Sebastian can change the trend. <laughs> what's up, Vic? Welcome. Someone said, What's up, brother? All caps. AOE equals best game. Everything else is so boring. Lol. <laughs> What's up, brother? AoE, best game, everything else boring, lol. You tell him. <laughs> you tell him. I like that energy. <laughs> uh, nice to see you, man. Nice to see you. I don't know if it's fair to say that everything else is boring. I don't think we have to go out that far. But uh, compared to Age of Empires 2, there's not many. Uh, there's no game for me that could possibly compare to this one, so. I do think there's a difference for people between playing it and watching it, though, right? Right? I think watching this game is, is fantastic for many of you, but playing it is, is very difficult. And, like, I, I play the game a lot, um, but there are even times for me at my level where I'm just like, man, this, this game is freaking, I don't know, I'm just going to sit down and cast. So I can only imagine how it is for, for, you know, the everyday individual. So, yeah, some people don't like playing at all. Okay, cool. Well, hey, thank you for the substance support. Get your final predictions in. It's going to be game one on Arabia. 
I'm going to dive into the storylines a little bit more during the games. Um, so we can just get right into it. But this is the, the final series today. The loser here still has their second chance tomorrow. But we will have one more name added to the list of players in the main event of Hidden Cup after this series. It should be an epic one. I'm super excited because of the storylines, dude. Like, I... This has been... I, I got to choose somewhat the order of the sets today. And I wanted this to be the final series because I just feel like it's so good for so many different reasons. I hope you feel privileged to be here. And let's do it. Um, someone says, fix your one hair standing out. It's really triggering my OCD. How's this? How's that? Now they're all sticking out. Your OCD is fine now, right? Let's cast. All right, ladies and gents. Welcome to the final set of the day. And this, whoever wins this series will move in to the Hidden Cup 5 main event. There is a very interesting storyline with this one, though. Because for Sebastian, he is the favorite, but he's a player who wants to be in that top 16. A player who's come close to making to that top 16. Many people would say that he is maybe top 16, but he's not established, right? He's not established like the guys who are more experienced and have been around the block and are already sitting in the main event. Sebastian is uh, 22. He's young, he's aggressive, he's immensely talented, and uh, it feels like it is his time. On the other side, we have Baba Oram, a player who is not new. He has been on and off throughout the scene playing. And funnily enough, his best tournament performance was actually three years ago. And he won a tournament which used the Hidden Cup four settings. It was just called Visible Cup. And it was for players that weren't in the main event of Hidden Cup. Didn't see much from the guy in tournaments. I barely see him in ranked. From what I know, he's over the age of 30. He's an engineer. Uh, all the French players I've talked to is like, this guy doesn't care really. I mean, he does care, but like, this isn't his thing. This isn't his dream. He's working a job. He's playing the game for fun. And he beat Nikov. Uh, one of the few, like, full-time age players we have who's, who's, like, a crazy talented player. He beat Nikov in round two. In round three, he beat Kingston, a player who, like Sebastian, is on the younger side and has had some really good performances. So, Baba is, is a player that people have been freaking out about and are really excited about, and here he is. And he's one series win away from being in the top 16 and being one of the main event players <clears throat> in um, Hidden Cup. This is really weird, though. This is the third time we have seen Tatars against Incas on Arabia to start a series. Vinchester Mihai, we saw that. And then also me, uh, it was also Sobek against Sato. And actually, Tatars won both times. It is interesting. Obviously, they're picking sieves and planning things out, but it is a rather specific matchup. Because I wouldn't consider either... Well, Incas I consider top tier. I think Tatars I consider uh, a, a bit below that. But I think what it is, like Sebastian, he's the type of player who's going to win on Arabia. So he drafts very highly for that and values the Incas. And then I think uh, Baba said, well, Tatars are solid enough. But they do have some potential weaknesses. It's good enough for me to get a win. And I'm going to save my sibs for elsewhere. But yeah, I hope that introduction is exciting for you guys because um, I think it's really good for the scene to have different players advancing and having there be upsets. And I also feel like the... I think what's unique to our scene is the just the age difference, right? Like, Baba Rum, 33 or something, and Sebastian, 22. And, you know, there's clearly... And this is part of the reason I love Hidden Cup main events so much, too. There's just difference in styles. Some players are more strategic. Some players are a bit faster and nerdier with the micro. I don't know. It just, it all adds together, flows together, and gets exciting for me. A couple sheep were left behind by Sebastian. As he's gone forward early, he wants to find Baba Raman. This is precisely what you would expect from a player who wants early control and wants to show Baba Ram what's up here. Sebastian... Is going to have three militia in the Dark Age. So it's rare these days to see three militia in Dark Age. Normally, players will click up before they do that. And oh, Baba Rum! Baba Run! Okay, saves the scout, but that is really hurts him. That scout will not be useful at all for anything but scouting intel. So he ran right into the TC. And guys, he has no clue 
that three militia are coming forward with this eagle. This could be devastating. It was already going to be bad because of the scout, but now with the three militia and the eagle here, if he can't quick wall fast enough, if he doesn't realize this, he's going to have to abandon everything. Abandoning everything is actually fine. He's got tons of food underneath the TC. He can get wood elsewhere, but he has to realize right away. And now, now we get to see what's what's his uh, confidence like in these situations. Because the best players actually won't run. They just sit here and they box. For anyone new, they don't actually box in the game. It's a mod. Don't be confused. Okay. Let's see. So he's like, he gives it no respect. See, I, I can't do this. Right? A lot of players would just back away. But he says, nope, sorry. The ping is low enough for me. I can micro this. I'm fine. And we'll see if he's going to be fine because these could be upgraded later and one misstep, he loses a villager. But so far, the militia and the eagle have actually pretty much not done... They've done nothing. The villagers are always ready. It's smart. You pull four vills to one area and then you just go for the four villagers from the bush. And, uh, like, if you split them up, obviously it's a problem, but you just do four vills on one bush so you can fight back instantly. Okay, so there's the stable now for Baba Ram. We knew this was going to happen with all this food with the Tatars that he's going to go scout. His starting scout is weak. So that hurts. If this scout didn't hit the TC, we'd have some major problems here. Could be follow-up militia from Sebastian. He's not on gold just yet, though. Sebastian should know that eventually this army's going to be pretty weak for him. And behind this, he's quite a bit on wood. You're, the expectation is an archer range. I think we'll see a spear or two into archers for him. But so far, impressed with how Baba's been able to deal with that. Again, it just showed some confidence there. I just cannot get over the fact he beat Nikov, he beat Kingston. But, like, a lot of these maps, he had also done so well in Visible Cup three years ago. So, such an interesting thing. This guy does not play the game that much. In fact, I, I wouldn't... If you would have asked me before the qualifier... Well, it's a very specific thing to ask, but if you were to say, is Baba Rum going to sign up? I'm like, I, I probably would have said, I don't think he's playing. Like, I don't think he's playing much. Just maybe when he has more time throughout his day... Or throughout his life, whatever's happening, he'll play. But he is not on the grind like everybody else is. Scouts, they're going to run through here. Okay. Sebastian hoping to get walls down. Does have the spearmen. And Sebastian's just going to sit on this house for now. No archer range. No, excuse me. Does have the archer range. And archer needs to get forward there. Sebastian actually bringing this spearman back. Because he knows this move with the archer is a little bit risky. And they'll probably meet up and get to the house to keep applying pressure there. More Spearman from Sebastian. Great defense from him so far. Baba hasn't taken any additional hits, though. And this is where this level defense gets a bit tricky for you. Because you cannot repair that house anymore. This archer can now kill that villager slowly. And having been on the other end of it, Sebastian loves to do this type of thing. And it just slowly snowballs on you. And skirmishers are going to be needed. Villager needs to be pulled away. And replaced with another villager. And there you go. Scouts still moving forward. Six scouts here for the Frenchman. And skirms are going to be on the way. But he needs to do the same thing he just did. He needs to pull this villager away again. He pulls the villager away again. Really good stuff. And then if you ever do that, then this spearman's going to go after you because of Sebastian's micro. Wow, Sebastian's going to have the walls down too. Crazy stuff. But really nice defense here from Baba Rum as well. Look at how many sheep he still has because of the Tatars. It's really sick. Wow, these guys are so good. No real miss plays, right? Very easy for a villager to go down, a scout to go down. Here, like the archer. How fast does Sebastian react? Mm, actually, I don't know if this fight is good for Baba. It's a great fight. I, I'm kidding. It's an amazing fight. <laughs> the spearman got cleared. And 6-1 on the KD. Wow. There's just so much army out here from Sebastian. He thought he was going to find the value from it. And Baba's going to take this fight. And, and this should be better value 
or Sebastian just because he killed those three scouts. Okay, I think this is time to clear the air, okay? So, here's what happened. So, when I was casting Baba, I think in round two, I knew he was from Asterisk, and I thought I was going to get credit for that. I thought people were going to be like, Wow, an American knows Asterisk. Because, like, if I mention, uh, you know, Premier League or La Liga or any type of, like, football, right? People are immediately like, uh, whoa, American knows ball kick. You know, people are very judgmental, all right? Because of where I'm from. So I thought I was going to get credit for even knowing it. And you guys didn't really give me... Uh, okay, now I mispronounced it. But it was unintentional. Calm down. Okay, so I didn't... I... Let me finish my thought, chat. Let me finish my thought, okay? So I thought I was going to get credit. And some people gave me credit. And then I made the mistake of saying it was somewhat niche. And a lot of people were like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not niche, okay? And I thought it was because I, I did my research. As an American, very niche, okay? Not well known here. So again, I was hoping for some credit. Looked it up, looked at some numbers, very much not niche, okay? So I apologize for using the word niche about your, your favorite comic, okay? Anyways. Um, so I, I just wanted to clear the air here, game one. Villager finally goes down. Could be another villager who goes down here, actually. And, well, it's not too bad. One villager down and Castle Age for Baba. Who, uh, I, he may have based his name on the actual French dessert. Because he had another name he would play on called Tarto Pum. I'm not sure if you guys can tell me what Tarto Pum is, but... Tarto Pum, I was told, was another dessert. And, uh, wow, I mean, still some weak villagers here. He has to abandon the woodline, but he has defended so far. He will have a much better castle age time than Sebastian. Sebastian is considered the favorite here and also the better Arabia player. Okay, apple pie, cool. All right, good to know. I actually need to tell my dad that there's a player based on that comic because he's the one who had it in my house growing up. But it was all in French. Um... I imagine they probably sell English versions, but we never had them. Man, there, there's a lot of weak vills around here, and it, it could all turn around really quick. <laughs> there's no upgrades on these skirms, so they can't hit the archers. And Sebastian's like, dude, get your upgrades, or I'm just going to nerd out behind here. All right, good to know, guys. Good to know. But anyways, I wanted to, I wanted to apologize. I was incorrect. I do still, my comparison was, so here in the States, Calvin and Hobbes isn't near as popular as some other comics. And Calvin and Hobbes is the greatest comic of all time, in my opinion. It's my favorite. And uh, so I, I thought Calvin and Hobbes was niche, but upon my research, I think that Calvin and Hobbes is more niche than, than uh, Asterisk is. Asterix. Sorry. But yeah, watch, uh, don't watch Calvin and Hobbes. Sorry, read Calvin and Hobbes if you get the chance. Maybe it's just nostalgia for me. There is a wolf chasing the spearman. I will keep you updated. We may have a kill from Gaia here. Faster Castle Age from Baba. Very impressive. He didn't use the market for that time either. And he will go Step Lancer. He will go Knight. He's hoping these skirms can find kills on the archers. But Sebastian backs away. And Sebastian's going to have a big ball of crossbow, which isn't awkward to use anymore because of the patch the devs gave us for the qualifier and the main event. The units are not regrouping horribly. And still, we'll keep you updated. Wolf is very hungry. I think needs three more hits. Ooh, it depends on if there's a hill involved or not, actually. Downhill hit, downhill hit, downhill hit. Nice micro. You move. Here go the archers. Now, Sebastian's always been a really good archer player, so he will be really happy about that patch that we're using. And eagles in front can kind of be helpful, but it is pretty much just the crossbows there. And this spearman is going to... die. And then over here, we've got the attack from Baba. But he's never going to break through here. Nice job from Sebastian to drop the houses. And now a big attack from Sebastian, and he just camped right next to this town center here from Baba. But we already have Siege from Baba Ram. So I, li I like how Baba's played this. Like, 
I think the Incas, their units are so cheap. Their economy is so good. They should always have the lead in this game. I think Incas are... I actually think Incas will be nerfed after Hidden Cup at some point. I don't know what the dev's priorities are, but I think they're at that level of strength. Attack rounds, maybe? On the Eagles? In front? Boom! Nice attack round. The Tatars, I've always felt like, are in a pretty solid spot balance-wise. They're not too strong. They're not too weak. Which basically means, you know, like, 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 balanced. And, you know, some of the other civs seem to have some crazy peaks to them right now. But it is a good point. The Incas have lost this matchup twice. So, who, who knows? Like, maybe the data suggests the Incas are not actually as good as I feel. And other people seem to feel. And pretty sure every player in this event will agree with my statement on the, the way the matchup plays out. A three town centers... Baba Ram. I mean, guys, it was not a fluke, the level that he brought in the earlier rounds, and he is playing super clean. Immediate three TCs. Onto the sheep very nicely, using the Tatar bonus. Has knights, has siege, defended from the crossbow timing, which is normally very strong. But now we're going to have... Oh, man, we're going to have redemption monks. This is incredibly early from Sebastian. I do not know why it is Tatars against Incas so many times so far in the Deciders. I'm, I, I, my explanation before was Incas are seen as really top tier, so the players who are favored on Arabia will go for that. And then Tatars are kind of solid, but they're not insane. So the other players will try and go for them to hope to get a win and save some of their other sits for elsewhere. We've got Knights to get through. Look at the damage control from Sebastian. He actually, this could have been worse for him, but he housewalled everything here. He also killed two knights on the front there. Possible those were actually deleted if Baba Ram thought they were going to be converted. And then he doesn't know that Redemption's in. And Redemption gets the conversion immediately. So the knights are kind of trapped in here for Baba. There will certainly be more monks and crossbows from Sebastian to deal with this. And now how do you stop this push? Seems brutal. Another knight has to get deleted because of these monks. We might actually see a stable get converted here. There's a lot of warrior hype. Knight almost gets converted. Here we had two conversions. This is insane play from Sebastian. Look at the resources collected. Look at the idle TC time for Sebastian. The KD doesn't even tell the whole story because of the conversions he's gotten. This kid's insane, man. I know that people want to root for the underdog and the crazy storyline of Baba Rum here, but Sebastian is the favorite for a reason, and he is just smothering his opponent with pressure right now. The thing about Sebastian, guys, is that he used to be wildly aggressive, and he didn't have the economy behind it. Um, he used to play under another name called Su Call Me Subutai, he used to play as, two or three years ago. In fact, if you look at some of my YouTube uploads, you will see Call Me Subutai in some games. He changed his name maybe two years ago to Sebastian. And um, he's, he's just improved massively every year. I have to say, man, this monk and the other monk, kind of unfortunate not to get more conversions. But heavy on stone here is Baba as he's trying to hold on. I mean, maybe he can drop a castle somewhere. This feels really tough. Look at his eco, right? His eco is flying behind this as well, which is really what the best players do. Big shot is needed here, and a really important castle for Baba Ram. You might actually see Sebastian go for a forward castle. A knight he converted earlier is still around. A knight he converted earlier is going back here too. Stable could be converted. These other monks are going for conversions. How are you supposed to be able to defend from this? This is so much all the time. The siege gets converted again. Knights need to be dealt with. The stable is still being converted. The stable's converted. Is he going to make one? The Incas cannot build stables. But if you convert one, you can make a Zalata warrior, which is a little bit like an Easter egg. And he's making them. He wants knights for the siege. Zalatos are on the way. Also, in some ways, I think it sends a message to your opponent. Right, if you're getting Zalatled, you're not feeling too good about things. And more conversions happen for Sebastian. He backs away. And here is our first Zalata Warrior in the Hidden Cup qualifiers. Maybe the only Zalata Warrior. Look at them. By the way, they're awful. 
they're they're really bad. You can't get armor. You can't get bloodlines. So it's really not the best. Oh, don't castle his stable. Okay, well, Baba Rum's... He's going to get rid of the stable here. But they are beautiful. Yeah, they are beautiful. And it is a raiding tool that right now Sebastian really needs. And you might be wondering, T90, what do you do against this pressure? Well, Elite Skirm would have been really helpful. There were Skirms for Baba Rum, but he lost them. I think, like, because everything's so smooth for the Incas, it's really hard to stop them from getting to, to the Eagles as well, then. I think Sebastian has played this game near perfect for Arabia. And the Eco's been good for Baba Rum, but he has not been able to find engagements. The Redemption choice was so good. Everything came in so early for Sebastian. Tatarzalotl? Oh, that would have been interesting. Is it the rarest unit in AOE2 regular play? I think these are more common than War Elephants for the Persians. <laughs> I I think I have seen, in 1v1s, I think I have seen more Zolata Warriors than War Elephants for the Persians. <laughs> it, it happens more frequently just because the elephants are so expensive. Siege Tower? Nah, Siege Tower is fairly common. Throwing Axemen happens. Flaming Camels still happens. That's a good that's a that's a good point though. Maybe it is really rare. So right now you're just kind of hoping if you're Baba Rum that this aggression from Sebastian, oof, big shot, is all very all in. And that there's not a an amazing eco setup on the back of this. But unfortunately, as Sebastian splits away from the TC fire, the eco setup for Sebastian is absolutely unreal. Sebastian has a castle at a position for Trebs. Sebastian even has more crossbows over here. And this this patch, which has brought back crossbow play and just, you know, units not regrouping in general, has led to Sebastian's micro and army control that just look perfect here. He's played the perfect game to start off the series. And the GG's called. Baba Ram has no fight in him there. And this is completely over at this point. We were going to see a big eagle switch, a big treb push. Vabaram was not really able to field much military there at that point. I mean, redemption monks, it's it's not uncommon. But the timing in which Sebastian did that was, was just crazy to me. Because he had so many crossbows. And then he also got redemption. It was those two monks that moved forward. And then it, the rest really fell apart there. I do think, though, in terms of peak potential, Babaram recognizes the strength of the Incas. And I think that he will feel as though Arabia is going to be the toughest map for him against a player like Sebastian. So when you draft, you're just not valuing this map as heavily. And that is the silver lining here. That on some level, this was never even part of the plans. Like, look at where these... Well, actually, Tatars were picked pretty high. Pretty much on par, I guess, with the Incas. So maybe that's really good for Sebastian. But it wasn't like a high priority pick for him at all. Inca's maybe being left too late in the draft, too, man. I, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what the Civ data says. The Civ data has been really interesting so far for the qualifier. All right. Um, so if I'm Baba Rum, I'm taking this kid off of water, right? I'm not going for uh, Slopes, which is uh, pretty much just a land map, which is going to have very similar aspects to Arabia. Did I say am I taking did I say I'm taking this kid off of water or did I say I'm taking this kid off of land? I don't remember what I said. But anyways, my thinking is go to water. Okay, I said water. I, I'm saying go to islands, right? And make life awkward for Sebastian. That's what I would do. Because I would lack confidence against Sebastian on land. So that's where my brain goes. But Baba Rum says confidence. I've got it. Yes. Now, very interesting here. Um, we have game two, and, and again, I just pointed out that this must show that Baba Rum's confidence because that was pretty much a, a stomp in game number one. And uh, where's this? Where's Sebastian's scout? Oh, it's over here. For I'm sorry, guys. I'm losing. It's been a long day. I thought that his scout didn't spawn. <laughs> uh, okay, let me complete my point. So, um... Anyways, you know, with how the first game went, 
I personally would be feeling very uh, bad. I, I would feel completely overwhelmed. But there was the Civ matchup, which again, I felt a certain way about. And then also, Babaram, he's now gone for the Khmer, which is a Civ that he's played insanely well on with this map. We saw Tato play the uh, Khmer on this map earlier, but Babaram played Khmer against Nikov, and he also played Khmer against Kingston. I think he lost his game against Nikov, but he did win against Kingston. Now, what he did was he wanted Knight Crossbow in the mid game. Knight Crossbow combination and a crazy economy. And we saw that from Tata too, how the economy can just fly. But for now, Baba's going to push in some deer, bring in his boar pretty early. But we've got the Spanish on the other side. Guys, we haven't seen Spanish that frequently. What are your thoughts on Spanish here? Um, the crossbow timing's not an option for Sebastian anymore. So, that is going to be rather one-dimensional then, because I think Spanish are one of two civs that don't get crossbow. I think Bulgarians are the other one. Conquistadors are going to be tricky to get to, because the map is pretty open. So, that's probably not an early option. So, I'm guessing Sebastian will probably play into scouts. Maybe this just becomes, like, knights and monks and pikes. Could always go for cav archers, maybe. Maybe skirmishers. I mean, late game Spanish is fantastic. It's just a little bit more of a unique pick here. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think you can go for the castle drop right away, but I think if it's an even game and you're booming, and like I said, you can go knights and pikes and still feel really smooth with the Spanish. I think eventually a castle through the middle is a big deal. So, map. Fairly open for both. I think it's a bit more wallable right here for Sebastian on the front, which will suit him. I think Baba's front area is more exposed. But he's going to go to the side. He's going to take these resources here, apparently, with a mill. Which is, again, what Tato did. And because the Khmer villagers can hop inside of houses, this is a risk that I think you should take. And you almost have to take. You know, you want to take advantage of every bonus you can. Hmm. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Sigs, we're not doing player point of view for Hidden Cup main event for a couple obvious reasons. Okay, so first off, if you're seeing player's point of view, you're you're getting to see like their speed from something that is not just overviewing the game, right? Uh, the second part is the technical aspect, which is not so easy. The third part is the mods some people have pine trees some people have regular trees some people like yo's got these monks rolling on carts bringing in the relics yo's got i'm not even kidding i think yo has like 60 in-game graphic mods right some people have squares like yeah so like doing player point of view for hidden cup would be horrible for many different reasons you'd be able to find out right away <laughs> so yeah yo is the polar bear knight mod that's true he is the polar bear knights. His knights are actually polar bears on... Uh, wait, no, it's a... I think it's a penguin on a polar bear? A knight on a polar bear? I forget. Yeah, so that... We're, we're not doing that. <laughs> also, in the main event, this tab will be gone. This will not be available. There will be none of this. It, we will only watch the game. We'll have more data, actually, to work off of, which is really fun. But we won't have a number to look at which we could compare to, you know, numbers that exist that says, you know, what someone's speed is. I, I would much prefer to be able to try and speculate based on the games that we see. So, Baba Rum is scouting his opponent now. We'll see the barracks. And yeah, this is, I think Baba Rum will know this has to be scouts from Sebastian because Spanish really don't want to be going archers. And then Sebastian would expect scouts because Khmer are almost always doing this. And Sebastian, he did actually scout over here, but I don't know if he saw anything, guys. Hmm. I mean, if you look, you can see the deer are moving. But that's that's definitely notable. I expect a lot of scout aggression here. And let's see if Babaram can tie it up. What a day it's been, guys. But yeah, good, good question. Um, if you've never watched a Hidden Cup before, I could see why that would be something you'd want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, polar bear knights are a reason against player point of view? <laughs> well, it would spoil it. It would spoil it. It is funny. I just, there's certain mods that players use that I just think are just 
I could never use for a competitive game. I find Yo to be so interesting with that because he's such a he's such a good player. And he has all these funny little mods that you wouldn't associate with a competitive player. I really liked random bands, more Civ variety that way. Yeah, but I didn't like that players would train all week to go for a strategy and then the random bands eliminate their strategy. I think that's really bad for, for prepped maps and prepped plans. I get that random bands add a little bit more variety and we will have a different uh, drafting format for the main event. But random bands have a big downside when it comes to, to player strategy. And that was really close there for Baba Ram. Very close. That could have been bad for him. But let's see how he gets himself out of this one. Because Tato earlier had four vills and Hart was all over him with Spears and Scouts. And Tato was able to make it happen. But Sebastian is going to make life difficult. And you can tell Baba's like, okay, I'm out of here. And there he goes. He's running. And he's, well... Uh, it's going to be close into the house. Hurry up, people. Whoop, there we go. No, oh, oh, God. Okay, that, that was close. This is why he rushed these uh, walls down, right? Actually, there is a hole here, which he hasn't checked. That could be horrible because he is full walled to the other side. And here he goes with his scouts now. And Spanish do build faster and whoop. There we go. Baba Rum in. Now it's... Time for Sebastian to damage control. He does have a Spearman here, though. And Scouts are regretting their decision, so they're now going to leave. Does feel like Sebastian is just coming home with his army, and we will transition towards the next stage. Army Eco for Sebastian looks really nice. Walls are looking good. Gold and stones on the back. I mean, if you wanted to go conks, guys, you could actually try it with that stone back there. It feels like an archer switch could be natural for Baba Rum here with his scouts. Again, he went knight, crossbow, and the other sets. He always had crossbow with knights, but it was the timing. So, like, he has a decision to make right now, and if he starts to go to gold and add the range now, he may choose to not do that at all. I think it would feel very natural to do it, though. I also think walling towards the TC is something a lot of old-fashioned players used to do, and then they stopped doing it because TCs don't hit much. There's only two scouts for Sebastian, but Sebastian could still run through there. I just point that out because Baba's been around a while. I feel like he he would have the tendency to do this. But um, the last couple years, players have just never done this because it's just too risky. So here come... I mean, again, if that's four scouts, they'll run through. Will the two scouts go through? Yes, they do. And the two spearmen are going to be here as well. And there's a weak villager there, Baba. This is this is unnecessarily awkward, but nice quick wall from him. And now he's got Sebastian, who has nothing better to do, in his base, ready to nerd out and kill the villager. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's not fun. <laughs> I've been on the other end of this too many times. In so many different ways. Now, any hit he gets on the TCs... Uh, or, or sorry, not on the TCs, on the Spears. is nice because he can just use the Scouts eventually. So this is a really nice situation, actually. But the Villager goes down. And yeah, it just, it is an unnecessary loss here. And he will probably feel that as well. Sebastian's probably like, wow, that's sick. Thank you. There's been no Archer switch, right? Nothing out here to deal with the Spears. Nothing to push forward with early. And I am seeing Stone come in right now for Sebastian. Sebastian's going to try Scouts into Conquistadors? We have never seen Spanish played on this map yet. Um, I would need someone to verify that maybe if there was maybe an early round I missed. This is the first time we've seen Spanish on Slopes. This is going to be the first time we've then seen Spanish into Conquistadors on Slopes. But it actually is just like the, the smoothest build here for Sebastian to do this. I think Baba choosing not to go Archer. No way. Oh, a doink from Sebastian. Sebastian found the weak bill from earlier. <laughs> Guys, okay. This is why you must wall in front of your TC against a player like Sebastian. He will still look for value for the next 10 minutes. Like, this army is always going to be microed. Two villagers killed. 
But Baba Rum did get one. So two to one in that regard. Vil count's still pretty even as well because Sebastian had a little bit more idle TC time. Two stable knights. Okay, so I think Baba Rum is not expecting stone income at all from Sebastian here. Because if I expected Conquistadors, I would want to have maybe an archery range and some range units on the field. But from what I'm seeing here, as Baba Rum is a little worried about this and goes out to wall, and Sebastian's going to find another one. Three villagers killed from this tiny little army. Crazy value from him, but, but yeah, I just don't know if he's expecting the Conquistador play. I wonder if Sebastian will go for a town center first or if he goes for the castle right away. Castle right away. I love it. And Conquistador is really solid against knights. And that's precisely what we're going to end up seeing here. Villagers escape for Baba Rum. Who wants to keep this dream alive. Uh, we'll hopefully soon have the wood to build the TC here. Just waiting for the wood to drop off and he'll drop the TC there. That's the spot he'll want to be at. If the Conquistadors are coming through the middle. He does not know his opponent is going for a castle. Hmm. Sebastian has played really safe here. He's played really smart. Conquistadors now will be masked. And some monks could be out as well to convert any knights. There's the castle. Baba Rum will see that. And I honestly think at this point he's probably like... <gasps> and he's completely surprised by it. Sebastian checks the TC. Nice nice stuff. I love that. So he knows there's a TC there now. And now he has to mask those Conquistadors. Now, I have been asked... If I had a dollar for every time someone asked me, T90, how do you kill Conquistador throughout my career? I would be on par with Elon Musk's net worth. Prior to him buying Twitter from whatever, you know... I don't even know what's true. Anyways, I, I would have be very wealthy, man. Okay, because everyone has asked me at least 17,000 times, how do you beat the Conquistadors? And the answer with a lot of gunpowder units is you have to stop them from getting there, right? You have to get ahead before they get there, which is like the most non-answer ever. It, it sucks. It's like, well, that didn't help me at all, right? But no, it's true. You have to recognize that threat is there. And that's the, really the number one thing. And so, with the stone being scouted on the back, I don't think Baba expected it. And now, the Conquistadors are here, and it is very unhelpful for me to suggest, well, just do better next time. So, what you do here is you go Elite Skirm. So, we've got to have uh, ranges going up at home for Baba. Skirm's upgrades are going to be coming in. But these Conquistadors do so much damage. They are so good, and they are just killing everything. Oh, man. And this is why when I saw the double stable knights and I knew it was Conquistador, that's why I was a little concerned here for Valvarum. The other thing you have to remember when you're up against a unique unit is that you likely have the economy lead because they had to build the castle. But honestly, so impressive from Sebastian because he will be on three TCs soon. So it's not like his eco is struggling. And he kills that monk. And he's just always moving forward. That's the thing with Sebastian, guys. Remember what he did in Feudal Age in the previous game? Remember how he played in Castle. It's just constant aggression. He is so good. It wouldn't surprise me, like, if Sebastian makes it to the main event, if people look at, like, if the votes come in and people see uh, big names like Viper, Hera, Vinchester, when it's really Sebastian, when the big reveal comes. Depending on his level, of course, and how deep he gets into the tourney if he makes it. But yeah, the problem with, with skirmishers is they still get shredded very quickly by the conks. They do bonus damage, but the conks still kill them. Because conquistadors have to do so much damage. And I, I'm i looking for positives right now for Baba Rum, and I'm just not seeing many of them. He's just getting slaughtered here. It's not good. He's losing farmers now. His eco is all out of whack compared to Sebastian's. And Sebastian who has, like, just dominated everyone in this qualifier, is ready to to kind of ruin this storyline. Do you see that micro? <laughs> Look at that! Sebastian, stop it! Thank you. 
Make us feel human. Thank you. Three town centers for Sebastian. He's banking up stone for another castle. And he's getting bloodlines now to add even more HP onto these conquistadors. Back to this side he goes. Finds more villagers. And it's a slaughter. And these villagers are also dying with food in their hands. So you don't even get the reward from them being out there. Brutal. Now Sebastian did fail to qualify for NAC. In a game he was winning when he went for a very forward castle against ACCM. It got denied. Many people were saying this is now called a Sebastian castle, not a Doubt castle. I think it's more of a how many times do you do this situation. Doubt has failed castles um, way more than Sebastian has. And Sebastian is not going to fail this one. There's Yeah, this castle goes up, dude. This is What a statement. You go up 2-0... And you do it in this fashion? This would be crazy. He sees another monk. He saw the relic was picked up. He goes for another kill. Boom. Dead. Split microing. Killing the skirms. This is supposed to be a counter unit. Boom. Dead. All the skirms are dead. Castle's on the way up. Spanish build speed, by the way. That castle is on more stone, which can lead to even more castles. And then everything from Baba Rum will go down. And it is a complete and utter slaughter right there as the monk doesn't even get the conversion. We've got the GG called. It has not been that close. Sebastian looks amazing. And Baba Ram is going to have to find a way to beat this kid. And again, I don't think Slopes is going to be it. I think he has to, to get some momentum. I think he has to get some water involved. And I think maybe Islands should be his choice next from his home map list. But listen, there's a th this was just a complete misread from Baba. I think we get very used to there not being misreads. But it's Spanish. He actually scouted the stone. Right? So he knew the stone was on the back. I think in a full wall scout war, you have to recognize that it's going to be conks. And at this stage of the game, you add the archer range. And you start to add some archers. Because if you have archers, even if the archers don't break through, the castle never goes up on the front. It's more defensive. Right? You're already massing ranged units, which can help you combine some crossbows with some skirms. I think the double stable addition, which came a little bit later on, this is something he's used to doing because he did it in the other games, but he wasn't expecting Conquistadors. Not to mention that Sebastian also killed three villagers with the Feudal Age army there, but so far, man, this has been a stomp and Sebastian is looking amazing. You can see some of the speed there. And he has the ability to kill, but he has the ability to boom. And there's a reason the hype is real for him. More food, more gold, more stone. Beautiful stuff. Yeah, I think it was just I think it was just straight autopilot from Baba because he was so comfortable going two stable knights and booming in the other games. And he just didn't think of it. And then when he saw the castle, he probably was like, oof. And and just forgot. Also, a lot of players, they they get good uh at like at this point, we've had four rounds of qualifiers, and uh, I've seen Baba Rum pick similar civilizations, but also, not only that, he's playing against similar styles. So I think that the Spanish thing is not something that he was expecting, and it's not something he's seen before, which is probably part of it. Like, if we had another three weeks of qualifiers, maybe he faces that now, and maybe the next time he sees it, he knows. But anyways, things to think about. Um, I think we've all been there where... We, we don't expect the opponent's next move, and that move happens to be a very good move. And that's precisely what happened there. 2-0 right now for our favorite Sebastian. And also some later picks for him as well, but we're going to go to cross game number three. <laughs> Someone says, Baba Rum will come back. He's the smartest of the two, and he's brilliant. And French. <laughs> hey, unrelated, but where are you from? Can you tell me where you happen to live? Or where you grew up, perhaps? Because <laughs> uh, I've got a guess. <laughs> from France. Oh, you're from France. Really? Huh. I thought you were German, man. That's wild. Okay. Interesting how that works out. All right, ladies and gents, welcome to game number three. We've got Baba Rum, and it has not looked great so far for him. But many people here still believe. Uh, we've got Malians, which is a top-tier Civ for this map. And we have the Persians then for Sebastian, which is another top tier sieve for this map. 
And I freaking love this map. And this exact matchup, Baba Run has played before. He played this matchup as the Malians against the Persians in his game number five in the second round when he shocked the world and beat Nikov. Okay? So he has been there before. However, I am going to have to bring up some tendencies here because when that Nikov Baba Rum game, and man, it really makes me excited if you guys actually watch that series right now and you're remembering this because I always wonder what percentage of people actually know what I'm talking about. Anyways, if you do, thank you. Um, that game was a very passive game on the land. What we saw in that game was a lot of walling, a lot of safe play into Castle Age. It was very boomy. It went towards the late game. We had camels and knights and monks. Um, but in Feudal Age, it wasn't very open. It, it wasn't very aggressive. Sebastian, and it's even annoying me just bringing it up, We've seen it already. He has this crazy tendency, and he loves to keep it open on land. So I think, just right off the bat here, I think that Sebastian's game plan should be to maybe go for some militia of some kind with his starting scout and just try and make life awkward for Baba Rum before Baba Rum can maybe get some walls down. Because you have to think Sebastian watched the Rex. This is the biggest moment of his career if he makes it into Hidden Cup. So... You would expect that he would have watched those games, seen Baba Rum's tendencies, and then come out firing. As for Baba, though, I mean, his Civ is really flexible. Malians can afford so much with the cheaper buildings, so you could always play in towards uh, archers or scouts to maybe defend from that and stabilize. All right, so I've said many times, pushing deer on this map is a bit of a risk. We've got Baba Rum taking that risk. He may feel he needs a little bit of extra something. He's going to fish the west side. Sebastian, not pushing any deer. And look at his scouting, guys. Look at the difference. Can we just look at the Fog of War for a second? Zoom out, Fog of War, Baba Rum. He's got his nice little circle pushing some deer. Then we look at Sebastian, wanting information, scouting the ponds, even using a turkey here. So he knows his opponent isn't docked here. He knows his opponent isn't docked here. And he will find his opponent's dock already. This is much faster than normal. Okay, it's a goose. Sorry. But, um... Yeah, and, and that is a big part of the strategy on this map. And what that might mean... If he's scouting it that early... Actually, he's missed it. He might he might be very confused, actually. Yeah, he's, he's like, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, it might mean that he chooses to sneak a vill to try and dock that. And that was something that... We saw from uh, Nikov against Babaram, I believe, if I remember that game correctly. A winner here is in the main event of Hidden Cup, guys, which is February 25th through March 3rd. I do want to remind people, as people come in and out all day, we have a live viewing party in the USA. First time it's ever happened. March 3rd, beautiful Fort Lauderdale, Florida. For anyone who's, who's thinking about that, we have the tickets and the Discord server where you can get more information and questions, it's pinned in the comments, uh, at the top of the comment section here on Twitch. You'll see third place match, you will see the final, uh, the big reveal, and then I will be there as well. Obviously other age fans will be there, lots of cool things planned. Uh, just check it out, as tickets will only be on sale for, for a bit longer, so. Hmm. So no barracks for Sebastian, that's what I was expecting. Will we see a sneak vill? Normally, you're going to see a villager just make a run for it to try and dock here. Persian docks are really strong. Doesn't seem like we're going to see a sneak vill. Still thoroughly scouting with a goose. Checking to see if Babaram is going to build a barracks here. Double checking the front of the base. He doesn't find anything. Babaram has found the dock from Sebastian. And is bringing a vill. This is what the people of France wanted to see. This villager here. And ooh, interesting. Wow, heavy pond play. This is rare. You don't normally see a like two docks going up in separate ponds. If anything, you're gonna see two docks to kill your opponent's fish. But he's hoping to fish here. And then also aggro here. And then of course, he'll have to hope not to die on land. Don't tell me this goose is going to be lost here. And this is going to give Sebastian an idea. Don't tell me. 
He double checked with his fishing ship to see if there's a dock there. The goose is moved. The villager is there. The dock is going up. Silly goose, what are you doing? That's so interesting. And also, Baba's scout is being attacked. He's taking the scout away from the uh, from the from the shoreline. Will Sebastian double check here? If Sebastian doesn't double check, this could be amazing. There's going to be scouts for Sebastian, which Baba Rum also gets to see. I think Sebastian is checking again. Just to be sure, and he sees it. Okay, I mean, it's good he checked, guys, but Sebastian is not on gold. So if he's not on gold, he can't make many fire galleys, and there's already a fire galley on the way here for Baba. Now, there's also a fishing ship here for Baba, but you don't have a way of knowing if your opponent's on this pond, and Sebastian's going to come in. He is immediately making a fire galley, though, so that's going to work out really well. Wow, guys, look at the scout. We'll now check this. If you don't see a dock here, you might assume that Sebastian is coming here, which is why the Fire Galleys is coming. I love this map. And now all you need if your opponent is going for scouts is a couple spears at home. You can tell that Baba Rum has played this map many times before. He even built houses here along the shoreline for vision. But actually really like to see Town Watch. So this is, this is something that I think... I wouldn't hate it if they changed it. So you cannot attack through an enemy dock, but they can attack through their dock. So if there was a fire here attacking this fire, blue's fire would do no damage, but red's fire would. It's really weird, um, but it's actually really smart for Baba Rum then to position his ships like this in the choke point. Fire has come over here already, and Sebastian's got to be feeling like, huh? How is he on my pond? And then he's here as well, and there's our first fishing ship kill. Like we mentioned before, it's tough for Sebastian to be able to... It was tough for him to be able to afford the first and second fire because he wasn't on gold. However, because of that other fire being produced by Baba, he didn't actually have the one here. And that could be bad. And Sebastian blocks the choke point. And that Vil's going to die then. Yep, that Vil's going to die. And what? Wait, what? Huh? What? This is what I mean. The docks are really weird. Huh? She's safe? Huh? <laughs> oh, wait. He's clicked the palisade. He's, he's given up. He's just clicked the palisade. I don't think he's trying to. I don't understand. Oh, wait. Now she's getting hit. Now she's getting hit. Don't change anything. Boom. Villager's dead. Okay, wow. Meanwhile, there were scouts dying over here. Man, like... This is so good, right? Obviously, to be here. But to have such a lead in the production of fires with one dock versus one dock and then fall behind here really must hurt here for Baba because this is more important. They're, this is where the fishing ships are. 6 to 3 KD for Sebastian, who absolutely... Um, it was favorite to win this series, right? And is, is probably feeling much better based on how things have played right now. We do have the walls here for Baba, who's adding some scouts. Sebastian has more scouts on the field, though. We'll track this the whole way through. Sees it, and is transitioned towards farms. Now, that's the thing about this map we don't talk about. They're fishing, but you also need to farm. You see how there's no farms here for Baba? He's going to rely more on the fish long-term than anything, then. Another dock from him as he wants to go for the TPD, the Triple Pond Domination. And there's the pond in the north. I don't know if that's domination yet, but he does have three ponds then. So you sell some of the stone, buy some food, look to click up here towards castle. Sebastian has done a better job transitioning his eco towards farms. He does a few fishing ships, but he has doesn't have that crazy fish eco. And then always remember, like these fire galleys are going to add to the score. It's going to add to the military count. But these fire galleys basically do nothing for Sebastian now. But he does need something here. And he's got it. And I think actually there was a demo. Must have been a demo there from Sebastian. And one dock against two here. He's actually taking good fights. And Baba Ram, he just can't keep up with it. Just not able to keep up with it. Like he realizes he loses another unit there. 
Sebastian just always seems to be a little bit more efficient with the fights. We did have a quick wall here. It's very likely that this quick wall was happening when the fire galley was going down. And now Sebastian quick walls in his villager. What? Excuse me? Nice save. 3 to 1 eco KD for Sebastian. He actually came over here and killed the dock villager as well. It's like every time I'm looking, Sebastian is amazing micro. Even there, he dodges from the demos. It's actually a really nice demo micro. That could have led to three or four ships going down. Sebastian's playing like a maniac. His resources collected almost a thousand more than Baba. Castle age time will be similar. And now, of course, this, this villager being up here tells Sebastian that he could maybe send a villager there if he needs to, to uh, contest the pond. But honestly, at this point, I think just TCs is probably fine. Um, you know, trying to compete for this pond is good. Both players have invested here, but I think adding land eco is really important here. Baba Rum, I think, is realizing he's behind. And so he sell sold off his stone, and he's going to try and go all in here. War Galley upgrade. What you do here is you hop out with one fire to group up all the other fires, and then you hope that you demo the group. Scouts and camels around to defend that TC position for Sebastian. He drops a monastery for some monks. This would be the time for Baba to come back on this pond. Can you use one fire in the middle of the group if you can pay attention to this? But he's looking at this. Quick walls from Sebastian. Doesn't get them down. Camels lured out of position. Nice attack from Baba. The demo also landed at the same time. He needed that. It all worked out for him. And he delayed that TC. Took a very nice fight. The TC will still go up, though. He didn't kill that much. And obviously, no fish here to kill. He will just have to add fishing ships here. And then it'll feel worth it. And he actually bought some stone back. He's going to drop TC number two. Again, look at the farming situation here. Three farms. Sebastian's got ten farms. And getting horse collar. So I had someone ask... I had a lot of people ask me what is the difference between Cross and Four Lakes. And um, I, I gave an answer. So if you've heard that, it's going to be similar. But I actually double-checked that too because the versions of Four Lakes have kind of changed at times throughout Ranked. So they must have added a lot more fish to Four Lakes recently. Uh, there's way more fish on Four Lakes than I remembered. So yeah, Cross is... Four lakes with maybe like half the fish or something. Like on four lakes, you can just get by with one pond for a long time. This is the type of thing on cross that you really need. You can't lose your fish, right? Having your fish is still helpful, but eventually you need to have that balance towards the land eco too. Uh, four lakes, you just simply don't need that quite as much. It looks like this villager's gone down. Is Golden Swamp just cup? Golden Swamp was introduced after cup. They definitely came up with the idea because of Cup, though they never talked to me about it. But I'm pretty sure Golden Swamp was probably a Cup-inspired map because of the timing of it. <laughs> Just like Four Lakes was a Cross-inspired map. Camels don't really kill villagers all that well. I mean, they will if there's no resistance, but it's not really the best raiding unit here. Especially when there's a couple spearmen and monks around. So Sebastian's forced away. Two TCs here. Blacksmith now for Sebastian for upgrades. But also maybe because he wants to siege push this hill. Look at the amount of monks for Sebastian here. Scout goes in. Uphill. Scout doesn't get the kill. Monk's still around. But Monk stopped trying to get a conversion. And, dude, there's just so many monks going in for conversions here. Someone get devotion fast. <laughs> also, light cap could be really good. Persian monks are really weak. They don't get sanctity, but they still can get conversions like this. And Sebastian's going to be happy with some of these conversions. Both players lose units. Sebastian losing some monks here, too. But he has the control in this game. And he has a thousand more resources collected. And this is before he's starting to mount the siege push here. It's just really, like, it's unfortunate because Baba's had such a good run. But, like, Sebastian is playing unreal. 
Those two vills that were converted were going to be converted back, and he deleted them. Like, Sebastian just gives this guy no time. Three mangonels in queue now. And more monks on the way forward. Nalians do get redemption. So monks are actually your savior here. But I'm noticing he doesn't actually have that much on gold at the moment. He seems to be transitioning towards stone for a castle. I don't think redemption is going to be possible for him with these resources. Unless he sells some of that off. And no sanctity even means the siege is a really big problem as we have another stable... Now, on paper, against monks, you want to go light cap. Against monks, siege, light cap is perfect. But when there's camels there, you can't really expect to get in close. And Sebastian just all over him again. It is just so much speed. And, and his eco is flying, guys. Res Collected's even got higher now behind this. He's not forgetting upgrades. He doesn't really need upgrades on his military. There's just so much confidence for Sebastian right now. Siege has been forgotten about. Siege is starting to go down. That will stall out the push. That was sloppy. Monks here, left alone, loses one. Will lose two. But he does get a conversion there, and Baba Ram doesn't have the army to compete. Still, though, if Baba could build a castle now and, and secure the map, this could be really nice. Sebastian is building an outpost with that villager in his opponent's base. Traitor! How dare you! <laughs> Reveal our secrets. <laughs> Sebastian's gonna go imp? What? Honestly, the, he's playing Unreal. This is an Unreal level. This is unbelievable. I mean, believable with how good he is in some ways, but also playing above the level I even know that he's capable of. This is insane. We could have an imp into forward castle situation here soon. Always paying attention to his army. Getting a few more conversions. He didn't go for any upgrades on his units, guys. Like, that's the crazy thing, is he's taking good fights. He has no... He doesn't have a single upgrade on his camels. He just always has the numbers of them. And he always has enough healing and enough conversions nearby. Still don't know what he's going to do in Imp. Right? Imp normally leads to upgrades, which he doesn't have any of. Imp could lead to Trebs, and he doesn't have a forward castle yet. So, Sebastian's been able to, to push a bit, but he hasn't finished Baba Rum. Baba Rum drops the castle. Baba Rum on three town centers. But that one minute and 19 seconds of TC idle time stat is wild to me. That is obviously not completely flawless, but that is a ridiculous stat to have on a map where he's had to focus so much on some of these other pawns. But then again, I mean, he did lose this pond, and he's only had to look here, so maybe that's been part of it. I think husbandry's also been in, and, oh, actually, camels are just faster than the knights, right? So, castle's going up for Sebastian. Does he have a university? Is this chemistry? Looks like it might be chemistry. Chemistry's on the way, and Baba Rum's gonna look at this and be like, what? How is he imp? Because that's kind of what I'm thinking. It's pretty ridiculous, man. Another TC here for Baba who wants to stay alive. All four... Well, not all four relics, because there's five on the map, but four of the five relics have been collected. Treb can come out to just Treb down this castle. Bombard Cannon can come out as a follow-up. Heavy Camel upgrade on the way here for Sebastian. He's got more than enough camels to take this fight, and he always has monks to maybe get some conversions, even though Persian monks are pretty trash. This dude's playing insane, man. And he he deserves to be... Assuming he, you know, continues this shape, and Babaram can't turn it around in this series. Sebastian has had such a good year or two. He deserves to be an event like Hidden Cup. It's really exciting for the scene to have someone like him have his hard work pay off. I know he's been training like a madman. And he's young, right? 22. Has been playing for quite a few years now. But has always just been like just close. Like so close and yet so far from qualifying for big events. His level's ridiculous right now. Look at this. Gets through. Builds some gates and walls. Traps that. 
Meanwhile, Treb's on the front, has enough army to protect here, and he's already going for that castle. Yeah, he is younger than the game itself, <laughs> which is true. And I think he would be... Yeah, we do not have anyone under the age of 22 already in the event, right? I think Leary's 23? 24? 25? Leary's 20... Dude, I don't even know. I know 22 is... Leary is not still 16. <laughs> he is not still 16. Yeah, I think he's 23 or 24. Something like that. I remember when Leary was 16. I was also much younger than I am now. I like this from Baba Rum just to try and use the Navy in some way. Well, the problem here is... Gebetto is, the, is a great unit for the Malians against the Camels. But Sebastian's already on hand cannons here. Leary's 22. Can you guys liquipedia it? And we can find out who's younger between Sebastian and Leary. Also, shout out to this camel, which won't be upgraded to a heavy camel. Am I crazy? I thought there was one. There's one special one in there. Yeah, that guy. He's not heavy. That is a light camel. Ooh, big fight here as I was being stupid. Not a bad fight for Baba, but has to be careful. There's gunpowder here. Monks, though, for Sebastian. First misplay he's made with his monks. That's relatable. First time he's been relatable with monks in this series. And Trebs took down the castle. 39,000 resources collected from Sebastian. It is 32,000 for Baba Rum. Crazy stuff. I think Gabetto Camel is one of the best comps that you could have as the Malians. Gunpowder Camel for the Persians, though, should be really strong against that. Sebastian was born February of 2002. Okay, so who's who's younger? God, Leary's been around for so long. It's hard to believe that he's the same age as Sebastian. <laughs> Just because Leary's been so good for so long... He feels like an old man, like the rest of us. The Trebs just roll right up to the hill here. These are heavy camels. And a lot of them here for Sebastian. And there's gunpowder everywhere. The TCs are going to start to go down. And I'm fearing for Baba Rum. He will too. There will be more games in this series. This is the best of seven. But it's got to be hard to have any belief. If Sebastian is playing this well. Sebastian is playing insane. Abaram is not playing poorly. Maybe game two, he had a misread. But Sebastian is just on another level here, and the GG's called. 3-0. Sebastian now one win away from joining the Hidden Cup 5 main event. And again, if he does it, if he makes it to the main event, I don't want to jinx him here. It will be an exciting addition because he is so freaking good. And he's got technical micro. He's very fast. The strategic side will be interesting too, but like, I could see someone guessing Vinchester, maybe occasionally guessing Leary, something along those lines when they see Sebastian play. And, the, you know, the more skilled players in the main event, obviously, the better the games will be. And the main event quality is going to be insane, right? There's the uh, KD there for Sebastian. Well played to him. I mean, the guy is just an animal right now. <laughs> He's playing with confidence. His, his speed, it, it's, it's clear to me. That he simply is way faster. And the strategy is there too. So I'm uh, not really sure what more you can say about the guy. Staring at that 3-0 scoreline. Um, I still think you have to play Islands if you're Baba Rum. Like, you got to get some momentum. Maybe he was hoping to save Islands. I think Islands is the one map with Sebastian I'm unsure on. So I'm hoping we get Islands game four. It isn't a map I would associate with the strengths of uh, of Sebastian. And it is going to be Islands Game 4. At least that's what I'm seeing here. So Islands Game 4. Let's cross off the civs here. Ooh, wrong scene. Uh, cross off the civs here and speculate a little bit. Also, I have a tendency when there's a game in front of me not to drink water. Just give me a second. Oh, Mihai's 20. So if Mihai qualifies, he would be younger than Sebastian. Wow. I didn't know Mihai was 20. I thought he was like 21 or 22 as well. That's also epic. Okay. Um, so, Malians didn't win. 
That hurts. That was the number one pick. Persians get the win. We've got Byzantines, Aztecs, Italians, Japanese, and Gurjaras for Babarum. I think Italians is the obvious one for islands, and I think it's going to be against Sebastian's number one pick in the Armenians, who, and this civ, the majority of people seem to think, is the best island civilization right now. Let's go. Ooh, Sebastian changed his color coming into this game. That's interesting, because he's one win away from making it to the main event. And we do have another player who will be in the main event who is known for changing his colors from game to game. Hmm. Anyways, getting ahead of myself, welcome to game four. Has not been the series that Baba Rum wanted. He's down three games. Sebastian's playing like an animal. And we've got the Armenians versus the Italians. Now, Armenians are top three on bans in the drafts. They've been banned a lot. And I'm pretty certain they have been banned because of their water play. Players have not wanted to face up against Armenians. That tells me they think Armenians is number one. I spoke to Mark Gugu. I spoke to, well, many players. I uh, constantly am. And yeah, players basically are like, yep, Armenians are number one. And they're, they're just busted. So I think the big reason they seem to think they're busted is because of their naval tech tree, but also uh, their mule cart upgrades. The mule cart upgrades are 40% more effective. And the mule cart upgrades wood. And the mule cart upgrades gold. And so the, the wood and the gold is what you need for navy, right? So that inherently plays directly towards island play. But then also they have a crazy unique tech later. They're, I think their galleys fire extra arrows. Their, um, their fortified churches give them an extra relic. I mean, there's just so many bonuses that feel so smooth with the Armenians. So, see how things flow. Now, I explained to Margugu that I think the Italians are... It's easier to play. Now, Armenians, of course, have great bonuses that you don't really have to work hard for, but cheap fishing ships, cheap dock techs, cheaper up to each age, and then an awesome naval tech tree makes them, in my opinion, number two on water. If I had to rank them, I would say Armenians, number one. Italians, number two. Um, I might say Dravidians 3, Vikings 4, but Vikings have actually looked really, 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 really good and way better than I thought. So maybe Vikings 3, Vikings 2, I, ugh, I don't know. <laughs> the true answer is it depends. But I would rank all the civs I just mentioned above Portuguese. And I think the picks and the bands and everything on the draft has also uh, mean that a lot of players agree with me. Portuguese are really solid too, though. And uh, I don't know if we'll see them more or less in the main event, but... So what I would do, like, the Armenian galleys are really strong. And if you give the... If you give Sebastian, of all people, the chance to just boom behind galleys, he's going to micro you down. And he's going to kind of embarrass you like he already has been doing. So, instead, my suggestion would be go landing. And Baba Rum has gone landing before. I expect it here. Now, I think we are going to see... Two to three fishing ships on the back. A transport ship from Baba Rum. You're down 3-0. At least give the people some craziness. And who knows? Maybe uh, you, you, you get the better of Sebastian here. Maybe it gets under Sebastian's skin. Maybe it affects his performance. And maybe you start the crazy reverse sweep here. Obviously, you just have to take it one game at a time here, though. So, um, Okay, a couple shout-outs. Uh, well, shout out to everyone I've missed over the past 48 hours. Um, these have been long days, and I'm casting all the time. So, sorry about that, but also the people I'll be able to announce. Thank you, uh, Meglin, who's a big Baba fan. Thank you, Doc Deagle. Says, can we have a hidden cup every month? Uh, no. <laughs> I think um, that would... I think all good things need to be spaced properly, right? Otherwise, you'd get tired of them very quickly, says the guy who uploads a video to YouTube every single day and streams all the... Anyways, um, thank you, Prezmu, for the 28 months. Thank you, Joblo, for 19 months. Thank you, Killer Boo, for the gifted subs, which I think I thanked you about. But uh, I may have missed. Anyways, uh, Giovanni, thank you. Ronzu, welcome back. Says, didn't know you were back on Twitch. Kappa, yep, I've been back. I think you're joking. Thank you, Beavar, Toasty. Uh, Shuniski, uh, Constanio, Apogee, welcome back. Grizz, Ilmbrick, Space Pirate, and Fingolfin. 
I think we're all caught up. Thank you, everybody. The, uh, the, the sub count has been flying. It's been motivating. All right, where's the transport, Baba? I don't think this is a transport, actually, because you would need to have this transport being produced already. And he instead... Is this just a really, 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 really fast, fast castle? I think this is an attempt at a fast castle. He may not be able to actually pull this off here. I think he's going to have to sell his stone even. And even then, I mean, you need a lot more food than this. He does have Lumen Q as well, which could just be because of the potential landing from the opponent. But yeah, double dock here from Sebastian. I'd be shocked if he doesn't go for galleys here. And this is not Fast Castle for him. But I'm just not seeing the resources there yet for Baba. I think if I were to give you an island strategy with the Italians, this is what I would suggest. I would say, go back dock, add four to five fish, go Fast Castle, into a forward dock or two, Upgraded fire galleys and go kill all the opponents fishing castle from there you drop town centers you boom That is a play that more often than not is going to bring you a lot of success with the Italians And that's essentially what he's trying to do here, but I just think he he maybe needed an extra villager or two Slightly miscalculated this and yeah, he sells the stone with the market still barely has the resources to do it, but he's on his way Making a fire galley on the back We'll make a dock on the front and yeah, that's pretty much the strategy. We've seen this strategy dominate. We've also seen this strategy lose many times if you lose control. Hmm. Three dock galleys from Armenians. Now, you want your fishing ships to survive as long as possible, obviously. But this fire can maybe hold against normal galleys. The double galley fire... Against two galleys should be insane. They're firing two bolts. And soon it's going to be five and six and seven and eight. I also wonder how the Armenian galleys do in Feudal Age against upgraded fire ships in Castle. This ship this ship seems so strong. This is before we talk about the eco. Again, like the wood and the gold is way more efficient. And uh, I didn't show you, but I'm 95% certain he researched the gold upgrade as well. Everyone's doing it with Armenians right now. It just didn't... It doesn't have an area in Capture Age to show. Fishing ships are fleeing, which is smart thinking. You also need to conserve your fires now. <laughs> Look at how at the limit the resources are for Baba here. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, the dock decks are cheaper, so you should be able to get it. But really at the limit with this build order. And now we are going to see fires from Sebastian to put in front of his galleys. Which is a smart move. Does have a lot of wood right now, which he'll need to spend in some way. And does need to be careful at home. Now, I like the fire addition because you already have enough galleys to do what you want to do. Uh, a Feudal Age Fire does a much better job at holding against a Castle Age Fire than the Feudal Age Galley will. The Feudal Age Galleys, you need so many numbers. And it just, it makes your life a little bit easier to have this back up here. Looks like this fire's looping around now. Baba into the darkness. Looking, maybe expecting a back dock. Looked on the front, doesn't see this. Right now, he's trying to save his fish, and Sebastian, who looped all the way around, finds the kills. But there's been three fishing ships killed. But still no uh, castle age for Sebastian. He's going to click up here shortly. Res collected will be extremely high for him, but the second TC is here for Baba. This is textbook. This is... What's interesting about this build is that I thought this build was unbreakable, and now the more I see it, people are figuring it out, guys. We've seen Vikings beat it with longboats. Um, Dravidians beat it. With actually playing a very similar style, but... It is a really good build, because basically, this is still likely going to go to the Imperial Age. And the idea is you kill their fish, which of course hasn't happened here, which is unfortunate. And then you are on TCs faster than them. That's the thinking. 
Uh, CMD. Sebastian is from Uruguay. I think that is very close to the Greece flag, though. Okay, so you see how little the galleys do at this stage. Obviously, having them later on will be very strong, though. And Sebastian is held. Seven kills, one death. Microed the fishing ship there just to block off the fire. Defended his fish on his way up. 50 seconds away. Boom! Big demo, though. Abaram will like that. Nice micro. And we'll see if Sebastian's going to be able to catch up in the villager count because he will fall behind there with the two TCs behind this for Babaram. Ducks is from Greece. Is that is the Greece flag not similar? Am I wrong? Sorry. I'm sure you're shocked that my knowledge of flags is on par with my knowledge of geography. I thought it was similar. Flag is very similar? Yeah. It's very similar. Thank you, chat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Chat having my back. Let's go. Second TC going up here for Sebastian. Res collected. He has collected 9,000 resources. And his opponent has collected 7,000 resources. See, that is not just the fishing ships, guys. That is Armenians. And it also is really nice eco balance. The mule carts. The efficiency of the mule carts. And then you make a monastery or fortified church and you get a relic right away. And you have a fortified priest. Or fortified priest. You have a, um, what what the crap they call A warrior priest. That's cheaper than a, uh, a monk. I almost said cheaper than a relic. I'm really dying over here. And you can actually pick up these relics. And with this map control, in theory, you could also transport. And go out and take these relics. Fortified Priest will be in the next DLC, guys. <laughs> we already got monastery. We got monks that attack. We got monasteries that give you free relics and you can garrison into. I know some people are more used to this now. But a Fortified Priest feels like it'll come in the next DLC. Hopefully not, of course. I'm, I'm kidding, devs. Please don't do that. Sebastian is just playing perfectly, guys. I mean, Armenians are strong, but he is just playing perfectly today. He's playing so good against a player who upset Nikov, against a player who, who upset um, Kingston, against a player who's had a crazy run, but I'm just not seeing a way but to win this game with how, if you're Baba Rum, because of how good Sebastian's playing. Like, it is just every game, he has just been a tier above. Every single one. And... You know, some of it's maybe the sieve. Armenians were banned a lot, so it could be that. But you know, we've seen this strategy that Baba Rum's doing win many times, and it has not looked good. And he's going to try and redock to come back on water, and every time he does that, he will be found because Sebastian is just patrolling on the shoreline everywhere. And Sebastian doing the small things. Look, he's getting the relics. From the neutral islands, just in case he loses water control later on. Makes me happy because I envisioned this for the map, by the way. This was the thought. It's give the players who have water control a greater edge. And more often than not, the player who gets these relics and has these neutral islands is going to be in the better position. Dang. Docks. I mean, how are you supposed to sneak a dock up? Sebastian is patrolling everywhere. Look at this. Actually, that, that can't show you. Uh, th this is Sebastian's point of view. He's looking everywhere. Looking all around. Behind this, his economy is solid. University for him, maybe for ballistics. He'll end up having five relics. He could actually take this relic if he wanted to from Baba Rum's island. A monk goes down for Baba Rum. That's just unlucky. It probably passed this way when he wanted to get this relic. Continues to try and find dock spots, but Sebastian's patrols are perfect, dude. He usually, like, usually players are able to sneak up some docks, but he's everywhere. <laughs> this has been... Uh, this, I mean, this, this whole series has just been another example of why people have been so excited about Sebastian. Every type of map. Arabia, slopes, islands, cross... There's so many players that are only good on landmaps, or at least that used to be the case with some of these next-gen guys. They'd only be good on something like Arabia. 
the practice guys having ten thousand dollars in the qualifier has certainly helped but everybody has been practicing the level is so so high here and there we go again snagging the relics directly into the transport directly back home <laughs> i like how the monk walked back here <laughs> to get into the transport ship yep he's up to imp He's adding more docks. He's adding war galleys. He's getting upgrades to add range to the war galleys. To be up faster than the Italians is also insane. And yeah, this is... I think Baba Rum will call it when he sees Imperial Age, if not before. No one wants to be dominated like this. No one also wants to resign too early. And, uh, you know, like this would mean that the series is over. This would mean that Baba's not going to be in Hidden Cup 5 yet. This does send him to a uh, series tomorrow, which I'll tell you guys about, which I think is the silver lining here for Baba. But yeah, this is just, this is just, the series has not been close. Some of the games have been great, but Sebastian, I'm trying to remember, did he lose a game, guys? Can someone look at Liquipedia and tell me, did he lose a game? I don't think he lost the game the entire qualifier. He will have gone 3 0. 3-0, 3-0, 4-0. That's crazy. Has not lost a game. Sick. Even Tas Tato lost a game. Tato lost a game to Seed 96, and I'm sure he loves the fact to keep bringing it up. But it happened. That's wild. Well, Imp is going to come in. Sebastian keeps trying to lure this monk close enough where he can kill it. <laughs> and he gets the kill. Oh, man. Shipwright right away. That's another textbook thing. If you have the lead, you need to get Shipwright. It saves so much on your ships for the long run. Baba Ram not ready to call it quits. He wants to hand Sebastian his first loss here. That gold spot is really brutal, actually. I didn't realize that. More docks now. That's what the castle will do. Um, I think the next step for the Armenians would be the Cilician fleet upgrade. Oh, this is funny. He's brought villagers and the mule cart. Why invest into a mule a new mule cart, a new a new cart, a mule cart when you can just bring one over in the transport ship? Dang. He's going to build the castle there. Yeah. So he knows about that. He's going to build the castle here. Make trebs. I don't actually know if he can range this. Hmm. Someone says all quality games are stomps. Well, you probably haven't been paying attention to the qualifier then. We've had some insanely close sets, and we've had some crazy upsets that have never happened before. Today, though, it definitely has been the day of the favorites. Can't disagree with you there. Dramans on the way. This Civ gets Draman as well? I didn't know they got Dramans. I forgot about that. Oh, shoot, dude. Yeah, so Draman is really strong. I think only five civilizations get it. Byzantines, Huns, Goths, actually. I guess Armenians. And then... They're, they're, I, I might be missing one here. Anyways, it's incredibly strong. And it is like a Cannon Galleon and a Manganel combined, basically. So it is better against units. I think it may be slightly worse against buildings, but it's still pretty strong against buildings. Oh, the Romans get it as well? Okay. Yeah, I felt... And the, the other thing is, I don't think you need chemistry to unlock this. Which is what makes it strong compared to a cannon galleon, but... Drama and information is not important. What is important is that Sebastian went undefeated in this entire cutthroat qualifier. And Sebastian 4 rows moves in then to the main event of Hidden Cup. Congratulations to Sebastian. Again, with most recent LAN event NAC5 happening, he was one win away from making it. It was a heartbreaking loss for him. I was worried for him that maybe there'd be an upset in the early rounds. He wouldn't make it here either because the first few rounds, there was some crazy competition. And well-deserved. What a beast. Sebastian is joining the main event players of Hidden Cup 5. Now, for Baba Rum and that storyline that everyone wants to get excited about, he does have a backup qualifier tomorrow. We have... Uh, we have 13 names now qualified for the main event. 
So let's talk about that. And then let's talk about the final three sets in this qualifier because Baba Ram still has a chance as with everybody who lost over the last two days, okay? Um, let me just bring up the image that has everybody and then we'll talk about the sets. But I think tomorrow, so yesterday was nine hours. Today was only seven and a half with pretty much nonstop games. I think tomorrow is like a 10 or 11 hour day. I think it'll be insane because there were a mix of players who maybe couldn't show their all today, but also players who really did show their all against really, really big talented names and understandably lost. We'll talk about it, but here's our qualified players from the main event. So obviously with the seven invites and then everyone who's qualified now, we have 13 names. We have ACCM. We have Doubt. Hera, Jordan, Leary, Yo, Viper, Vinchester, Sato, MBL, Tato, Barles, and then Sebastian. Also, the red flag rule has been broken. Sebastian is the first flag that does not have red in it. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> but no, that's huge. That's huge for Sebastian. That's big for his career. And I think, guys, if he plays like that, he can beat people in the main event. Absolutely. And he also could have people being very confused and being like, thinking that that is a, a greater name, perhaps, right? I could see people confusing him with Vinchester or Leary. Um, or depending on the level of dominance, maybe someone like Hera and his, or Sato, um, depending on styles, of course. So, so there is that. Um, we have three more places to determine. And that is going to be determined by the sets tomorrow, which I'm going to bring up just on Liquipedia here. Um, obviously, guys, this is going to have spoilers for the results that happened earlier today. But I also did spoil the results that happened earlier today because their names are on the sheet. So the last thing I want you to say is spoilers because it's kind of obvious, right? Um, so the sets tomorrow, and this is not the order we're broadcasting them, but this is this is the order that... You know, these are the three sets that are played. Um, are here, as everyone's saying spoilers. Thank you, chat. We have Sebastian against Hart. Wait, that's wrong. Okay, which Frenchman is controlling Liquipedia? Hey, France, what are you trying to do here, okay? You already got Sato in the main event. This is incorrect. Okay, this page just got updated. Hold on. Somebody screwed up. That's not, that's not right. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Okay, so the correct result here is uh, Baba Rum against Hart. Um, that should be wild. Hart's the favorite in my opinion. So it could be a heartbreaker for, well, Baba Rum. Um, Hart against Tato today. Struggled. Couldn't really, couldn't really get into it. Same with Baba Rum. Both players failed to get a victory. So... That should be a banger. Sobek against Mihai should also be a banger. I think Mihai's my favorite there. I think the level that he brought against Vinchester was extremely high. It was very consistent. Vinchester was like peak Vinchester in that series. So I'm leaning towards Mihai there. And then Ganji against Stark. I think Ganji against Stark is going to be the set of the day. Um, like, Ganji, I think his brain got melted by MBL a little bit. And he always had in the back of his mind, I have the backup qualifier, and it affected him. He can bring some crazy games. He beat Veleza in that qualifying bracket, remember. So he, he is a big level he can bring. And Stark today, Stark today, like, dude, the scoreline did not actually represent the series between Stark and Barles. And Barles is a monster. Stark was hard to kill. I think every single game went to the Imperial Age. There was one or two games in that set that could have gone Stark's direction. So yeah, I know, like, yeah, Stark's a little bit slower. Ganji's got this crazy play. I actually think it is harder to choose a favorite between Ganji and Stark than it is for Sobek and Mihai and Baba Ram and Hart. But um, yeah, so that, anyways, that's my thought. What do you guys think? <laughs> what, what do you guys think? I, I think it'll be a closer day than today because naturally these players should be closer level. And then we'll have three more players joining the main event. So, oof. Stark and Hidden Cup would be amazing. But, I mean, all these players in Hidden Cup would be incredible. They all add something slightly different. And, of course, the whole point of a qualifier is to have the best players playing. And uh, 
the second chance qualifier really make sure that we determine that okay well um People saying Ganji and Stark will be intense. I think so too. I can see why people say Ganji's the favorite. I, I don't know if there's a favorite. That's why I think that sets close. I think that's like a... If anyone's a favorite in that series, I think it's 55-45 Ganji. But I consider both players very beatable, and I think the games will go long. I think that series will be wild. Okay, so the schedule, by the way, for coverage tomorrow is we will start with Ganji versus Stark at 14 GMT which is 9 a.m. Eastern. We will then do Sobek against Mihai at 17 GMT or 20 GMT. <clears throat> or, uh, sorry, um, I'm tired. Uh, 17 GMT, which is noon Eastern. And then we will do uh, Baba Rum versus Hart, which will be the final series, which was 20 GMT or 3 p.m. Eastern-ish. Obviously, it does depend on how long some of the sets are, so we'll just have to stick around and find out, okay? But that's the schedule for tomorrow. I'll be casting everyone here. Um, I don't know the casting lineup today. I thought I was going to have co-casters for the second and third set to help me push through a little bit. And then that didn't pan out. We'll, we'll have that sorted. But I hope the casting was good today. Thank you, guys. Tomorrow will be the last day of the qualifier. Um, thank you so much for the, for the love and support. It's meant a lot. The sub count's been insane. I don't know if I've ever had a period where there's been more primes coming into my channel in my streaming career. Um, except for like maybe the main event of Hidden Cup 4 or something, which was a completely different animal. But for like my normal streams, uh, the viewership and the um, the primes and just the support in general has been awesome, okay? I know I'm missing a lot of comments too from people uh, saying nice things. Uh, and, and YouTube viewership has been live as well. Uh, it's been solid. We had like two to 3,000 people watching there today. So thank you, YouTube chat as well, for those watching there. And uh, yeah, one more day of the qualifier. So final thing to mention here, I think we have like maybe two hours until the hero is determined for number 15. There's still votes going on my Twitter, my Facebook, uh, the subreddit. Uh, and you can look and vote for the final uh, true hero that gets voted in there on that list. The other 14 heroes you see there, though, will be the main event heroes. The main event players will be playing on those accounts. We obviously will not know who is who. And they will not know who they're playing against in a completely randomized bracket. But uh, like I said, I think based on that poll, I think it is Emperor Sigismund. I actually kind of forget his name right now. Did I get it right? I said it right earlier, but I'm not looking at it. Anyways, I believe he is at the top of the list. And he will likely be number 15. And then tomorrow at the end of day, you all will get to vote on the cheat unit that is added to the main event. Um, so tomorrow we'll have a vote on three options. I'll run it on YouTube. I'll also run it on Twitch and you guys can vote for the cheat unit. So um, my favorite one there, Salim the Grim. I don't want to spoil Hidden Cup 5 and ruin it for you, but Salim the Grim is going to win. He will dominate. I think Salim the Grim will lose two games the entire tournament. And that's bad for me, right? But I just have that much belief in Salim that him and his grimness will just destroy. I'm, I'm pretty confident in that. So put all your money on Salim, all right? All your money on Salim. Okay, any questions before I, uh, before I leave? Why do we have a cheat unit? Because we always have a cheat unit. Next question. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. Um, I don't know if we did in Hidden Cup 2. Because it's fun. Because we all use cheat codes from time to time, or did? After We used Cobra Car in Hidden Cup 4, and I was like, this is a really fun idea. There's a couple other cheat codes in the game, which I think are pretty cool. So, Will you be streaming before the main event? Yeah, um... So we actually have a lot of stuff stacked up, because there's a lot of stuff to do. So tomorrow, we determine all the qualifying players. But then immediately when we have the players who are in the main event, they are told their hero name and given their login. And then I have to do the, the bracket draw on stream. So here, watch this. So Monday, that's the current plan. It may end up being Tuesday. I have to have discussions on this. But um, 
Sorry, you might hear my voice. So welcome to the... Shut up. Okay. So I want to show you kind of what we're going to do again and what we did for Hidden Cup 4 because it's been so long. So um, this was the video from the bracket last time and we did this live. And okay, so we're going to have the same system. So we have to do this live so the players know it's like an unrigged process. So I will stream Monday or Tuesday and we will do the bracket draw live. Uh, and so basically I press a button and it just fills in the bracket. We'll do the same thing. And that's how we'll have our bracket for Hidden Cup 5. There, there, there's pretty much going to be no change to how we do it, except for the format on screen will look a bit better and, you know, new logo and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, the question was about streaming. So I will be streaming that on Monday. So you'll have to keep an eye out for that. It'll obviously be a video as well. Um, then the players basically have a week and a half-ish to train before they play their first games the following week behind closed doors and all that. Um, I will do very little streaming that's not related to Hidden Cup, if anything. My plan, only other plan is to do the talk show. So we're going to do the talk show. And uh, I think like Dave and I will sit down for like two hours. We're going to talk about Hidden Cup and what certain talking points about Hidden Cup and what people can look forward to. Introduce you guys to some of the sponsors, give you an idea of what's coming. You know, that thing could be cool. And then um, I'm missing something. Oh, we're going to do a show match as well. So we're going to do a show match uh, the Sunday before the main event. So it's going to be next Sunday. I think next Saturday and Sunday will be show matches with players who lost in the qualifier. And aren't in the main event, but they will be playing on hero accounts. So it will be, uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be good fun to give you guys a feel of Hidden Cup without having the top sixteen players. So, yeah, my Dixie wrecked. There's no cheat code being played with in the game. The hero, I, I need to clarify this because people keep getting confused. So the cheat code is an account. No one is playing with cheats. I could see why you were confused. So there, right. One of them will be a cheat code image and a name, but no one will be playing with actual cheats, just to be clear. Yes, no cheat codes allowed in the tournament. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as far as we know. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, so sorry. I, I have to find a way to say that. I... I no offense, but I feel like the way I'm saying it is pretty clear. But clearly it's not. So I will try and do better. Okay? I will try and do better. Also, I saw the poll where people voted that Slim is going to lose round one. Screw you guys. I'm all in on Slim. All right? Um, Volstar says, I still don't get it. Well, Volstar, you're a lost cause, my friend. I didn't even say your name correctly. So, whoops. Completely ruined that one. Any other questions about the main event before I head off? Thank you, everybody. If you have a question, ask away. Thank you. Thank you. Poo, 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 putt. A jobster, Arto, integral backstepping. Thank you. Very nice names. Um, I'm going to be very selective with my questions here. How did you choose the 96 players for the qualifier? Um, we have a, the top 48 was selected on a system, which is based on tournament results. And then the 48 after that is based on the rank ladder. So it was a hybrid system, which is why, like, obviously it was seated based on how most of you would see the pro scene. If you really know it, like Tato first seed in the qualifier, etc. So. Hmm. Congrats on Twitch stream nomination nomination, by the way. Nominated for what? I'd be very surprised if I got nominated by anything. Or by, but like, Twitch won't even respond to my emails. What are they going to nominate me for? They're going to nominate me for their favorite streamer that left them to go to Facebook because they wouldn't res respond to me? RTS streamer? Oh, did I actually? Is there actually something? <laughs> I don't know if I'm being trolled. Someone told me, and I'm not kidding. Someone told me that... AOE2 devs 
added something in dedication to me in the game. And they said they changed the name of a bush to T90 because my last name is Barry, like a Barry bush. And I didn't totally believe it, but I kind of thought for a minute that they were being honest. And then I realized that they weren't. So yeah, I don't know if, if I've actually been nominated, but if I did, then I'll find out and that's cool. So. <laughs> oh man. All right, so I'm going to head off, guys. I'm clearly very tired. I'm going to play the little trailer we have. Uh, and the the V, this will be more clear when you get to see the trophy room for the main event. But the V is for Hidden Cup 5. Okay, I understand. We've got some cool effects going on. It's not V for Vendetta. All right, thank you, chat, very much. I'll be back tomorrow. We'll have three excellent sets and a lot more to say. But appreciate the love and support. And I will see you all tomorrow. All right, so back in the day, back, back in the day, for many, many, many years, everyone who played online was playing a hunt floor. And I, and I kind of miss those days, kind of miss those days. I, I kind of miss those days, 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 days. sad actually.